Ancient and Medieval Conspiracy Theories The History of the World's Most Persistent Conspiracy Theories Written by Charles River Editors Narrated by Michelle Humphreys Introduction For decades, parodies featuring ominous, mysterious cults have been a favorite gag in pop culture. These fraternal brothers are often depicted in some type of underground lair, dressed in extravagant ceremonial robes with their faces hidden in their hoods, seated around a long table brimming with gothic chalices, skulls, and glittering dark treasure. Flicks on the more morbid side might even show choppy, flashing imagery of blood, torture, and sacrifices. Like all art, creativity is sparked by a source of inspiration, and the inspiration for scenes like those have for centuries come from conspiracy theories, which often have profound impact regardless of their veracity. Indeed, conspiracy theories are nothing new. When the Great Fire of Rome occurred in 64 AD, Suetonius and Cassius Dio, two of Nero's ancient biographers, were adamant that it was the emperor himself who set the fire, or ordered it set. And they are the originators of the myth that Nero played the lyre, danced around his palace, and sang the Sack of Troy, while Rome burned outside his windows. Nearly 2,000 years later, people still believe the incredibly popular myth that Nero fiddled while Rome burned, even though no fiddle existed there at the time. The phrase remains a staple of English lexicon, and what's often overlooked is how the actual fire and the actual events that transpired affected history, particularly that of the persecuted Christians. Perhaps it should also not be surprising that the themes found in contemporary conspiracy theories are often echoed in ancient conspiracy theories. While some people still insist that Lyndon B. Johnson was in on John F. Kennedy's assassination, it was speculated across the ancient world that the young Macedonian king, Alexander the Great, conspired to have his own father, Philip II of Macedon, assassinated. Likewise, the New Age beliefs that Mesoamerican ruins in Mexico were somehow tied to extraterrestrials find common cause with people who believe the ancient Indus Valley site at Mohenjo-Daro was destroyed by a nuclear weapon. And through it all, the lack of surviving documentary evidence about much of antiquity has allowed for all of the unknowns to become highly speculative sources of debate. For example, did Caesar's men burn the Library of Alexandria in the first century BC, or was it destroyed later, if at all? Some people even suggest that the Library of Alexandria, whose ruins have never been located, never existed at all. Few eras are easier to let the imagination run wild than the Middle Ages, which have often been coined the Dark Ages based on a perceived lack of progress and information. In some respects, that is not completely unfounded because less is known about that historical period compared to the eras that came after it. In addition, it was a period marked by a great number of deaths caused by plague epidemics, crusades, and inquisitorial persecutions. Often, researchers are not even sure how and why certain events happened, and these mysteries still occupy the attention of historians. The era was very harsh, difficult, and often gloomy, in that grayness, burdened by various fears, people were looking for something that would light up their lives and bring them a feeling of beauty and joy. People experienced all things and events around them more intensely than people do today. They often exaggerated the events that happened, giving them a mystical and divine character. For this reason, medieval sources are taken with a grain of salt and are first carefully examined before believing. At the same time, some historical mysteries about the era may never be solved, if only because the relevant excavated material has been lost or the archaeological site has been destroyed. In other cases, it is because new evidence is unlikely to emerge or the surviving evidence is too vague to lead to a consensus. Of course, the lack of answers only makes these enigmas more intriguing. For example, the topic of witchcraft in Europe once considered marginal and even frivolous, has become the subject of international debate among historians since the early 1970s. However, only a few of the many studies have paid attention to the Sabbath, the nocturnal gathering of witches and sorceresses, even though the Sabbath is clearly of crucial importance in the history of witchcraft and witch hunting. Similarly, 
few stories have the power to mesmerize as much as unsolved mysteries, so codes and missing puzzle pieces fill people with excitement and intrigue. What did a source want to say with that coded message? What mysteries did they hide? Ancient Astronauts One popular theory holds that the Egyptian gods were astronauts. Many believers and scientists do not agree with this theory whatsoever, but the concept of advanced civilizations and extraterrestrials visiting the ancients has become an almost ubiquitous conspiracy theory, which has been enough to attract the attention of the general public and researchers. The theory of ancient astronauts visiting Earth is one of many controversial and speculative concepts that permeate popular culture and alternative historiography. This theory suggests that in ancient times, extraterrestrial visitors, which many call ancient astronauts, came to Earth and influenced the development of human civilizations across the world. Supporters of this theory claim that various myths, religious texts, and archaeological findings are evidence that point to the presence of extraterrestrial entities that have interacted with humans. They point out that some ancient writings, such as the Sumerian Epic of Gilgamesh or the Hindu Vedas, are replete with descriptions of flying objects, gods from the heavens, and advanced technology that surpassed the capabilities of humanity at the time. One of the most famous arguments in support of this theory is the construction of ancient megalithic structures such as the Egyptian pyramids or the Moai statues on Easter Island. Many believe that such monumental building endeavors would have been beyond the reach of the relatively primitive human societies of the time and that extraterrestrial technology or knowledge would have been required to achieve them. According to the theory, the gods worshipped by the inhabitants of the Cradle of Civilization, Mesopotamia, are ancient astronauts who traveled to Earth from the planet Nibiru to take supplies of gold and other ores and take them to their planet. This is the claim of Zechariah Sitchin, who called the astronauts Anunnaki after interpreting the Sumerian records in that way. Sitchin never hid that he did not have the education to read Sumerian tablets, but nonetheless, plenty of people accepted his interpretations. He asserted that 50 Anunnaki landed on Earth 400,000 years ago, and after they got tired of digging ores, they created slaves to work for them. At the same time, they also made a model of a man called Adapa, who is known today as Adam. Sitchin claims that the Anunnaki were present on Earth until they saw that humans were capable of independent life. The fact that humans managed to survive the Ice Age was enough for the Anunnaki, who destroyed all traces of their existence and returned to Nibiru. According to Sitchin, a hunt for gold brought the Anunnaki to Earth. Although they did not pluck out all the gold that exists, according to Sitchin, the Anunnaki's need for gold was much more technical than a status symbol. As far as space travel goes, gold is almost an ideal material to own and work with. It is perhaps not surprising, then, that a race in space would search for such a substance. Sitchin further claimed their home planet orbits the Earth and passes through the solar system. Every 3,600 years it passes by our planet when a new renaissance in cyclical intervals regularly occurs on Earth. He claimed that the planet Nibiru was very far away and obscured by the sun, making it impossible to find. It supposedly orbits the Earth in an elongated ellipse. He claims that precisely for this reason, there is no evidence that it exists. Modern scientists have lambasted Sitchin's theory in all kinds of ways, from pointing out there's no evidence of the planet Nibiru and no evidence that humans were created. Sitchin tried to prove his claims with the records of the Sumerian civilization in Mesopotamia, which left behind representations on the walls of buildings on which people drew their deities. He pointed out that in several of those pictures, it is visible that people are bowing to the spaceship. He also explained his theories in the books he wrote exclusively about ancient astronauts. Some theories state that people are actually direct descendants of an alien species, and proponents look for their evidence via larger holes in human history about which historians know almost nothing. They look to archaeological finds as well, among which the most prominent is a depiction from Mesopotamia that seemingly shows a man and a similar being looking at a flying object 
in which three other people are sitting and seem to be admiring the sight. Theories that the Maya had contact with aliens, or that they were of extraterrestrial origin, are mostly based on interpretations of their mythology, iconography, and archaeological findings. Some proponents of ancient astronaut theories claim that Maya icons and reliefs are depictions of aliens or spacecraft. According to Eric von Daniken, the oral and written traditions of ancient times, especially those of a religious nature, contain allusions and information about visitors from the stars and their journey through air and space. He believes these descriptions should be understood literally because, until today, they have been intentionally changed and placed in a mythological context. Apart from the fascinating buildings that could not have been created by human hands, the remains of drawings in the caves are also considered proof. The drawings often show spacecraft similar to today's spaceships, or at least as we imagine them, and persons with inhuman physiognomy. Another intriguing story related to ancient astronauts is related to Australia. A wide area of about 200,000 square kilometers in the Kimberley region of northwestern Australia is home to the Wanjina people, who have had a continuous civilization there for at least 60,000 years. In Australian Aboriginal culture, the story of the Wanjina, the ultimate spiritual beings who created the land and people, is intriguing and confusing. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of their figurative art, painted on rocks and in caves, is the way they depict the Wanjina, who have white faces without mouths, huge black eyes, and a head wrapped in a halo or some form of helmet, among other characteristics. The question that worries people the most is whether these cave paintings depicting Wanjina are evidence of the interaction of extraterrestrial visitors with prehistoric humans. Various interpretations of ancient paintings have been made, with some saying they are stylized depictions of people or even owls, others believing they are ancient astronauts who visited Earth tens of thousands of years ago and had direct contact with humans. Some think aliens played a role in the creation of the universe, which is represented in aboriginal dream traditions as well as myths and legends from all past world civilizations. In addition, many people wonder why the Wanjina were painted with white skin if they were meant to symbolize other aboriginal people, who were all dark-skinned. Moreover, why were the eyes of Wanjina figures usually painted out of proportion to the rest of the face? What's the point of painting them all without mouths? These are some questions that have confused us for decades. However, what is even more unexpected is the oral history of the Wanjina, which, like all aboriginal legends, has been passed down from generation to generation. According to legend, the Wanjina were celestial beings, or cloud spirits, who descended from the Milky Way during sleep and formed the earth and all its people. Then the Wanjina took one look at the people and realized the magnitude of the task before them and returned home to recruit other Wanjina. The Wanjina descended with the help of a serpent, and they spent their time in dream-creating, teaching, and acting as gods to the aboriginal people they had created. Even after Wanjina disappeared, aboriginal people in the Kimberley region still believe that they were responsible for everything that happened on land, in the sky, and on the water. As with contemporary religious teachings, aboriginal dream stories, rock art, and cave paintings were often regarded as myths rather than historical facts. Interestingly and controversially, artifacts have been discovered in the geographic area that indicate that the area was inhabited as far back as 174,000 years before Christ. This is in direct contrast to the assumption that Aboriginal people had roots in Africa and migrated to Australia some 60,000 years ago. Because of the importance of their culture, why would the ancient Aborigines invent stories that they called myths or fantastic stories? Archaeological findings have previously established the truth of many ancient myths and stories. Is it possible that the Aborigines of that period were just recounting the events as they saw and understood them at the time? Others have posited that, as with Atlantis, 
Perhaps there was an advanced human civilization that had survived the floods and other catastrophes recounted in many creation myths around the world. Could it be possible that these survivors of the antediluvian world, with their technology, intellect, and acquired wisdom, were seen as gods to the handful of survivors who were most likely scattered around the world and cut off from each other? Most scientists, archaeologists, and historians consider these depictions to be mythological or symbolic rather than literal descriptions of extraterrestrial beings or craft. They interpret these depictions in the context of ancient beliefs, religions, and worldviews. For example, archaeological finds from places like Chichen Itza, Palenque, and Tikal bear witness to the rich and complex Mayan culture. Their buildings, astronomical observations, and calendars show the high level of knowledge and technical skills that the Maya developed, and the interpretation of those findings within the context of extraterrestrial contact has no scientific basis. At the same time, it's only fair to point out that there are gaps in knowledge of the ancient world, and those inconsistencies affect people's understanding of antiquity. Only serious and open studies of the past, as well as thorough studies of such ancient sites as the Sphinx Complex and the Pyramids of Giza, will begin to bring people closer to the intelligence possessed by the people who left them behind. Secret Chambers in the Great Pyramid and Sphinx The origins of the pyramids, including their chosen shape and design, stretch all the way back to the mythological stories of the ancient Egyptians. As a culture, the Egyptians are known for their obsession with death, so it is ironic that these lavish tombs were inspired instead by a story of creation, the story of birth. In Egyptian mythology, the world was formed from out of the depths of a primal ocean that was both infinite and bereft of life, and these ancient waters parted when the sun rose for the very first time. This origin was something that the Egyptians referred to as the first occasion. The chaotic waters of the lifeless ocean, an entity that they called Nu, parted as a pyramid-shaped mound rose up through the waves. This shape, the Ben-Ben, was the first part of Earth, the first sign of life, rising from out of the waters. The mythological imagery of Egypt naturally reflected the reality of their environment, where the rising waters of the Nile flooded the land, only to recede again and leave fertile ground with rich muds ready to be seeded with crops, the source of Egypt's bounty and life. While the shape of the pyramid derives from mythology, the Egyptians had several reasons for building them. The pyramids served religious and funerary purposes, while also serving as reinforcing power structures for Egypt's rulers, but the process of building also served a valuable practical function. Egypt required a large workforce to produce the food needed to feed its people, as the rich soils surrounding the Nile needed to be seeded, crops tended, and harvests reaped. For one entire season out of the year, however, the farming belt of Egypt was covered by water as the Nile flooded its banks, leading to a large part of Egypt's population being idle during that time. The building of monuments was a valuable method of keeping an otherwise idle population active, thereby guaranteeing employment for all throughout the year. Farmers in the Old Kingdom period who were idle and wanted to work during the Nile's period of inundation could get paid and avoid taxes by working on pyramid-building projects. Egyptian citizens with nothing to occupy them while their farming lands were underwater could thus spend the season erecting timeless monuments to their ruler, receiving wine and beer thrice daily as part of their working conditions. Given the difficult and no doubt deadly nature of the labor, it has long been assumed that the Egyptians wouldn't have resorted to building the pyramids all by themselves. Popular culture images of present day have shown erroneous depictions of Jewish slaves being whipped as they dutifully push vast blocks of sandstone along on trundling wooden logs. Such was the case in the Ten Commandments, and the animated Prince of Egypt even showed wooden scaffolding around the Sphinx. In reality, wood was a rare commodity in Egypt, imported from abroad and used as a prestige item. The Sudan supplied ebony wood, pine, and cedar were imported from Syria, and large timbers were imported from Lebanon for shipbuilding. 
The lack of wood in the largely desert regions of Egypt led fringe theorist Eric von Daniken to conclude that aliens must have been behind the construction of these great edifices, an explanation that has since had its own impact in popular culture through television programs like Doctor Who, as well as film and television franchises like Stargate. The stone blocks used for building, von Daniken stated, were moved on rollers. In other words, wooden rollers. But the Egyptians would scarcely have felled and turned into rollers, the few trees, mainly palms, that then, as now, grew in Egypt, because the dates from the palms were urgently needed for food, and the trunks and fronds were the only things giving shade to the dried-up ground. But they must have been wooden rollers, otherwise there would not even be the feeblest technical explanation of the building of the pyramids. His central argument about the achievements of the past is that humans did not have the capacity to attain such successes and were therefore not responsible for the great monuments of antiquity. He suggested instead a utopian past when space travelers, possibly native Martians seeking to escape changing environmental condition on their own world, escaped to Earth and brought a wealth of knowledge and technology along with them. Von Daniken theorized that a group of Martian giants perhaps escaped to Earth to found the new culture of Homo sapiens by breeding with the semi-intelligent beings living there. Giants who come from the stars, who could move enormous blocks of stone, who instructed men in arts still unknown on Earth, and who finally died out. However, experimental archaeology has come about as a profession to try to figure out the feasibility of these kinds of building projects by using reconstructive approaches that used the known building conditions and experiences of the past. Archaeological experiments found that while wood was in short supply, one thing that Egypt had plenty of during the time of the Nile inundation was mud. Using mud bricks to shape mud ramps, it was possible for limestone blocks to be pushed and hauled along the slippery surface of the wet ramps. Such experiments have even been used to estimate the building period times for pyramid construction. Although not conclusive in proving the methods of the past, they certainly demonstrate the possibilities that past Egyptian craftsmen could have used. Another theory is that the process of building was split between an inner and outer ramp. While the outer ramp was removed, the inner ramp became part of the pyramid structure. The tradition of pyramid building was a long one in ancient Egypt, occurring over hundreds of years, with techniques developing and improving, only to be forgotten and lost again. As a result, even as subsequent generations contributed new large-scale construction programs that changed the face of Egypt, they did so in quite different manners. The first of these was the Step Pyramid, located in the northwest of the city of Memphis, in the Saqqara Necropolis of Egypt. Today it is known as the Step Pyramid due to its stepped appearance. Commissioned by and made for the burial of the pharaoh Djoser, its design and construction was overseen by his vizier Imhotep. The name Imhotep has since become infused with popular culture through the popular series of mummy movies, where the mummified remains of Imhotep are reanimated through the power of an ancient curse, leading to the shambling, linen-wrapped, and decomposing undead monster haunting the hapless treasure-seekers who dared disturb his resting place. In reality, the ancient Imhotep was a talented architect and builder who succeeded in creating something that had never been seen before. It was a design that would often be repeated, even improved upon, and it gave birth to an ancient industry dedicated to the afterlife, one that would leave an indelible mark on Egyptian life as well as death. Still, none come close to matching the Great Pyramid of Giza. In addition to being one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, the Great Pyramid of Giza is extraordinary for a number of reasons. It is one of the greatest feats of engineering in the ancient world, to the extent that it remained the tallest built structure in the world from the time it was finished up until the Lincoln Cathedral was completed around 1300 A.D. The fact the nearly 520 feet tall spire of the cathedral was erected nearly 3,800 years after the Great Pyramid of Giza was constructed is a testament in its own way to the longevity of the pyramid itself. Even since then, 
it remains a monument that has stood the test of time, remaining the only one of the original wonders still surviving. Archaeologists have estimated that when completed, the Great Pyramid stood 480 feet tall, with each side measuring 756 feet in length, with a total mass estimated at being nearly 6 million tons and a volume of approximately 2.5 million cubic meters. Part of the challenge in building the pyramid came from the assembling of raw materials. An internal hillock was utilized at the core, with limestone blocks and granite stones utilized for the structure itself. These were quarried wherever outcrops of suitable material were available, including some locations across the Nile River and others that were further upstream and downstream. Existing cracks in the limestone had wooden wedges hammered into them, and the wedges were then soaked with water, causing them to expand and crack the stone. In this way, limestone blocks could be removed and then cut to size. Boats were then used to transport the finished stone along the Nile to the construction location of the pyramid. Even today, the Great Pyramid of Giza is an imposing structure to look at, but what is currently visible of the pyramid today is merely its internal superstructure. When this was initially completed, a casing of smooth stones was added to the outer surface, giving the pyramid an exterior finish that caused it to shine blinding white in the light of the Egyptian sun. The outer casing of fine Tura limestone was gradually removed over the succeeding generations, as the high-quality material was often taken and used for the construction of later structures. The total number of limestone blocks used to construct the Great Pyramid of Giza has been estimated by Egyptologists at approximately 2.3 million, and as if that wasn't enough, granite stones weighing up to 175,000 pounds were used in constructing the king's chamber within the pyramid. The overall construction may have used as much as 5.5 million tons of limestone, 8,000 tons of granite, and half a million tons of mortar most extraordinary of all is the overall accuracy of the structure. Measurements taken by archaeologist Sir Flinders Petrie in the 1880s identified that base measurements of the four sides of the pyramid had an average error of as little as 58 millimeters in length. Furthermore, the alignment of the sides is closely matched to the four compass points, based on true north, with a mean corner error of only 12 seconds of arc. Such measurements show a dedication to detail and accuracy on the part of the ancient Egyptians who designed and built the structure. The architects and the workers who built the pyramid achieved something no one had before, and nobody would surpass the achievement after. Having learned from the structures completed previously, such as the errors of the so-called bent pyramid, the architects were able to capitalize on existing knowledge to perfect the art of pyramid design. Like Imhotep before him, the designer of the Great Pyramid of Giza demonstrated skill and insight in his achievement. Egyptologists believe that Khufu's vizier was the great architect behind the building of this monumental structure, a man named Heman, or possibly Himyunu. He was born into a well-connected family in Egypt, and as the son of Prince Nefermat and his wife Itet, he was the grandson of Pharaoh Sneferu, and therefore related to the very pharaoh who he advised. After death, his own remains were buried in a tomb close to the Great Pyramid that he may have helped to realize. Regardless of whether he was the architect, what is known is that the pyramid was commissioned by 4th Dynasty Egyptian pharaoh Khufu, or Cheops in Greek, so the Great Pyramid of Giza has also been referred to as the Pyramid of Khufu, Located within the Giza necropolis in what is now known as El Giza in Egypt, the complex also contains a number of buildings, with two mortuary temples in honor of the pharaoh, three smaller pyramids for his wives, another smaller pyramid, a raised causeway, and small mastaba tombs. The pyramid also contained a number of chambers, including a queen's chamber and a king's chamber, along with both ascending and descending passageways. Examination of the available data suggests to Egyptologists that the pyramid construction period lasted about 20 years. 
A rough calculation of the requirements to achieve the total work within this time frame suggests the installation of over 1.75 million pounds of stone every day, moving an average of more than 12 of the blocks into place each hour throughout both the day and the night. By any calculation, the Great Pyramid of Giza was a remarkable achievement. Beneath the Great Pyramid stands a massive rock-hewn sphinx, perhaps an even more striking embodiment of the divine realm than the famous pyramid itself. It is believed that during the building of the Great Pyramid of Giza, all local rock outcrops would have been utilized as sources of raw materials for manufacture. Nearby, both the Great Pyramid of Giza and the location of Khafra's own chosen resting place was a remnant outcrop, left over from the work of stonecutters busily scouring the landscape to create suitable building materials for the monumental works ordered by the pharaoh. However, rather than have it utilized for further stone blocks, Khufu's son Khafra had another idea altogether. He ordered that the outcrop be reshaped into the embodiment of a mythical creature. In the years that followed, the tradition would continue to develop in ancient Egypt for devoting sculpted mythical guardians for sacred places. These guardians would be visualized as creatures with human faces and lion bodies. Such mythical beasts would be realized in varying forms and sizes throughout Egypt in association with tombs, but none would ever be so vast or grand as that sculpted from the outcrop on the orders of Pharaoh Khafra. Approximately 70 feet tall and 240 feet in length from outstretched paws to folded haunches, the face of this beast was probably fashioned into a likeness of the pharaoh himself. A later Egyptologist would hypothesize that the intention might have been to present an image of the pharaoh transformed into the god Horus, presenting the sun god Re with offerings. The Sphinx also had inscriptions that refer to the Egyptian lion god Ruri, who the Egyptians believed guarded the entrance to the underworld. Lehner has gone so far as to note the astronomical alignment of the Sphinx and the Pyramid of Khafra during equinoxes, explaining, At the very same moment, the shadow of the Sphinx and the shadow of the Pyramid, both symbols of the king, become merged silhouettes. The Sphinx itself, it seems, symbolized the pharaoh presenting offerings to the sun god in the court of the temple. That said, as Egyptologist James Allen cautions, the Egyptians didn't write history, so we have no solid evidence for what its builders thought the Sphinx was. Certainly something divine, presumably the image of a king, but beyond that is anyone's guess. It has been estimated that the monument was first sculpted around 2500 BC, and to this day, the great stone beast guards the Giza necropolis at its eastern approach, with further pyramids and monuments since added to the landscape, including those of the pharaoh and his wives. Not a great deal is known about Khafra or his reign, but his own pyramid demonstrates his influence and power since it is almost as grand in size as the vast Great Pyramid of Giza, which was attributed to his father. Other structures known to have been constructed during Khafra's reign include a valley temple linked to his pyramid via a causeway. The causeway was constructed from large blocks of granite, decorated along its extent by statuary carved from diorite quarried in the Nubian desert. In the later writings of the Greek historian Herodotus, this pharaoh was described as heretical, a cruel ruler who forced the Egyptian temples to stay closed after his father, Pharaoh Khufu, sealed them. But considering the gulf of time between his reign and the writings of Herodotus, those words must be considered for what they are, a secondary source passed down by word of mouth and fraught with possible errors and inconsistencies. One of the overriding questions is who built the Sphinx? It was long assumed that laborers and or slaves were used, but recent Egyptologists have unearthed the remains of a large settlement likely used to house the workers, and evidence from there suggests that the people working on the Sphinx were not from lower classes. In addition to the workers apparently being fed well, the settlement could hold up to 2,000 people at a time. Egyptologist Lehner has speculated that ordinary Egyptians did shifts of construction work, meaning that different people shuffled in and out of the area to work on the Sphinx. If so, this was a system similar to the one used over 4,000 years later by the Inca to build Machu Picchu. 
Like the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Sphinx presumably ordered built by Khafre did not always appear then as it does now. The aesthetic of contemporary Egypt to the modern viewer is a familiar one, and the crumbling sand-blasted structures and raw sandstone blocks are an image tainted with nostalgia, evoking a poetic vision of the ancient past. The reality, however, is that the past was an environment with an aesthetic quite different from its archaeological remains. The broken nose of the Sphinx's face was whole and full at one point, marks of weathering were absent, the statue may once have been adorned with a beard, and there is even evidence to suggest the monument was once painted in full color. A number of attempts have been made to reconstruct how the Great Sphinx of Giza would have looked just after its completion, but with such limited available data, these attempts are more guesswork than science. Nevertheless, Reconstructions are important in demonstrating how different the landscape of the past really was. The Egyptologist Mark Lehner is one heritage practitioner who has utilized modern technology to shed new light on the past. After measuring and planning the physical sphinx, drawing it from multiple angles and photographing it with a stereoscopic camera, he digitized a three-dimensional model of it with the assistance of Egyptologist Ulrich Kapp, architect Thomas Jaggers, and the German Archaeological Institute in Cairo. An image of Khafra was superimposed to fit over and fix the weather-worn and damaged face. The pedestal remnants between the outstretched legs of the Sphinx were altered to support a tall statue of Amenhotep II, and color was added across the surface of the Sphinx itself. The available evidence for how the Sphinx may have been colored is very limited, with remnant residues of red pigment on the face, along with some traces of blue and yellow paint elsewhere. While such reconstructions of the past may rely on a combination of guesswork and reason, the origin of the painted colors can at least be solved through the inscriptions of the past. The colored facelift for the Sphinx occurred some 11 centuries after its initial construction, around 1400 BC, and the story of how and why this occurred was recorded on a granite steel placed between the outstretched paws of the Great Sphinx of Giza upon the completion of the reconstruction works. The story recorded therein tells of the pharaoh Thutmose IV, the son of Amenhotep II, who one day fell tired upon the Giza plateau and rested there, snoozing in the warm Egyptian afternoon sun. As he fell into a deep sleep, he saw in a dream the Sphinx come alive before him as a god, combining within it aspects of both the sun god Re and the god Horus. You will be king, the Sphinx, or god combination Horamachet, as Thutmose IV thought of him, spoke in the dream. You, Thutmose, will be king, but only if you free me. Free me from the shifting sands that bury my body in their flow, then you shall be granted power. When he woke from the dream, Thutmose IV had taken the words to heart and set about excavating the deep drifts of sand that had at that time settled around the body of the Sphinx. In addition to that, he encased the monument in limestone blocks and had it painted in the colors red, blue, and yellow. He also erected a statue of his father Amenhotep, the second between the paws of the great stone beast, and built a mud-brick enclosure wall around the Great Sphinx of Giza, shaped to resemble a cartouche. Just as the dream had prophesied, Thutmose IV did indeed become the next pharaoh of Egypt. The building of a chapel around the stele of Thutmose IV has led Egyptologists to argue there may have been a Sphinx cult in existence during the Old Kingdom period of Egypt. While there is no specific evidence to support this, the presence of the chapel at the base of the Great Sphinx of Giza has suggested the possibility of religious use. There are, however, no records of priests servicing the Sphinx Temple, which some have interpreted as never having been a completed structure. Either way, the monument itself was certainly popular during the Old Kingdom period, and other earlier structures were apparently harvested for use as raw material in the Sphinx's reconstruction and restoration. Ironically, the causeway of Khafra's pyramid was one casualty, as it was broken up to provide the stone to both repair the Sphinx and to build the temple in its honor. 
The image of the Sphinx even remained popular during the Amarna period, even as the traditional gods and religions of Egypt were forcibly abandoned on the orders of Akhenaten in favor of worshipping the sun disk. Having associations with the sun may have been in the Sphinx's favor during this time, as not only was the great monument left unmolested, but Akhenaten and his wife Nefertiti were themselves depicted as sphinxes in the decorations of a villa dating to the Amarna period. Further repairs and renovations on both the Great Sphinx of Giza and its associated temples were carried out by later rulers Seti I and Ramses II. Ramses II even added base reliefs to the Sphinx Temple, depicting himself making offerings to the Great Sphinx. A ceremonial beard was also added to the face of the Sphinx, although it is uncertain when, since the addition of the beard ended up falling away later on. By the 26th dynasty, the masonry of the Sphinx was noticeably crumbling away, and a major repair program saw limestone blocks encasing the structure once more. Even the Romans couldn't resist assisting the monument's preservation, adding a series of stones the size of contemporary bricks to the body of the Sphinx, where severe erosion had set in. Use of soft, white-colored limestone for these repairs has meant that the repair material has fared worse over the passage of time than the original monument itself, but they can still be seen in some sections of the Sphinx to this day. The national symbol of Egypt is considered one of the most impressive architectural monuments of the past and still causes involuntary fear with its impressiveness, halo of secrets, mystical legends, and history. In Egypt, the Sphinx is considered the most mysterious and mystical monument. Locals call the stone attraction the father of horror because the Sphinx is the keeper of many mysterious legends and a favorite place for tourists who love mysteries and fantasy. Meanwhile, some researchers believe it was built to record an astronomical phenomenon, the reunion of three planets. So far, there is no conclusive information about what the Sphinx symbolizes or why it was erected, there is an assumption that the statue guards the tombstones of the greatest pharaohs, the pyramids, while another legend says that the stone statue symbolizes the personality of Pharaoh Khafra. A third legend is that it is a statue of Horus, the god of the sky, who watches the rise of his father, the sun god Ra. Inevitably, the pyramids and the sphinx have long been grist for fantastical fiction. One example of this is the short story Under the Pyramids, published in the pulp magazine Weird Tales in February 1924. The story outline came from none other than Harry Houdini, who pitched an allegedly true tale of his own encounter with strange forces in Egypt to magazine editor J.C. Henneberger. Attracted to the idea of attaching Houdini's name to his magazine, Henneberger readily agreed and quickly commissioned a regular contributor to ghostwrite the story. That writer was none other than the iconic fantasy and horror author H.P. Lovecraft, whose own Cthulhu tales of elder gods threatening to wake from an other-dimensional slumber and return to this earth have been disturbing readers worldwide for decades. Lovecraft chose to write the short story in the first person, presenting it as though Houdini himself were telling the tale. Indeed, some published versions of the story did not include a credit for Lovecraft, choosing instead to present the fiction as a true event in the life of the great escape artist, written by him alone. The story is set in 1910 and tells of Houdini encountering a tour guide with a striking resemblance to one of the ancient pharaohs of Egypt. The guide kidnaps Houdini and takes him to the Great Sphinx of Giza, where the escape artist is thrown into a deep hole located nearby the famous monument. Luckily, Houdini is made of stern stuff and is able to escape from this predicament through the industrious use of his techniques in escapology. However, as he is making his way through darkened passages, searching for the way out, he comes upon a vast cavern, decorated as a place of ancient ceremony and possibly as one of sacrifice, with Houdini himself having been the next intended victim. For there, deep beneath the ground, is a vast and terrible creature, the real beast that the Sphinx Monument was based upon, still alive and hungry in the dark beneath the hot sands of the Egyptian desert. 
Lovecraft's telling of the tale places it in the context of his Cthulhu stories, giving it a dark and mythic resonance which Houdini apparently enjoyed, collaborating with Lovecraft on further projects thereafter. The mysteries of ancient Egypt, such a source of fascination to the general public, are answered here in fiction as the Sphinx is given a living counterpart, a disturbing deity of immense power, somehow darker and more disturbing than the one that Oedipus so famously defeated through his intellect. Other writers have also written the Sphinx as a living creature, but not always with the sense of horror and darkness that Lovecraft preferred. One writer who wrote about the Sphinx with humor was British author Terry Pratchett, who created his own version of ancient Egypt within a fantasy setting known as Discworld. The Discworld was a flat land in the shape of a disc, supported on the backs of giant elephants who themselves were standing on the shell of a vast turtle that was swimming through space. The inhabitants of the Discworld were a motley assortment of wizards, witches, and barbarians in a comedy mashup of classic fantasy tales. Within that invented world was also Pratchett's own version of Egypt, where he was able to parody various aspects both of Egyptian history and, more to the point, popular culture interpretations of it. However, back in reality, the monuments in Giza do present a great puzzle, both functionally and architecturally. As such, they hide something mysterious in themselves. The most important and famous mystery is the secret chambers in the shaft of the Great Pyramid and the tunnels under the Sphinx. Many believe this is where the Hall of Writings is located, where the wisdom and knowledge of an ancient civilization, possibly destroyed by a flood, are kept. In the 1920s, the media became interested in the sleeping prophet Edgar Sace. Sace discovered that he could enter a state of deep trance and was able to successfully diagnose many people's illnesses and prescribe their cures. But Sace was best known for his hundreds of readings, which described the story of the continent of Atlantis, which was struck by a terrible disaster and was destroyed around 10,000 years before Christ, while most of the survivors settled in the Egyptian Nile Valley. Sace spoke of himself as the reincarnation of their high priest, and he repeatedly mentioned clues showing that writings about Atlantis were stored in Egypt. Author John Taylor is convinced that the Great Pyramid was not the tomb of the Pharaoh, but a means of activating higher levels of energy and creating altered states of consciousness. In support of that theory, he offered evidence primarily experimental, which confirms the fact that the Great Pyramid of Giza is an energy generator. He concluded that the builders of the pyramids knew the value of pi and that this was proof that God was behind everything. That is why he came out with the thesis that the monument was made by Noah. While those connections seem incredibly tenuous, they're made possible by the fact that the Great Pyramid persistently kept its secret because no one managed to discover its entrance. In the year 820, the Arab Caliph al-Mamun, carried away by stories about the massive treasure hidden in the pyramid, gathered the most famous architects, sculptors, and stonemasons, and ordered them to find the entrance. For months, the greatest experts of the time tried in vain to discover the secret door that would lead to the interior of the pyramid. Ultimately, it was decided to dig a tunnel through the middle of the pyramid to find one of the corridors leading to the hidden treasure chambers. After several months of painstaking digging, when the caliph was ready to abandon the enterprise, one of the workers heard an echo in the distance. The tunneling continued in that direction, and soon the digger came across a passage one square meter wide. The passage led down to a new corridor, incomparably wider, but disappointment awaited at the end. The corridor was a dead end. None of the corridors the caliph's men discovered led them to the central chamber. Quite by chance one day, they came across a corridor with a low ceiling where they could only move on their knees and soon reached a room known today as the Queen's Room. Returning in the opposite direction, the workers reached the sealed royal chambers. Caliph al-Mamun was immediately informed of the discovery and demanded to be present at the opening of the tomb. Under his supervision, the great royal seal was broken. 
Excitement was at its peak. But to their astonishment, the massive room of polished red granite was empty. The disappointed caliph then gave up on the further search. It is not particularly clear whether the builders of the pyramid managed to fool Al-Mamun's workers, or perhaps more skilled thieves outwitted the persistent caliph. The theory that the pyramid was not a tomb at all, and that the various robbers were looking for the wrong treasure, cannot be rejected either. In the early 1970s, a large-scale project was carried out to establish whether there were chambers in Khafra's pyramid that had not yet been discovered. The idea of the pyramid project came from Dr. Luis Alvarez of the University of California, a Nobel Prize winner in physics. Alvarez believed that beneath the three Egyptian pyramids and the Sphinx were underground passages that allowed communication between the pyramids and entrances to secret chambers, which could contain archives with the secret knowledge of Egyptian priests. To examine the pyramid, Alvarez proposed the use of cosmic rays, which had been discovered by the Austrian scientist Victor Hess in 1911. It was necessary, Alvarez believed, to place a cosmic ray detector inside pyramids, and it would register different degrees of radiation depending on how it was directed. Scientists who tried to penetrate the secret pyramids with cosmic rays were amazed by the mysterious circumstances that created chaos among the electronic devices. Hoping to discover the hidden chambers, they continuously recorded cosmic rays on magnetic tapes during their penetration through the inside of the pyramid for a year. They assumed that cosmic rays should penetrate evenly through the pyramid if it is massive, without cavities, and that they would cause the same reactions on the cosmic ray detector at the base of the pyramid. If there were cavities in the pyramid, more cosmic rays would penetrate through them than through the massive parts. It would also be recorded on magnetic tapes, and a signpost to the undiscovered chambers would be posted. More than a million dollars and thousands of hours were spent on the project, including computing and operation of a new IBM computer at the university near Cairo. The head of the experiment was reluctantly forced to admit that the results contradicted all known laws of nature— the magnetic tapes recorded a different intensity of cosmic radiation in the interior of the royal chamber from day to day. Impulses could be displayed both optically and acoustically. There were various sets of lines, symbols, and geometric shapes. But what was impossible from a scientific point of view was the fact that symbols and geometric shapes, measured at a certain time and under certain conditions, always with the same measuring instruments, changed from day to day. Some researchers believe that the guardians of knowledge, perhaps in the distant past, predicted the desecration of tombs and the search for treasure, so they placed powerful radiation transmitters in the treasury of ancient knowledge to prevent all those who tried to discover the secrets of the Egyptian pyramids. Instead of fabulous treasures, the theory goes, beneath the pyramids are metal plates inscribed with hieroglyphs that contain all the secrets of ancient Egyptian science and the history of humanity since its inception on this planet. And like the stories about the hidden treasures of the Aztecs from the time of the Spanish conquests, especially those that mention the 52 golden plates on which their history and scientific achievements and knowledge were recorded, as well as the fact that Egypt has always been the target of numerous conquerors, then this theory sounds logical. In one of the ancient Egyptian treatises, it is stated that the god Thoth placed in a secret place the sacred books containing the secrets of Osiris in the name of the goddess Isis, and then cast a spell on this place so that the knowledge remained unrevealed until the heavens should give birth to creatures that will be worthy of this gift. Some researchers are still convinced of the existence of the secret room. They remember how Edgar Sayce predicted that one day in Egypt, under the right paw of the Sphinx, there would be a room called the Hall of Evidence, or Hall of Chronicles. The information stored in the secret room will tell humanity about a highly developed civilization that existed millions of years ago. In 1989, a group of Japanese scientists using a radar method discovered a narrow tunnel under the left paw of the Sphinx, which leads to Khafra's Pyramid, 
and an impressive cavity was found northwest of the queen's chamber. However, the Egyptian authorities did not allow the Japanese to conduct a more detailed study of the underground rooms. The research of the American geophysicist Thomas DeBecky showed that there is a large rectangular chamber under the paws of the Sphinx. Geologist Robert M. Schach of Boston University, who worked with DeBecky, stated that his research suggests the Sphinx actually dates between 5000 and 7000 BC. And I'm trying to be conservative he said in an interview. That would double the age of the Great Sphinx and make it the oldest monument in Egypt, he said. Some Egyptologists who have looked at Schock's work said they cannot explain the geological evidence, but they insist that the idea that the Sphinx is thousands of years older than they had thought does not match with the mountains of archaeological research they have carried out in the region. In the fall of 1993, New seismographic research was conducted around the Sphinx, and new anomalies and cavities were discovered. They were described as some kind of rectangular spaces, and they were allegedly located where Edgar Sace saw them, under the Sphinx's front paws. It is likely that there is a secret chamber in the south shaft of the Queen's Chamber in the Great Pyramid. In 1993, a German researcher received permission to research, and a special miniature robot was used. After driving over 200 feet through the tunnel, the robot discovered a small door with copper handles, but a barely noticeable slot on the lower right side of the door. Only in the fall of 2002, after many struggles and arguments between Egyptian and foreign experts and scientists regarding research permits, was a more modern robot equipped with a drill bit and a fiber optic camera and sent into the shaft. The robot drilled a hole and pushed a camera with bright lighting, but to the disappointment of those present, there was no chamber behind the door. It turned out there was simply another similar door. Despite this, it is still believed that there is a chamber behind that other door, and new attempts are being made to solve this great mystery. Meanwhile, scientists developed a new door-opening robot, and in 2003, they launched it into the same tunnel. It must have opened the door, and behind it, the already narrow tunnel began to narrow even more. The robot could not go any further, but it saw another door in the distance. A new robot was launched in 2013. After that, tourist access to the pyramids was finally closed, and all research results became confidential. Since then, there has been no official news. However, that hasn't stopped unofficial theories, one of which is actively lobbied and promoted by the American Casey Foundation. According to the foundation, they drove through the second door of the tunnel, after which a stone slab with hieroglyphs rose from the ground between the front paws of the Sphinx. The slab described a room under the Sphinx and a hall of testimony. As a result of the excavation, the Egyptians entered this first room, which turned out to be a kind of corridor. From it, the explorers descended the level below and found themselves in a round hall from which three tunnels led to the Great Pyramid. Allegedly, in one of the tunnels, the way was blocked by an energy field unknown to science, which three giants managed to remove. After that, a 12-story building going underground was discovered. The dimensions of this building are truly grandiose and more like a city than a building, 10 kilometers wide and 13 kilometers long. In addition, the Casey Foundation claims that the Egyptians hid a rod of Thoth, an archaeological artifact of worldwide importance, which is said to have the power of technologies unknown to mankind. Of course, at first glance, the theory about Sace's followers seems like complete nonsense, but the Egyptian government has since confirmed the discovery of something akin to an underground city in Giza. Naturally, there was no information from official authorities about energy fields, and the Egyptian authorities did not acknowledge that they entered the city, so it is also not known what was found there. But given the fact that there was indeed a large space hidden underneath the Sphinx, there's a new riddle that people are trying to solve in all kinds of imaginable ways. The Curse of the Pharaohs in 1909, Howard Carter, who had worked in Egyptian antiquities for years, began his association and partnership with Lord Carnarvon. Carnarvon had first come to Egypt in 1905 for his health after he had been injured in a car accident, 
and he soon became enamored of Egyptian archaeology. He had wished to fund some excavations himself, but he was told by the Antiquities Service that he must work with an experienced archaeologist before they would give him leave to excavate. This made Carter a natural partner, since Carter was a skilled and knowledgeable excavator with both the time and the inclination to form a new partnership. The two men soon gained permission to excavate and began working at Asasif, located in the Theban necropolis. Although the pair were keen to work in the Valley of the Kings, they instead found themselves working at various other sites, some even as far off as the Delta, while waiting for permission to excavate in the Valley of the Kings. The American archaeologist Theodore M. Davis had already been granted permission to work in the Valley of the Kings, and it was not until he retired in 1914 that Carter and Carnarvon were finally granted rights to the Valley of the Kings. It would be another eight years before the pair made their discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Perhaps unsurprisingly, those eight years of what they considered mediocre discoveries and false trails left Carnarvon frustrated and ready to give up the quest of finding a royal tomb. But Carter persevered and managed to convince Carnarvon to fund one last season, and thus the dig season of 1922 to 1923 commenced. The traditional dig season for Egypt was from November to March, because Egypt's hot climate made it best to dig during the cooler months of winter. Carter and Carnarvon's excavation that year began near the tomb of Ramses VI, a somewhat unusual location as it was in line with a water runoff. Such an area would have been filled with sand and rubble that had been dumped there from the rainwater running down the mountainside. As it turned out, Carter chose just the right spot. On November 4, 1922, only a few days into the season, what looked to be the entrance to an as yet unknown tomb was discovered. This initial indication of a tomb was nothing more than a step cut into the bedrock of the valley floor. The next day, further digging revealed a staircase that led down to a blocked doorway. The stones blocking the doorway were plastered over with mud and covered in seal impressions bearing marks of the necropolis, though at the time no royal name could be discerned. Lord Carnarvon was away in England at the time of the discovery, so Carter refilled the stairway with rubble and sent a telegram to Carnarvon notifying him of the discovery. At last made wonderful discovery in Valley, a magnificent tomb with seals intact, recovered same for your arrival. Congratulations. With that, Carter awaited his return. Carter also contacted a friend and colleague, Arthur Callender, to help with the excavation on the tomb. Upon the return of Lord Carnarvon to Gurna, the housing quarters of Carter and some of his team, the team started working again on November 23rd, with Calendar clearing the stairway in one day. That revealed more seals upon the entrance of the tomb, including one bearing the cartouche of Tutankhamun. Exciting as this discovery was, it was soon hampered by the realization that the tomb doorway had been reopened and closed again at some point in the ancient past, usually a strong indication that a tomb had been robbed in antiquity. Nonetheless, the discovery of what would prove to be a new royal tomb was truly exciting. Once the stone covering the doorway had been removed, a descending corridor filled with rubble was revealed and soon cleared. It took two days to do this, and on the afternoon of Sunday, November 26th, a second sealed doorway was found. As with the first doorway, it too was covered with seals bearing the cartouche of Tutankhamun. Due to their excitement over this discovery, the group decided to make a small opening in the top left corner of the doorway, and they then inserted a candle through the opening of the tomb to reveal what was inside. In Carter's own words, taken from his journal, this is what he saw. It was some time before one could see. The hot air escaping caused the candle to flicker, but as soon as one's eyes became accustomed to the glimmer of light, the interior of the chamber gradually loomed before one, with its strange and wonderful medley of extraordinary and beautiful objects heaped upon one another. There was naturally short suspense for those present who could not see when Lord Carnarvon said to me, Can you see anything? I replied to him, Yes, it is wonderful. I then with precaution made the hole sufficiently large for both of us to see. 
With the light of an electric torch, as well as an additional candle, we looked in. Our sensations and astonishment are difficult to describe as the better light revealed to us the marvelous collection of treasures. Two strange ebony black effigies of a king, gold sandaled, bearing staff and mace, loomed out from the cloak of darkness. Gilded couches in strange forms, lion headed, Hathor headed, and beast infernal. Exquisitely painted, inlaid in ornamental caskets, flowers, alabaster vases, some beautifully executed of lotus and papyrus device. Strange black shrines with a gilded monster snake appearing from within. Quite ordinary looking white chests, finely carved chairs, a golden inlaid throne, a heap of large curious white oviform boxes, beneath our very eyes on the threshold, a lovely lotiform wishing cup in translucent alabaster, stools of all shapes and design, of both common and rare materials, and lastly, a confusion of overturned parts of chariots glinting with gold, peering from amongst which was a mannequin the first impression of which suggested the property room of an opera of a vanished civilization. Our sensations were bewildering and full of strange emotion. Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon had just made the archaeological find of the century, and one that has yet to be surpassed by any other Egyptologists. Excavation would continue to be carried out by an expert team of photographers, draftsmen, conservationists, and so forth, in a detailed and meticulous manner. Arthur Callender, engineer. Arthur Mace, archaeologist, curator, and conservationist. Harry Burton, archaeologist and photographer. Alfred Lucas, chemist, conservationist. Sir Alan Gardner, Egyptologist and philologist. James Henry Breasted, Egyptologist. Percy Newberry, Egyptologist and botanist. Essie Newberry, conservationist. Douglas Derry, anatomist and the first to examine the body of Tutankhamun, Lindsay Hall, draftsman, Walter Hauser, archaeologist and architect. These men and women were just a few of those who worked on uncovering the secrets of the tomb, not to mention the many Egyptian workmen and their race Ahmed and Hussein Abu Omar. When the young pharaoh's tomb was revealed intact, researchers quickly learned that he was still in his teens when he died, which naturally led to theories surrounding his death. Given that he enjoyed the best medical care and received the best food in the world's most civilized kingdom at the time, his death seems shocking. Furthermore, his tomb was small and full of unfinished details, leading to speculation the boy suffered an unexpected, if not violent, end. The tomb, designated KV-62, is very small, especially by New Kingdom royal tomb standards. It consists of a sloping corridor that leads down to four small rooms or chambers. The plan of the tomb is very different from that of earlier 18th dynasty rulers. Indeed, its small size, cramped rooms, and unusual design imply that it had originally been intended for use by a nobleman, not the king. Due to the pharaoh's unexpected death, he was probably placed into the smaller tomb because his own was not completed or ready to receive a burial. The decoration found on the walls of the tomb was most likely painted on between the time of his death and burial. Though abbreviated, the decoration was still of a very traditional nature, and the condensed scenes would have been due to the lack of appropriate space. These scenes depict portions of the progress of Ra through the heavens and through the underworld, a clear statement declaring the return to the traditional religious practices. There are also scenes of the king being depicted alongside a variety of deities, along with a scene showing the opening of the mouth ceremony being performed by one of Tutankhamun's advisors, and soon to be successor, I. Despite the return to more traditional burial practices, there were still vestiges of the Amarna period to be found. Some of the figures of the king and of the deities retained the same canonical proportions seen during the Amarna period. It is unlikely that this was meant to make any deliberate statement concerning his lineage or religious preference, but was instead the result of multiple artists being used to decorate the tomb. More than 3,300 years after the young pharaoh was buried, two men from Utah tackled the case at the request of British film producer Anthony Geffen. Greg Cooper, a former FBI profiler and chief of police in Provo, and Mike King, 
director of the Ogden Police Department's Crime Analysis Unit. The two, in collaboration with Geffen's London-based company Atlantic Productions, studied a range of sources, including books, academic papers, photographs of the tomb, x-rays of the mummy, and interviews with modern experts to apply the advances of modern forensic medicine to the ancient case. Two sniffers believe they have found evidence that it was a murder, and at the same time, they believe that they know who the murderer was. What is clear is that the embalming procedure was carried out in a hurry, which can be seen by the fact that buckets of balsam were poured on the mummy. Was it part of a ritual or evidence of a murder cover-up? The first examination did not reveal anything suspicious, but over 40 years later, however, a researcher from the University of Liverpool received permission to take an X-ray of the mummy and discovered interesting details. A piece of bone floating in the brain cavity and a dark spot at the base of the skull that could represent a blood clot formed by hitting the head with a blunt object. To shed more light on the mystery, Cooper and King got hold of that video and took it to a medical expert, a radiologist, and a neurologist. They immediately discovered new details. Abnormalities in the bones above the eyeball indicated a fracture that occurs when the head hits a solid surface, causing the brain to move forward. Furthermore, the vertebrae in the boy's neck were fused, a symptom of a musculoskeletal deformity known as Klippel file syndrome. People with this syndrome cannot turn their heads without turning their entire torso, which makes it difficult for them to move. Perhaps an ancient criminal took advantage of that king's weakness and killed him. The investigators asked themselves, as in every modern case, who had the means, opportunity, and motive for this. They studied in detail the entire Egyptian empire from that time. The circle of suspects was narrowed down to four people, Maya, the chief treasurer, Horemheb, the commander-in-chief, Akasenamon, his wife, and I, his prime minister. Using a system of elimination based on pictures from the tomb showing the relationship the boy king had with his associates and his wife, based on the gifts left by his relatives, as well as on who succeeded him, they concluded that the culprit was Prime Minister A. He performed the same function during the reign of Akhenaten. He was the de facto king as he advised the young Tutankhamun on everything and thus won his trust. Most importantly, a assumed the throne after the boy's death. Conversely, prominent Egyptologists say it's all nonsense. For decades, very little light could be shed upon the cause of the pharaoh's death. However, with the advent of modern medical technology, it recently became possible to subject his mummy to a number of scans, including CT scans and DNA analysis. CT scans showed that not long before he had died, he had suffered a severe break in his leg, followed by an infection. This evidence, coupled with the presence of malaria in his system, revealed by the DNA scans, combined to give a very plausible cause of death. It is very likely that the boy died of illness that was the result of the infection in his leg and malaria. Such illness would have easily brought about an unexpected and sudden death, and the very nature of his tomb and burial support the notion that his death had been unexpected. Thanks to the tomb, historians now have physical examples of objects they had previously only seen depicted in drawings and paintings upon tomb and temple walls. They also possess the artifacts themselves and can determine how they were crafted and what materials were used. Of course, these are all relatively inconsequential compared to the legacy that Tutankhamun and his tomb left. After all, the tomb's objects and discovery fueled interest in Egypt unlike anything else ever has. It has affected pop culture, the film industry, tourism, literature, and so much more. A little-known and relatively unimportant king from Egypt's 18th dynasty is now one of the most popular figures in Egyptian history. Still, that's simply not enough of a legacy for some. Carter and his colleagues had found indescribable wealth in the tomb with three sarcophagi. The last sarcophagus, made of over 200 pounds of pure gold, hid the embalmed body of the young pharaoh, and there was an inscription above the sarcophagus, Death will befall those who disturb the pharaoh's sleep. At first, no one paid attention to it, but not long after, 
Lord Carnarvon fell ill. He suffered from weakness, fever, and high temperature, which reached 104 degrees. He raved as the fever shook him. The doctors found that the Lord had suffered the sting of an insect while shaving and injured himself. However, this could not have caused such a high temperature. His son came from India to visit him. One night, around 2 a.m. in the morning, there was a power outage in all of Cairo for inexplicable reasons. From the hotel room where Lord Carnarvon was staying, a strange noise woke his son. He found his father in a frenzy, drenched in sweat. The fifth Lord Carnarvon was dying. The Cairo power station reported there was no technical reason for the sudden power outage. That was how the legend of the Pharaoh's curse begins. After the death of Lord Carnarvon, real panic reigned among the diggers and workers at the site of the tomb. The cause of this was a small clay tile, which Carter found in the antechamber. After deciphering, it was established that the inscription said, Death will slay with his wings whoever disturbs the Pharaoh's peace. This clay tile later disappeared from the census and the fund, without anyone being able to figure out how and where. Lord Carnarvon's death could have been a coincidence, with no connection to the Egyptian pharaoh's tomb if it had all ended there. However, a few years after the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb, 22 people from Howard Carter's team were said to have died strangely and inexplicably. Thirteen had directly attended the opening of the tomb, such as Arthur Mace. Shortly after Carnarvon's death, Mace began to complain of burnout. His agony was short-lived, as he died shortly after of unknown causes. According to legend, James Breasted, an American archaeologist who attended the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb and sarcophagus, suddenly became paralyzed during an expedition in the Nile Valley. He was bedridden for a month and a half. Despite this, he demanded to be taken to the Valley of the Kings every day to see how Carter was progressing in his work around the tomb. The disease was accompanied by high temperature and terrible fever. The cause of the disease was unknown. The same symptoms, which soon led to his death, were also experienced by a professor of English literature named La Fleur, who, traveling in the East, visited Breasted and Howard Carter, as well as the tomb immediately after its opening. Eventually, the coffin was bought by a British businessman. His goal was to transport it to his home in London. All those who had anything to do with this coffin had some misfortune, so they got rid of it by donating it to the British Museum. On the day when the coffin was purchased, the businessman was cleaning his weapons when a pistol suddenly fired and hit him in the left thigh. An operation was performed, during which he died. Before the operation, he told one of his friends in Egypt that if something happened to him during the operation, he should deliver the coffin to his sister in London. The friend transferred the coffin to Port Said, preparing it for transport by steamboat to London. However, when he arrived in Port Said, he was greeted by a telegram stating that his brother had been killed. When he arrived in London, he handed over the coffin to the sister of his deceased friend. From the moment she took the coffin, troubles began to pile up. On the day the coffin was picked up, the woman's daughter was killed by a car crossing the road on her way to school. Seven days later, her husband died, committing suicide after the death of his daughter. Their material condition worsened. She lost her temper and became hysterical. She called witch doctors, parapsychologists, astrologers, and those who summon spirits, and they all agreed that the mummy in her house was causing all these problems that no one could prevent. She called the British Museum to take this mummy as a gift from her and transfer it to the museum. During the carrying of the mummy, one of the bearers started to make fun of the English people who believe in such superstitions. The coffin had not even been placed in its place when this worker was seized with terrible pains from which he writhed and whimpered for several minutes and then fell dead next to the coffin. All those engaged in the study of ancient Egyptian traces in England kept a strict account of this coffin, so they formed a commission to investigate the problem. It commissioned W.A. Mansell and Company to photograph this coffin from different perspectives. The company sent an emissary to take a photo of the coffin. When he returned to the office, he was greeted by another request. He went to do it, 
and when he was coming back, he had a traffic accident in which he lost the fingers of his right hand, and he could no longer paint. When he developed the film, he discovered there was a carved image on the coffin of a girl or girls dressed in a witch's outfit, with an expression of anger and evil reflected on her face. When they asked all those who saw the coffin before the picture was taken, they confirmed that they had not seen anything like what was in the photograph. Many scientists, inclined to believe only in what can be proven by experiments, tried to find some logical explanation for the alleged deaths. A biologist and doctor at Cairo University informed reporters in 1962 that he had finally tracked down the pharaoh's curse. In laboratory conditions, he proved the existence of a whole series of possible causes of death, including the fungus Aspergillus niger, which can survive in mummies and closed tombs for several thousand years. He discovered this fungus that causes inflammation of the respiratory organs, itching, and skin irritation among museum officials and archaeologists investigating tombs. Considering that the scientists died of fungal infection, he stated that rumors about the curse of the pharaoh are just empty stories. A few days after the press conference, the doctor died in a traffic accident. Cause of death, circulatory arrest. Even today, public opinion is divided as to whether there is some kind of curse or whether it is just a story and a well-conceived hoax. Over the centuries, Egyptian society did suggest that there was a tomb curse or curse of the pharaohs that ensured anyone who disturbed their tombs, including thieves and archaeologists, would suffer bad luck or even death. Naturally, there were warnings inscribed on the tombs of many buried ancient Egyptians, made in an effort to deter grave robbers. One inscription dating back to the 3rd millennium BC tomb of Kentika Ikeki reads, As for all men who shall enter this my tomb impure, there will be judgment. An end shall be made for him. I shall seize his neck like a bird. I shall cast the fear of myself into him. When the deaths of archaeologists were used to support the notion of a curse of the pharaohs, supernatural and scientific explanations were put forth as an answer. Carnarvon had the misfortune of being bitten by a mosquito and then suffering blood poisoning after cutting it open with a razor while shaving. Other strange stories were reported in conjunction with the opening of the tomb. Howard Carter always played down suggestions of a curse, but in 1926, he did consider it strange that he saw jackals of the same kind as Anubis, which guarded the entrance to the treasury room. It was the first time he'd seen that kind of jackal during his career, which by then spanned over three and a half decades. In reality, of the nearly 60 people who worked in Tutankhamun's tomb, less than 10 of them died within a dozen years. Most went on to live normal, healthy lives. The Mysterious End of Mohenjo-Daro When one thinks of the world's first cities, Sumer, Memphis, and Babylon are some of the first to come to mind, but if the focus then shifts to India, then Mohenjo-Daro will likely come up. That city owes its existence to India's oldest civilization, known as the Indus Valley Civilization, or the Harappan Civilization, which was contemporary with ancient Mesopotamia and ancient Egypt, and had extensive contacts with the former, making it one of the most important early civilizations in the world. Spread out along the rivers of the Indus River Valley, hundreds of settlements began forming around 3300 BC, eventually coalescing into a society that had all of the hallmarks of a true civilization, including writing, well-developed cities, a complex social structure, and long-distance trade. Mohenjo-Daro was the largest city of the Indus Valley civilization, one of the most advanced civilizations to have ever existed, and the best-known and most ancient prehistoric urban site on the Indian subcontinent. It was a metropolis of great cultural, economic, and political importance that dates from the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC. Although it primarily flourished between approximately 2500 and 1500 BC, the city had longer-lasting influences on the urbanization of the Indian subcontinent for centuries after its abandonment. It is believed to have been one of two capital cities of the Indus civilization, its twin being Harappa, located further north in Punjab, Pakistan. 
Mohenjo-daro is an enigmatic settlement which confuses simple definitions of what a city consists of. It has revealed little evidence of palaces, contains few definite religious buildings, and appears to have never been involved in any external or internal military conflict. The inhabitants' writing has not been deciphered, and little is known about their religious and afterlife beliefs. Nonetheless, the city's importance is epitomized by its monumental buildings and walls, enormous man-made platforms, innovative architectural techniques, and evidence that they engaged in trade over vast distances with high-quality artifacts sent from the Indus Valley as far as Mesopotamia and even Africa. Of particular note was their ingenious drainage system, one of the earliest means by which sewage was drained out of the city. No other urban site of similar size had a hydraulic network as complex and effective as that of Mohenjo-daro, and it would only be surpassed thousands of years later by the network of aqueducts in Rome during the 3rd century AD. For centuries, this city was believed to have sprung into existence suddenly and without precedent, with a highly standardized system of urban development, art, and architecture that is emulated in contemporary settlements across the Indus River Valley in a phenomenon known as the Pan-Indus system. Although this view has changed over the past few decades, there exists no definitive hypothesis as to how the people established such a complex urban society so quickly. Fittingly, the city has an equally intriguing and mysterious narrative that explains its decline and eventual disappearance, a tale that gives the site its name, the Hill of the Dead. The Indus Valley civilization can be described as having gone through three main phases— expansion, integration, and collapse. Naturally, there is plenty of speculation and many theories focused on the last of these stages. At some point during the Jukar period, approximately 1900 to 1700 BC, the Indus Valley civilization underwent a remarkable transformation as the major urban centers were abandoned and their populations disappeared. This occurred at Mohenjo-daro as well, Though research in the past decade has shown that this was not nearly as rapid as previously believed. The most dramatic and frequently mentioned theory was proposed by R. P. Shanda, an associate of one of the earliest archaeologists of the city, Sir John Marshall. Shanda believed that the Vedic Indo Aryans destroyed the cities and massacred the people of the Indus Valley civilization. Based on human remains, he found that had been unceremoniously discarded on the streets or in the ruined houses of Mohenjo-daro from the final period of its occupation. The Aryans were an Indo-European people that came to the Indian subcontinent from its northern borders sometime during the second millennium BC. They allegedly used chariots driven by horses raised on the Eurasian steppe and armed themselves with the latest military innovations— bows, arrows, javelins, axes, and swords. According to this version of the story, the city's men, women, and children were massacred at the hands of Aryan invaders, leaving the streets of city littered with corpses as the population was totally exterminated. Human remains were used to give legitimacy to the massacre myth, such as the incomplete skeleton found on the so-called Dead Man's Lane, as were tales of Indra, the principal deity of the Aryans, known also as the Fort Destroyer, for his role in destroying the citadels of the Dasyu, mortal or supernatural enemies of the Aryans. However, there is a lack of material evidence that attests to destruction of this scale having ever taken place. The lack of weapons, human remains, or damage to buildings from this period, indeed, the lack of violence indicated in any period of the Indus Valley civilization's history, suggest that the residents of Mohenjo-daro were a distinctly unwarlike people. No human remains have been found in the fortified citadel, which would have likely been where much of the fighting would have occurred if such an invasion occurred. Moreover, the human remains used to support this story date much later than the Indus Valley Civilization period. Most of them are from later burials that had cut through the archaeological layers of the city. The chronology that has been established through continued archaeological work in the last two centuries indicates that such an invasion simply did not take place, and the massacre at Mohenjo-daro never occurred. 
Instead, a series of human and natural factors contributed to the general deterioration of the Indus Valley civilization and the abandonment of Mohenjo-Daro. The region was and is still tectonically active, as the Himalayas are pushed upwards by the forces of continental drift, causing the collision of the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates. This convergent continental-continental boundary leads to a number of devastating results, including earthquakes and land shifts. This means that the entire area is continuously rising, and even slight changes to the region's topography can have an enormous impact on drainage. For example, archaeological remote sensing and geophysical surveys carried out at Cholistan, Pakistan, have revealed that at some point during the second millennium BC, the major Saraswati River dried up. This is supported by the earliest Vedic texts of India, which describe a major river in the general area drying up sometime between the early second and first millenniums BC. Today, an arid stretch of ground with small intermittent rivers known as the Gagarhakra. During the Indus period, this was a powerful watercourse whose loss must have had devastating repercussions for farmers who relied upon its annual floods. Climate may have been a factor in the environmental degradation and major demographic upheavals of the region. Floods were already common in the Indus River Valley, but analysis of pollen remains recovered by archaeologists has indicated that rainfall rose steadily during the 3rd millennium BC and declined considerably during the 2nd millennium. This climate change would have had an impact on the vegetation of the region, as analysis shows that during this period, deciduous forests were replaced by shorter thorn trees known to thrive only in dry soil with poor water retention. At the same time, there was a general deterioration in the maintenance of buildings and dams in the city. These changes would have increased the amount of water that was draining into the Indus River, causing it to flow faster and increasing the likelihood of floods. Since the second millennium BC, the Indus River has shifted more than a mile from its original location. As the Indus River crept gradually closer to Mohenjo-Daro, the greater frequency and force of the floods would have been of great concern for the city's residents. A similar entanglement of natural and cultural attributes causing landscape change occurred in contemporary Mesopotamia, where the flat floodplain caused the Tigris and Euphrates rivers to shift often and quickly, causing sudden changes to settlement patterns. The water table near Mohenjo-Daro rose as a result of these changing environmental conditions. This would have led to increased levels of soil salinity, and in turn, that must have had a detrimental impact on agricultural yields. Farms in the hinterland could not sustainably provide enough food for the city's population, leading to overgrazing and deforestation, each of which only exacerbated the problem. Deforestation was also caused by the enormous fuel requirements of the mid-brick industry and for the copper industries of the city. Vast amounts of charcoal would have been required to reach the temperatures required to manufacture these bricks, and in the second millennium BC, animal dung was being used instead of charcoal, indicating that there was not enough wood available in the city's hinterland. Finally, changing trade routes may have also played a role in the city's decline. Land-based trade appears to have been replaced by a reliance on maritime trade by the end of the third millennium BC, but the sudden rise in the Arabian Sea coastline of West Pakistan in the 2nd millennium BC might have disrupted these sea-based links during the period of Mohenjo-Daro's deterioration. Living standards in Mohenjo-Daro declined massively and irreversibly as a result of these changing conditions. The structural integrity of later houses, with thin and poorly assembled walls, was far worse than the solid, mud-brick buildings of the third millennium. Many of the monumental buildings were divided up and converted into other functions, such as pottery kilns and workshops. There appears to have been a sudden surge in population within the city limits, followed by a sudden depopulation of the entire settlement and suburban landscape. The Great Bath and other large buildings fell out of use, and archaeological remains even indicate that deadly diseases were rife during this period of deterioration, including malaria and cholera. These diverse factors eventually led to large-scale population migrations southeast and the growth of settlements in the Kathiawar Peninsula, 
north of present-day Bombay. Surveys at Gujarat have shown that significant growth in the number of settlements took place between 2000 and 1800 BC. South of the Punjab, the Ganges Valley became the focal point of civilizational growth. Writing, urban settlement patterns, centralized control, international trade, occupational specialization, and widely distributed standardized artifacts all changed during this process, each fragmenting into regionally distinctive forms. Immediately after the abandonment of Mohenjo-Daro, the city became a hotbed of banditry as raiders from the Baluchistan Hills occupied the ruins. Up to the late 19th century, most academics believed that civilizations and complex urban societies only appeared in India during the first millennium BC, but this picture changed during the 20th century when excavations at Mohenjo-Daro were performed by some of the most famous names in the history of archaeology. Archaeologists, working with the Archaeological Survey of India, began investigating the site from the 1920s. Rai Bahadur, Daya Ramsani, and Rakal Das Banerjee were some of the earliest, but the ancient city only came to international attention through the work of Sir John Marshall and Ernest McKay. Marshall was attracted to Mohenjo-Daro by the presence of the Buddhist monastic ruins at the summit of the conspicuous mound, and in 1922, he began excavating the site. As he bored through the extremely deep layers of mud bricks, he became the first to discover that the mound was man-made, and one of the earliest to realize the great antiquity of the site by dating the site to before the Mauryan period. Marshall returned to Mohenjo-Daro four more times between 1925 and 1927, and through these projects came to the conclusion that the Indus civilization was India's indigenous civilization. Ernest John Henry Mackay was the next archaeologist to visit Mohenjo-Daro, employed by Marshall in 1926 to continue the excavations on a full-time basis. He discovered human remains lying on the streets of the uppermost periods of occupation, which were used to support Shanda's hypothesis regarding the Aryan invasion of the city. Together, the results of Marshall and Mackay formed the foundation for almost all subsequent research of the settlement. Between 1925 and 1926, Marshall employed more than a thousand laborers for the large-scale excavations of the site. However, by 1931, problems with funding meant that large-scale excavations had to be abandoned, though some smaller-scale projects were undertaken by others. 1932, 1933, 1935, 1936, and 1938. The renowned Australian archaeologist Gordon Child took an interest in the debate, and in the 1930s he proposed a set of key identifying features of the Indus civilization. Their complex drainage systems, absence of palatial, religious, or mortuary structures, a competent bureaucracy, the lack of evidence suggesting their engagement in military activity, and a unifying ideology reified by the striking similarities between their cities. His checklist of attributes has been applied to Indus settlements ever since. Naturally, the unsolved mystery of Mohenjo-Daro's decline, the lack of evidence for the kind of warfare that typically destroyed ancient sites, and the relatively advanced technology of the Indus Valley civilization have all lent itself to conspiracy theories. Many people continue to insist that ancient art and texts suggest some of the civilizations experienced incredible things and attempted to document them as best they knew how. From the gods who descended from the sky, mentioned in numerous ancient cultures around the world, to the incredible flying disks mentioned by Egyptians thousands of years ago, conspiracy theorists insist there is evidence that ancient people were visited by aliens. According to some, Possible written evidence of advanced technology that existed on Earth thousands of years ago may be found by looking at the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, leading some researchers, including David Davenport, to claim that the ancient city was destroyed by nuclear weapons. He argued that the fact skeletons have been unearthed in the middle of the streets suggests they suffered sudden and violent deaths, while many others show signs of being hastily buried. They remain intact, despite being potentially exposed to decay and scavengers for millennia. Furthermore, 
there are no traces of blows from weapons on them. According to the theory, archaeologists discovered that Mohenjo-Daro was destroyed by a nuclear explosion because there are thick layers of clay and green glass inside the city, and that laboratory analysis suggests the city was exposed to temperatures above 1,500 degrees. Russian scientist Alexander Gorbovsky, in his book Riddles of Ancient History, claims that at least one of the skeletons found in the area of Mohenjo-Daro showed a 50 times higher dose of radioactive radiation than it should have. Lastly, they claim that when a student asked J. Robert Oppenheimer if the first nuclear device to explode was the one at Alamogordo during the Manhattan Project, he replied, well, yes, in modern times, of course. Some researchers believe that there was a civilization in India more highly advanced than modern societies, and that it disappeared because of a conflict with another equally advanced society or an extraterrestrial civilization, with the uncontrolled use of technology resulting in something like nuclear weapons. Another fantastical theory claims that the Indus Valley made contact with an alien civilization and, as a result, were given cutting-edge weapons for which they were not yet ready. As a result of the misuse of these weapons, the Indus Valley civilization disappeared. The Lost Army of Cambyses Shortly after he succeeded his murdered father, Philip II of Macedon, Alexander launched his famous invasion of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. Ever since the famous Persian invasions that had been repelled by the Athenians at Marathon and then by the Spartans at Thermopylae and Plataea, Greece and Persia had been at odds. For some years they had enjoyed an uneasy peace, but that peace was shattered in 334 BC when Alexander crossed the Hellespont into Persia. He brought with him an army of 50,000 infantry, 6,000 cavalry, and a navy of over a hundred ships, a mixed force of Macedonians, Greeks, Thracians, and Illyrians, all chosen for their specific strengths. Alexander's invasion was immediately challenged. At the Granicus River in modern Turkey, Alexander crushed a force of 30,000 Persian troops sent to oppose him, and during the battle he led the cavalry himself, as he was accustomed to doing. The destruction of this Persian field army granted him control of virtually all the neighboring territory, and he captured the city of Sardis before marching on the fortress of Halicarnassus, which fell after a vicious siege. From there, he proceeded into Lycia and Pamphylia, systematically conquering all the coastal territory of Asia Minor. He then marched inland, where he famously visited the city of Gordium, seat of a renowned temple. The temple housed a cart whose parts were held together by a supposedly unsolvable knot, and legend had it that any man who could untie it would be made king of Asia. Alexander, disdaining any attempt at trying to fumble at the knot with his fingers, simply drew his sword and hacked it in two. After wintering in Asia Minor, Alexander crossed into the Persian heartland in 333 BC, finally moved to action by what he at least perceived as a serious threat, the Persian emperor Darius III mustered an army that most sources suggest numbered almost a hundred thousand men and marched against Alexander. Battle was joined at Isis in November of 333 BC, and the battle was vicious. Alexander lost more than 7,000 men, but he annihilated the Persian army and forced the Persian emperor to flee, albeit not before Alexander's men captured his royal treasury, his wife, daughters, and mother. Alexander disdainfully refused an offer from the emperor of a peace treaty and land concessions, claiming that as he was now king of Asia, it fell to him to decide how to dispose of his possessions. Alexander then marched into Syria, which he conquered with relative ease, but his attempts at pacifying the region in short order were frustrated first by the city of Tyre and then again by the stronghold of Gaza. Both cities had colossal fortifications that required the construction of siege works and engines of war on a scale hitherto unseen to reduce, and the resistance from both garrisons was exceedingly fierce, prompting Alexander to kill all men of fighting age and sell survivors into slavery when they were finally taken. At Gaza, as Alexander personally led an attack against the walls, he was struck by a missile from above and seriously injured in the shoulder, 
one of the many serious wounds he was to accrue in his time as a fighting king. Having witnessed the fate of Tyre and Gaza, the garrison of Jerusalem capitulated to Alexander without a fight, allowing him to push southwards into Egypt. The ancient kingdom of the pharaohs had been reduced to a vassal state of Persia, so its inhabitants greeted Alexander like a liberator, and the entire country fell to him without a fight. In 332 BC, Alexander made a pilgrimage to the Oracle of Ammon, located at the oasis of Siwa out in the Egyptian desert, where the oracle proclaimed him ruler of the world and son of Ammon, Egypt's patriarchal deity, leading Alexander to adopt the title Son of Zeus Ammon. Coins minted by him from there on out showed him with ram's horns as a mark of his divine parentage. It is unclear whether Alexander truly believed the rumors of his own divinity, but it is undeniable that the oracle's verdict severely inflated his pride, prompting the first accusations of hubris from his supporters, some of whom also grumbled that Alexander was getting dangerously close to going native. Alexander, unfazed by these murmurings, journeyed to northern Egypt, where he founded Alexandria in Egypt, his most famous city. After letting his soldiers recuperate and receiving reinforcements, in 331 BC, he struck eastwards and marched into Mesopotamia. He would never return to Egypt. On a few occasions during his military campaigns, Alexander's men came close to outright mutiny, and one of those times occurred in Egypt due to the fears of traveling through the desert to Siwa. The reason the men were afraid of that journey is because they were all too aware of the region's history. In 671 BC, Assyrian invaders arrived in Egypt. One of these Assyrians, Esarhaddon, invaded and captured Memphis, forcing the pharaoh Taharko to flee south to Thebes, but in 664 BC, Esarhaddon's son Ashurbanipal invaded and sacked Thebes as well. The defeated Nubian pharaohs retreated to their homeland, but Ashurbanipal left Egypt under the control of the Sa'it pharaohs of the 26th dynasty. Ashurbanipal died in 627 BC, and the Assyrian Empire began to fall into a swift decline. Given this power vacuum, the provinces of Egypt were filled with dynastic disputes and widespread discontent, both of which left it weak and vulnerable to attacks from the outside by the Medes and Persians in Iran, as well as the Scythians and Sumerians in Central Asia. Left to their own devices by the preoccupied Assyrians, the 26th dynasty was able to extend their authority upstream, but the Assyrian Empire was replaced by the Babylonian Empire. Then came the Empire of the Medes and then the Persian Empire. With the use of Greek and Anatolian mercenaries, the Egyptian pharaohs were able to remain largely independent, but the rulers of these great empires dealt with pharaohs who grew too ambitious quickly and harshly. The pharaoh Necho dreamed of restoring the Egyptian empire to the greatness of the past, but his dreams and his army were quickly destroyed by the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar at the Battle of Carchemish in 605 BC. In the late 6th century BC, the Persians came to Egypt and inadvertently produced one of the ancient world's greatest mysteries. In 525 BC, the Persian ruler was Cambyses II, who had succeeded the Achaemenid Persian Empire's founder, Cyrus the Great. He was not a popular ruler and was aware of it, to the extent that before leaving for Egypt, he secretly killed his brother Bardia, fearing that during his long absence from the capital, his enemies would take advantage of the opportunity and put Bardia on the throne. When this murder became known later and a false Bardia, claiming to have survived the conspiracy, ascended the throne, this usurper was accepted in large parts of the empire. That offered clear proof of the emperor's unpopularity. In the desire to emulate his father's successes and establish Persian rule through all the known world, he attacked Egypt in 525 BC, and as he marched on Egypt, the pharaoh Amasis died, and Semeticus III came to the throne. At first, the Persian campaign was unusually successful. He enjoyed the cooperation of the Phoenician cities, including Tyre and the island of Cyprus, which put their fleets at his disposal. Polycrates of Samos broke off friendship with Egypt and sided with the Persians. Fanes, the general of the Egyptian mercenary forces, 
left Semeticus and crossed over to the Persians, helping them in their campaign and leading the Persian army through the desert towards the Nile Delta. Eventually, the Persians began to administer Egypt as a satrapy, but nobody remembers Cambyses II today for his triumphs, because of the fact that he sent an army of nearly 50,000 soldiers towards the desert oasis of Siwa and the army disappeared in the western desert without a trace for more than 2,000 years. For generations, desert explorers and adventurers set out in an effort to solve the mystery of their disappearance. One of the earliest sources on the fate of the missing Persian army was the Greek historian Herodotus, who wrote that the cause of the disappearance was a desert storm. Herodotus wrote that the Persian army entered the Egyptian desert near Thebes and was swallowed up by a terrible storm. That fantastic story has long been the subject of debate among Egyptologists around the world. Herodotus reported that the Persians were able to cross the difficult Sinai desert region and face the Egyptians with their army at full strength, which is important because it indicates that the Persians were trained in desert transport. They hired Arab tribes to set up a water reservoir, an artificial oasis, so they could arrive at the battlefield in good condition and defeat the pharaoh Semeticus. To be crowned pharaoh, Cambyses later traveled to Egypt's major cult centers, but, according to Herodotus, he did not go out of his way to learn or respect their customs. After that, he decided to launch a military campaign against the Ethiopians from the south and the Carthaginians along the coast to the west. He also launched a campaign against the Ammonites, the inhabitants of the oasis of Siwa, a small fertile area deep in the western desert known for the oracle of the Temple of Ammon. The priests of the temple enjoyed the respect of the Egyptian rulers who came there for divine grace to legitimize their rule, which is precisely why Alexander the Great traveled there nearly 200 years after Cambyses. As Egyptology became a professional pursuit in the 19th century, the mystery haunted both professional researchers and amateurs who wanted to find evidence that would confirm or refute Herodotus's story. After all, it was hard to believe that such a massive and powerful army could have disappeared solely due to a desert storm. Instead, they assumed the army did not disappear, but was simply defeated. Some research has revealed that the army eventually crossed the desert to an oasis called Desera. The area was once the base of the Egyptian rebel leader Petubastus III, so it is believed that the rebels may have ambushed the Persians around there. Petubastus III had rebelled against the excessive taxation of Egypt and eventually conquered a large Egyptian oasis, then proclaimed himself pharaoh. A story that the army was swallowed by sand may have originated with the Persian king Darius I to cover up the humiliation of the Persian defeat, instead attributing it to an unforeseen natural cause. In addition to representing a great mystery, the bitter fate of the lost army also offered the fascinating possibility that there is a large cache of bones, armor, clothing, weapons, and equipment left by the ancient Persians in the desert, just waiting to be discovered. The army probably included warriors from many different parts of the ancient world. In extremely dry climates, and with the possibility that the sand protected them by covering them, researchers figured the remains could be incredibly well-preserved. Not at all discouraged, many desert adventurers dreamed of solving the mysteries of the lost army. One of the most famous was the Austro-Hungarian playboy, pilot, and desert explorer Count Laszlo Almasy, whose life and work served as the basis for the character played by Ralph Fiennes in the film The English Patient. Almasi began his career as a self-taught amateur in the exotic world of desert exploration, but thanks to a careless attitude towards personal safety and driving skill, he experienced several incredible adventures. During the 1930s, he joined a company composed mostly of sophisticated British officers interested in desert travel and exploration, mostly focused on locating the semi-legendary Zerzura, the oasis of little birds, alluded to in medieval writings. Having successfully discovered this hidden oasis, Almasy stunned the other members of the Zerzura Club. 
but his search for the lost Persian army was not successful and was far more dangerous. Almasi was an ardent admirer of Herodotus, so in 1936 he decided to follow the trail of the army by following the records of the ancient Greeks. His journey is described in Saul Kelly's book, The Lost Oasis, The Desert War and the Hunt for Zerzura. Kelly described how on a previous expedition, Almasi discovered pottery shards, suggesting that the Persians intended to cross the waterless desert by burying large amphorae, jugs, along the planned route and employing local tribes to bring them water, which would allow them to carry out an operation like the previous successful crossing of the Sinai. At least that is what Almasi believed. However, when he went on a desert expedition from Farafra in 1936, he didn't discover reservoirs of water jugs, but a whole series of stone mounds, which he described as ancient hollow stone pyramids, circular in shape, about human height, which seemed to be marking the route across the terrifying sea of sand. The Persians may have employed scouts to build them, hoping to take them to Siwa. Kelly noted that Almasi's expedition then encountered difficulties that gave them insight into the possible fate of the army. Their progress was stopped by impassable giant dunes, and a hot desert wind blew in, whipping their vehicles with storm force and heat that reached up to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. All but one of the vehicles broke down, and they were lucky to get out of the desert alive in the third, following a pass between two dunes. Four days later, they reached Siwa. Almasi planned another expedition, but war broke out, and he never got another chance. The story of the missing army was virtually forgotten until recently, when two Italian archaeologists, twin brothers Angelo and Alfredo Castiglioni, who became famous for discovering the Egyptian Golden City in Sudan, came across the remains of the army in the desert. Inquiring among the Bedouins, they heard stories of thousands of bleached bones that were temporarily uncovered by the wind in one place decades ago. Allegedly, the place was already visited by grave robbers, who found a beautiful sword that was sold to an American tourist. Not far from the Baharia Oasis, about 75 miles south of Siwa, archaeologists found a mass grave with about a hundred skeletons and objects including Persian arrowheads and horse harnesses, identical to those in preserved Persian paintings from that era. They believe that somewhere nearby, under more than 15 feet of sand, are the bones and remnants of the vast army that set out to destroy the Temple of Ammon they thought was there only to be met instead by a stormy Khamsin, the infamous Saharan dry wind. The discovery offered a stark reminder that even when a story sounds too good to be true, it actually does turn out to be the case. The Assassination of King Philip II of Macedon When Philip II came to power in 360 BC, he was only 23 years old and had spent most of his adult life as the hostage of an Illyrian tribe. His ascension to the Macedonian throne took place in the midst of great chaos in Macedonia, with the Illyrians continually raiding the kingdom from the north, while other Greeks took advantage of this by taking even more Macedonian land. The problem was further exacerbated by Athenian attempts to influence the throne and Pausanias's attempt to usurp Philip's legitimate succession. Diodorus summarized the chaotic and confusing situation. But when he was defeated in a great battle by the Illyrians and fell in the action, Philip, his brother, who had escaped from his detention as a hostage, succeeded to the kingdom, now in a bad way. For the Macedonians had lost more than 4,000 men in the battle, and the remainder, panic-stricken, had become exceedingly afraid of the Illyrian armies and had lost heart for continuing the war. About the same time the Paeonians, who lived near Macedonia, began to pillage their territory, showing contempt for the Macedonians, and the Illyrians began to assemble large armies and prepare for an invasion of Macedonia, while a certain Pausanias, who was related to the royal line of Macedon, was planning with the aid of the Thracian king to join the contest for the throne of Macedon. Similarly, the Athenians too, being hostile to Philip, were endeavoring to restore Aragaeus to the throne and had dispatched Mantius as general with 3,000 hoplites and a considerable navy force.
In about five years, Philip II not only brought order back to Macedon, but also the respect it had once earned from Greek and non-Greek neighbors alike. Philip was also able to take further advantage of the deteriorating political situation in mainland Greece. The Peloponnesian War was supposed to settle the difference between the Greek city-states once and for all. It was thought the victor would impose its will over the Greeks to institute a pan-Hellenic state under one government, or at least a federated form of government. Although the Spartans attempted to do so after their victory in the war, their resources and manpower were too depleted to impose any type of lasting hegemony over the other Greeks. In 370 BC, Sparta attempted to preserve a toehold of influence in Arcadia by invading, but the Arcadians, knowing which way the wind blew, promptly asked for assistance from Thebes. A Theban army under Epaminondas was promptly sent to the Arcadians' aid, and after having liberated the region, began marching toward Sparta proper. For reasons unknown, Epaminondas decided not to march toward the city itself, perhaps realizing that such an unprecedented threat to their very city would drive the Spartans to feats of Herculean desperation. Instead, he diverted his army toward the hello capital of Messene and began liberating vast tracts of Messenia, ensuring an all-out helot uprising, and then fortifying the city so the Spartans could not retake it. Though Thebes had long been an important city, it had never been predominant militarily. Once it did, however, the main city-states of Greece now turned against Thebes. Worried by the newly ascendant power of Thebes, several of Sparta's erstwhile enemies, including Mantinea and Athens, made common cause with the Spartans. In 362, the Boeotian League, led by Theban forces, faced this impromptu coalition at the Battle of Mantinea. Though the Spartans were once again defeated, Epaminondas himself was killed in the hour of victory. A peace was sought, but Sparta snubbed the negotiations which decreed Messenia independent. Hemmed in by enemies, Argos, Messenia, Arcadia, on all sides, Sparta was in no position to pursue imperialistic policies, and indeed the city's very survival was threatened. A semblance of balance was established, with each of the great city-states, Athens included, sitting back and catching their breath. For several years, it even seemed as though peace might be an option, but just outside the borders of Greece, Philip ambitiously seized on an opportunity. By the year 352 BC, Philip believed Macedon could potentially be the power to unify the entire Hellenic world, so he began his campaign to forcefully unite the Hellenic world by sending his modern army west into Thrace and south into Thessaly. The Thessalians were having problems with the other Greeks, particularly the Phocians, and they formed the Thessalian League to combat central Greek aggression. Knowing the Macedonians were experiencing a military renaissance, hoping to secure their northern border, the Thessalians not only invited Philip and the Macedonians to join the Thessalian League, but they also made the Macedonian king the archon or general of the League's military forces. Philip upheld his end of the deal by driving the Phocians from Thessaly. Diodorus wrote that, In response to a summons from the Thessalians, Philip entered Thessaly with his army and at first carried on a war against Lycophron, tyrant of Pharae, in support of the Thessalians, but later, when Lycophron summoned an auxiliary force from his allies, the Phocians, Phalus, the brother of Onomarchus, was dispatched with 7,000 men, but Philip defeated the Phocians and drove them out of Thessaly. With Macedonia's southern border secured and the Illyrians and Thracians pacified for the most part, Philip turned his attention to the Chalcidic League, which had always been problematic so far as Macedonia's quest for hegemony in northern Greece was concerned. The city-states of the League were descended from Athenian colonists and held ideas in opposition to the Macedonian monarchy. More importantly, the Chalcidic League, like Macedonia, was expansionistic, which put it in direct conflict with their Macedonian neighbors. The Macedonians had not forgotten about the war between Amyntas III and the Chalcidic League, and once Philip had secured Macedonia's border with Thessaly, he turned his attention to enacting revenge. Philip concentrated his efforts on Olynthus, 
the leading city in the Chalcidic League, and a constant thorn in Macedonia's side. The war lasted until 348 BC, when the Macedonians raised Olynthus and Philip had finally broken up the Chalcidic League for good. After the victory at Olynthus, Philip combined work and pleasure by attending the Olympic Games and hosting large, extravagant banquets. Diodorus wrote, After the capture of Olynthus, he celebrated the Olympian festival to the gods in commemoration of his victory and offered magnificent sacrifices, and he organized a great festive assembly at which he held splendid competitions and thereafter invited many of the visiting strangers to his banquets. Philip II's victory celebrations served important political and propaganda purposes for a number of reasons. The celebrations allowed the Macedonian king to expand and solidify his networks with the southern Greeks, many of whom were still, no doubt, leery of the warlike Macedonian king. The celebrations also allowed Philip to demonstrate his Greekness, thereby establishing his rightful place among the older, more established Greek city-states. At that point, most of the other Greeks viewed the Macedonians as Greeks, but there were still holdouts. Philip's participation in the Olympics and his magnanimous gestures of holding extravagant symposia were efforts to assuage any lingering ideas the Greeks might have held regarding the Macedonians as barbarians and foreign conquerors. The efforts were largely successful, but not all of the traditional city-states were willing to accept the Macedonians as their equals. The Athenians traditionally never saw the Macedonians as true Greeks, and although they were willing to trade with them, they were disturbed to see the Macedonians' growing influence in the Greek world. Macedonia's war against the Chalcidic League, in particular, was troubling enough for the leaders of Athens to take action. To put Philip in his place, in 349 BC, Athens called for a renewed Hellenic League against Macedon, and Philip responded by marching the Macedonian army south through Thessaly and central Greece, until other members of the League relented by giving control of the League to the Macedonian king. Perhaps sensing things would get much worse if they did nothing, the Athenians declared war on Macedon in 340 BC, and while the first two years of the war were largely indecisive, Philip's army finally had favorable battlefield conditions at Cheronea in 338 BC. His 18-year-old son, Alexander, stood with his father during the battle, taking control of the Macedonians' left flank. According to Diodorus, the battle was a complete rout. He waited for the last of his laggard confederates to arrive, and then marched into Boeotia. His forces came to more than 30,000 infantry and no less than 2,000 cavalry. The armies deployed at dawn, and the king stationed his son Alexander, young in age but noted for his valor and swiftness of action, on one wing, placing beside him his most seasoned generals, while he himself at the head of picked men exercised the command over the other. Corpses piled up, until finally, Alexander forced his way through the line and put his opponents to flight. More than a thousand Athenians fell in the battle, and no less than two thousand were captured. The Battle of Cheronea gave the Macedonians hegemony over the Greek world, and from that point on, there was very little organized or active resistance to Macedonian control of the Hellenic League due to Philip II's command of the modern and sizable Macedonian army. Philip had introduced new battlefield technologies and techniques, revolutionizing ancient warfare and giving Macedonians the edge over the other Greeks. And moreover, he started a practice that continued to be employed by his son, his son's successors, and even by the Romans. When Philip brought armies onto the battlefield, they were usually comparable in size to their enemies, and constantly fielding such large armies would have been impossible with Macedonians alone, so Philip had began conscripting non-Greek soldiers from among the peoples he conquered. The Illyrians were a particularly warlike people, who Philip could often count on in battles against the other Greeks, while the Thracians, like the Macedonians, were known to be excellent horsemen. This proved to be one of the most successful Macedonian military policies. As Philip won victory across Greece, questions of succession were discussed in Pella and throughout Greece. Philip had several wives, 
but his son Alexander, with his fourth wife, Olympias, seemed destined to become king. Although Olympias was not Philip's favorite queen, and she was not fully Macedonian, her father was the king of Epirus, her son appeared to be the ablest of Philip's sons. The only other alternative at this point was Eridaeus, who was mentally slow. The choice then seemed to be Alexander at an early point, but whether he would live that long was never a given in the often Machiavellian Macedonian court. Alexander the Great's early life was interesting, and it influenced his worldview as an adult. As a youth, Alexander was tutored by the legendary philosopher and scientist Aristotle, who was Athenian by birth but grew up in Macedonia because his father had been a royal physician for Amyntas III. Alexander lived with the Illyrians as a royal hostage during his teen years, which allowed him to see the non-Hellenic world firsthand and make important contacts he would use later in his Asian campaigns. He would learn the art of war by fighting alongside his father against the Athenians. After three years under the tutelage of Aristotle, Alexander received his first chance to forge his own legacy when his father left Macedonia to wage war on Byzantium, leaving Alexander, aged 16, as regent of Macedon. Philip's absence and the presence of an untested ruler on the Macedonian throne inspired several of Philip's subject and satellite states to revolt. The Thracians rose up in arms, but Alexander proved up to the task and crushed their forces, erecting the first of many Alexandrias, the city of Alexandropolis, in Thrace. Philip was extremely pleased with his son's performance, and, in order to test his mettle further, when he returned from his campaign, he dispatched Alexander, at the head of a small army, to pacify the remainder of Thrace. During this time, in 338 BC, Alexander also defeated a force sent from Illyria to attack Macedonia, as well as succeeding in his task of quelling the revolt in Thrace. He was summoned from the field with his army by Philip, who had used a flimsy pretext to involve himself in the affairs of the Greek city-states, and was marching southwards at the head of the Macedonian army. Together, they marched through the pass at Thermopylae, where, years before, a Spartan army under King Leonidas and their Thespian allies had fought one of history's most famous and legendary battles against the Persian Empire, Greece's historic enemy. The Macedonians defeated the Theban garrison dispatched to stop them and advanced into Greece proper. Once in Greece, Philip and Alexander's main concerns were the powerful cities of Thebes and Athens, which had united their armies and resources against them. They marched on the city of Amphissa, whose citizens had begun tilling fields sacred to the oracle at Delphi, prompting Philip's invasion on the pretext he had been invited by concerned followers of the oracle. After forcing Amphissa to surrender, Philip sent Thebes and Athens a last offer of peace, but upon having it rejected, marched southwards. The Macedonian army marched quickly, but it found its path blocked by the Thebans and Athenians near Chaeronea. The Thebans were confident, having recently developed an outstanding martial tradition which had led to their vanquishing none other than the renowned Spartans, and battle was rapidly joined. Philip took command of the right wing of his army and gave the left to Alexander, cannily ensuring that his most seasoned generals were there to make sure the young boy did not blunder. And as noted before, Alexander did not disappoint his father's trust. As Philip lured the enemy with a false retreat, Alexander personally led a cavalry charge that smashed through the Theban forces, instigating a general rout among the Athenian troops and forcing the Thebans, alone and surrounded, to surrender. The victorious Macedonians marched southwards, where they met no further resistance and were greeted with offers of alliance by all the major cities, save Sparta, which traditionally stood aloof from such matters. It should have been Alexander's finest hour. He had proven himself in the field. He was the hero of Chaeronea, and he enjoyed the esteem of both his father and many of the leading Macedonian nobles. However, his triumph quickly turned sour. Shortly after returning to Pella, Philip set his wife Olympias aside in favor of the young Cleopatra, the niece of one of his generals. Alexander was furious at this, 
particularly as it jeopardized his position as Philip's heir, and he had a violent falling out with his father during the wedding celebrations, to the point that the ever-volatile Philip actually drew his sword on his son. Philip was well and truly drunk by then, and succeeded only in sprawling on the floor, prompting Alexander to remark, here is the man who you would have led you against the Persians. He stumbles, jumping from one seat to the next. Following his quarrel with his father, Alexander was forced to flee Macedonia with Olympias, but he was recalled to court about six months after, Philip's anger having mellowed in his absence. Shortly thereafter, Cleopatra gave birth to a son, also named Philip, which must have given Alexander cause for concern, and then the following year the couple had a daughter. Still, Philip seems to have genuinely wanted to have Alexander succeed him, so much so that he wanted him by his side at a royal wedding celebration in 336 BC. It was during these festivities that Pausanias, the captain of Philip's royal bodyguard, stabbed the king in the heart and killed him. Alexander was quickly proclaimed king by Philip's generals and the leading men in Macedonia. At age 20, he was now ruler of Macedon and hegemon of the League of Corinth. Some of the facts surrounding Philip's murder in 336 BC are clear and indisputable. The murder took place in the theater in Agai, in the presence of a large crowd that had traveled from all over Macedonia and Greece to support the king. In the morning, the solemn procession started in which, according to Diodorus, the statues of the twelve Olympian deities, made with great skill and richly decorated, were carried. With them as the thirteenth, a magnificent statue of Philip II on a throne was carried. Philip appeared when the theater was full. Wanting to show the Hellenes that he was moderate in his popularity, he ordered his bodyguards to follow him at a distance. He solemnly entered the crowded theater with his son Alexander, while everyone admired his power. Suddenly, one of Philip's bodyguards, the young Pausanias, jumped up and gave Philip a fatal blow. Pulling out a dagger hidden under his cloak, Pausanias stabbed Philip between the ribs and ran away. The assassin was caught and killed by another two of Philip's bodyguards, Perdiccas and Leonates. Thus, this joyful event turned into a tragic act. The Macedonians had plenty of potential explanations for Pausanias's perceived motive. As a teenager, he was Philip's favorite young man and lover. A polygamist like all Macedonian kings, Philip was known for numerous affairs with women and young men, but Philip eventually replaced him with another young man, whom Pausanias ridiculed. The new boy had friends and relatives in high positions, including Attalus, whose niece Philip took as his bride in 335 BC. Attalus decided to take revenge on Pausanias for the insults by inviting him to a feast and getting him drunk. The nobleman and his friends then savagely beat Pausanias and may have raped him, according to Diodorus. As news of the humiliation spread, Pausanias went to Philip, demanding justice. Philip, ever the shrewd politician, sought a compromise. He sent Attalus far away to become one of the two commanders in charge of the guards sent to Asia Minor, and he rewarded Pausanias by making him one of his seven personal guards. Although this was a great honor for the young man, it did nothing to erase what had happened. Pausanias, therefore, directed his hatred towards Philip, because the king did not treat him with the respect he felt he deserved as Philip's former lover. In the wake of Philip's assassination, Pheromones and Arabaeus, sons of Areopus, were also tried and executed for Philip's death. A third brother, Alexander the Lincestian, managed to escape punishment and went on to hold a position of honor under Alexander the Great. It was not because he was innocent, but because he quickly supported Alexander at a time when he needed supporters. After all, at the time of the murder, it was regarded as certain that Alexander the Lincestian had also, with Pausanias, conspired to kill Philip. However, because he supported Alexander the Great, and because he was the son-in-law of Antipater, he was exempted from punishment. As this makes clear, despite the fact Alexander the Great is remembered today as history's greatest conqueror, his ascent to the throne of Macedon was not unopposed. 
fearful of political rivals challenging the claim of a young and relatively untested monarch whose father had died so suddenly and mysteriously, Alexander had many of his political rivals, chief among them those who had a tenable claim to the throne, executed. His mother, Olympias, who had returned from exile, also took advantage of the turmoil to have Cleopatra, Philip's widow, and her daughter by him, burned alive. It is also likely that she tried to poison Philip's son by Cleopatra, but a botched attempt, or perhaps natural causes, made him mentally disabled, and thus no longer a threat. For his part, Alexander was furious at this barbarity, prompting an estrangement with his mother which lasted for years. Alexander also had to contend with problems outside of Macedonia. News of the hegemon's death had not gone unnoticed, and virtually all of Philip's conquests rose up in arms. The Thracians, Thessalians, Athenians, and Thebans all discarded their alliances with Macedon, rushing to occupy the passes in the north of Greece against Alexander's forces. Ignoring suggestions of a political solution to the uprising, Alexander led his cavalry on an encircling march around the Thessalian forces sent to bar his way, surrounding them and forcing them into surrender before marching southwards. The Greek city-states, terrified by the speed of his advantage, promptly sued for peace, recognizing him as hegemon. Alexander was formally invested with the title in the city of Corinth, where he also famously encountered the renowned philosopher Diogenes the Cynic. Alexander, who through his tutelage by Aristotle had developed an admiration for wise men, asked Diogenes if the king of Macedon might do anything for him. Diogenes, who was sitting in the public square at the time, sourly looked up at him and told Alexander that he could. He could get out of his son. This remark prompted Alexander to later say, if I could not be Alexander, I would be Diogenes. Plutarch would later write that Alexander and Diogenes died on the same day in 323 BC. As for the murder of Philip, the Lincestians are often presented as scapegoats in the murder as some sort of cover-up by Alexander to protect either himself or his mother. In ancient times, however, the Lincestians were seen as guilty enough to be convicted for the murder by a large assembly of men. It is known that Lincestus, a kingdom in the Pindus Mountains and a neighbor of Macedonia, had been both a traditional rival and often unwilling subject of the kings at Pella, and was only brought under the Macedonian umbrella during Philip's reign. The resentment towards Philip II must have been great, and perhaps the Lincestian brothers believed that with Philip's death, the Macedonian domination of their kingdom would end. There may even have been a precedent set for the brothers, sons of Ariopus, in the figure of another Ariopus, who was on the Macedonian throne around the end of the 6th century BC, and yet another Ariopus, possibly a Lincestian usurper of the Macedonian throne, who reigned from about 398 to 395 BC. Furthermore, at the time, many people suspected Alexander had organized the murder of his father, and the motive was obvious, the ambition to rule. Despite being a young adult, Alexander was proclaimed king of Macedonia a few hours after Philip's murder, and to secure his position, he quickly ordered the execution of potential rivals and sent orders to eliminate Attalus. One of the most important events that incriminate Alexander is an incident that reportedly occurred at the wedding feast for Philip and Cleopatra. Attalus, the bride's uncle, stood up and asked the gods to bless the marriage of a boy who would be more worthy of the throne. Badian claimed that Alexander behaved violently, so much so that he briefly fled the country. This incident was resolved after an intimate conversation between Philip, Alexander, and a friend with whom Philip was staying in Illyria. Alexander is also implicated, according to another modern historian, because of a private conversation he and Pausanias supposedly had that was relayed by Plutarch. Alexander allegedly made inflammatory comments to Pausanias, in confidence, to kill those who stood in his way. That said, it is difficult to believe that Plutarch would have known about such a private conversation, making this direct link between Pausanias and Alexander untenable at best. It is not that the whole argument can be dismissed, because no direct link can be made. Rather, 
it means a closer look at the other events is still required to determine the validity of the whole argument. Philip's death proved very fortunate for Alexander. It placed him at the head of a reformed, united, and flourishing Macedonia, and at the head of a formidable army with a major campaign against Persia. Not enough is known about his inner character to say whether he could have arranged to kill his father, nor are there any facts to show that he did. It remains another mystery surrounding the great and formidable career of Alexander the Great. In 1977, archaeologists hoped to have found Philip's tomb in Aegean Macedonia near Thessaloniki. However, it turned out to be a grave from 317 BC, meaning it could not possibly belong to Philip. Recently, another grave near Thessaloniki was examined in which the skeleton of a 45-year-old man, corresponding to Philip's age at the time of death, was found together with the remains of a woman and a baby, which made it very likely that it was the tomb of a Macedonian ruler. However, other reports indicate that the Macedonian general Cassander cremated Philip's body, so historians will probably never know for sure where the great Macedonian king rests. The Disappearance of the Library of Alexandria In the modern world, libraries are taken for granted by most people, perhaps because their presence is ubiquitous. Every school has a library, large libraries can be found in every major city, and even most small towns have public libraries. However, the omnipresent nature of libraries is a fairly recent historical phenomenon, because libraries were still few and far between before the 19th century. For centuries in the Western world, during what is known as the Middle Ages, written knowledge was guarded closely and hidden away in private repositories, usually by the religious classes and hidden away in private repositories. The lack of libraries in the West has helped contribute to the popular imagination of the ancient library at Alexandria and all the myths and legends that have come to be associated with it, but the Library of Alexandria deserves its reputation. Before the Middle Ages, Greek scholars carefully collected and inventoried books and other written materials in the Library of Alexandria, which truly made it a sort of precursor to all modern libraries. In fact, the Library of Alexandria proved to be one of the greatest institutions created in the ancient world because it influenced the minds of countless people in profound ways for centuries. The library not only inspired the imaginations of artists, but gave birth to new research methods, which proved to provide the basis for many considered commonplace today. The Library of Alexandria was one of the few libraries in the ancient Greek world, which helped ensure that mathematicians, scientists, and other scholars from across the Mediterranean traveled to Egypt to study there. And it was so impressive in its size and influence that it left an indelible mark on the world that still reverberates today. While the exact nature of the library remains murky, it functioned for at least several centuries and is believed to have housed hundreds of thousands of books, most written as scrolls on papyrus, and it essentially became the culmination of two ancient literary and cultural traditions converging, the Greek and Egyptian. Of course, the most controversial aspect of the Library of Alexandria is its destruction, which is still a topic of debate today. Several ancient historians attributed its destruction to the Roman conquest of Egypt during the first century BC, with some, like Plutarch, specifically citing Julius Caesar's soldiers as the ultimate cause of its destruction. The Roman writer Seneca wrote that 40,000 books were lost in the fire, However, other ancient historians claimed to have gone to the Library of Alexandria after Caesar stayed in the city, and all of these claims might be muddled by the fact that there was more than one library in the area. It's possible that the Library of Alexandria or some version of it survived until the 7th century AD. But either way, the destruction of the library is often viewed as one of the reasons the Middle Ages were dark. Nobody knows for sure how much knowledge was lost in the library, nor how it affected what Western societies knew and didn't during medieval times. The Library of Alexandria was clearly an important institution in the ancient Mediterranean world, and its collection of books was the largest and most influential of the ancient world. In fact, modern research methods and library cataloging can be traced to its halls. 
All of this begs the question of how such an important institution vanished. Ironically, the destruction of the Library of Alexandria is one of its most talked about aspects, and the one thing that people often think they know about, yet the answer to this question is shrouded in mystery and the subject of legendary stories that only serve to make the history of the library more clouded and mysterious. Throughout the last millennium, numerous stories have circulated that ascribe blame for the destruction of the Library of Alexandria to different sources, and among these, the three most prominent theories involve foreign conquests. The destruction of the library has been attributed to Roman general Julius Caesar's men burning it during the civil wars in 48 or 47 BC, Roman Emperor Theodosius having the Serapeum and possibly the main library of Alexandria burned around 390 AD, or even the Muslim Caliph Omar ordering the library burned when he conquered Egypt in 642 AD. The first and most prominent theory is that when Julius Caesar sided with Cleopatra VII in her bid for the throne of Egypt against her brother, Ptolemy XIII, a fire inadvertently destroyed the Library of Alexandria during the fighting. This theory was most notably put forth by Plutarch, who wrote in his Life of Caesar that, when the enemy endeavored to cut off his communication by sea, he was forced to divert that danger by setting fire to his own ships, which, after burning the docks, thence spread on and destroyed the great library. This theory was later advocated by writers such as the Roman Stoic philosopher Seneca, who wrote in 65 AD that 40,000 books were burned, and it was mostly popularized in the 18th century by historian Edward Gibbon in his seminal history of the Roman Empire. Some Roman writers even claimed that Mark Antony had scrolls removed from the Library of Pergamum and brought to Alexandria as a replacement for Cleopatra, but this is believed to be propaganda by supporters of Octavian who were trying to paint Antony in a bad light ahead of their own civil war. The belief that Caesar was responsible extended well into the 5th century AD, as Roman historian Paulus Orosius wrote, so perished that marvelous monument of the literary activity of our ancestors, who had gathered together so many great works of brilliant geniuses. In regard to this, however true it may be that in some of the temples there remain up to the present time book chests, which we ourselves have seen, and that, as we are told, these were emptied by our own men in our own day when these temples were plundered, this statement is true enough. Yet it seems fairer to suppose that other collections had later been formed to rival the ancient love of literature, and not that there had once been another library which had books separate from the 400,000 volumes mentioned, and for that reason had escaped destruction. The civil wars certainly brought turmoil to areas of the Mediterranean world, especially in Egypt, but other Roman historical sources appear to contradict the idea that the Library of Alexandria was one of its victims. In the first century AD, Suetonius wrote in the Twelve Caesars about the Library of Alexandria during the reign of the Emperor Claudius, who ruled from 41 to 54 AD. To conclude, he even wrote books in Greek, 20 volumes of Etruscan history and 8 of Carthaginian. The city of Alexandria acknowledged these works by adding a new wing to the museum called the The Claudian in his honor, and by having the Etruscan history publicly recited from end to end once a year by relays of reader in the old wing and the Carthaginian history likewise in the new. If Suetonius's account is accurate, then it is difficult to believe that the Library of Alexandria was destroyed during the civil wars in the second half of the first century BC, only to be rebuilt less than a hundred years later in time for Claudius to have a wing named in his honor. Such a feat would be next to impossible, considering the limited construction technology of the time. Furthermore, the ancient writer and geographer Strabo made no mention of a fire or any destruction when he wrote about the museum while in Alexandria in 24 BC, so the available primary sources seem to contradict the theory that the Library of Alexandria was destroyed during the Civil Wars. This led modern historian Theodore Vredos to try to square the different accounts. The Roman galleys carrying the 37th legion from Asia Minor had now reached the Egyptian coast, 
but because of contrary winds, they were unable to proceed toward Alexandria. At anchor in the harbor off Lochius, the Egyptian fleet posed an additional problem for the Roman ships. However, in a surprise attack, Caesar's soldiers set fire to the Egyptian ships, resulting in the flames spreading rapidly and consuming most of the dockyard, including many structures near the palace. This fire resulted in the burning of several thousand books that were housed in one of the buildings. From this incident, historians mistakenly assumed that the Great Library of Alexandria had been destroyed, but the library was nowhere near the docks. The most immediate damage occurred in the area around the docks, in shipyards, arsenals, and warehouses in which grain and books were stored. Some 40,000 book scrolls were destroyed in the fire. Not at all connected with the Great Library, they were account books and ledgers containing records of Alexandria's export goods bound for Rome and other cities throughout the world. If Caesar's men didn't burn the library, what actually happened? Historians have been left to consider if the Library of Alexandria was destroyed during the reign of one of the later Roman emperors, such as Theodosius or Aurelian, or during the Muslim conquest of Egypt. However, the accounts concerning Theodosius and Omar were apparently influenced by religious polemics, because the fact that Theodosius was a Christian emperor and Omar a Muslim caliph made them lightning rods of controversy. The Omar story became popular in Europe during the Renaissance, when he was portrayed as an ignorant man who had the library destroyed because it did not conform to his religious worldview. However, there is no primary source evidence that can confirm Omar ordered the Library of Alexandria to be burned, or that it was even in operation during the 7th century AD. Historian John Hannon sought to rebut several aspects of the Omar story in The Mysterious Fate of the Great Library of Alexandria. The errors in the sources are obvious, and the story itself is almost wholly incredible. In the first place, Gregory Bar Hebraeus represents the Christian in his story as being one John of Byzantium, and that John was certainly dead by the time of the Moslem invasion of Egypt. Also, the prospect of the library taking six months to burn is simply fantastic, and just the sort of exaggeration one might expect to find in Arab legends such as the Arabian Nights. However, Alfred Butler's famous observation that the books of the library were made of vellum, which does not burn, is not true. The very late dates of the source material are also suspect, as there is no hint of this atrocity in any early literature, even in the Coptic Christian chronicle of John of Nikiu, died after 640 AD, who detailed the Arab invasion. Finally, the story comes from the hand of a Christian intellectual who would have been more than happy to show the religion of his rulers in a bad light. Agreeing with Gibbon this time, we can dismiss it as a legend. The same is true for Theodosius, but some modern historians have suggested that the emperor instigated the burning of the smaller Serapium library, and ancient historians wrote about it. For example, Socrates of Constantinople wrote, at the solicitation of Theophilus, Bishop of Alexandria, the emperor issued an order at this time for the demolition of the heathen temples in that city, commanding also that it should be put in execution under the direction of Theophilus. Seizing this opportunity, Theophilus exerted himself to the utmost to expose the pagan mysteries to contempt, and to begin with, he caused the Mithraeum to be cleaned out and exhibited to public view the tokens of its bloody mysteries. Then he destroyed the Serapium, and the bloody rites of the Mithraeum he publicly caricatured. The Serapium also he showed full of extravagant superstitions, and he had the folly of Priapus carried through the midst of the forum. Thus, this disturbance having been terminated, the governor of Alexandria and the commander-in-chief of the troops in Egypt assisted Theophilus in demolishing the heathen temples. In turn, historian Mustafa El Abadi believes the museum as a whole was ruined in the process. The Mausian, being at the same time a shrine of the muses, enjoyed a degree of sanctity as long as other pagan temples remained unmolested. Synesius of Cyrene, who studied under Hypatia at the end of the 4th century, saw the Musaean and described the images of the philosophers in it. We have no later reference to its existence in the 5th century.
as Theon, the distinguished mathematician and father of Hypatia, herself a renowned scholar, was the last recorded scholar member, circa 380, it is likely that the motion did not long survive the promulgation of Theodosius's decree in 391 to destroy all pagan temples in the city. One of the more recent theories concerning the library's destruction placed the blame on the Roman emperor Aurelian, who suppressed a rebellion in Alexandria sometime around 270 AD. But while there are historical documents that verify Aurelian's suppression of the rebellion, there is no definitive proof that the library was destroyed at the time. In fact, a contemporary writer of the time, Ammianus Marcellinus, suggests that the damage to the Serapis had already been done. Besides this, there are many lofty temples, and especially one to Serapis, which, although no words can adequately describe it, we may yet say from its splendid halls supported by pillars and its beautiful statues and other embellishments is so superbly decorated that next to the capital, of which the ever-venerable Rome boasts, the whole world has nothing worthier of admiration. In it were libraries of inestimable value, and the concurrent testimony of ancient records affirm that 70,000 volumes, which had been collected by the anxious care of the Ptolemies, were burnt in the Alexandrian War when the city was sacked in the time of Caesar the Dictator. It's possible that the library's destruction was much more benign and much less intentional. After all, fire is not the only possible explanation for the library's destruction, considering the medium that most of the books were written on and the changing geopolitics of the ancient world during the beginning of the first century CE. Most books in housed in the Library of Alexandria were written on the reed papyrus, and although susceptible to fire, papyrus is also at the mercy of other elements, such as humidity. While some scholars believe the library actually took measures to deal with the effects of humidity via the actual architecture of the building, Bagnall argues that the humid climate of Alexandria, as opposed to the drier Saharan climate across the rest of Egypt, would have ensured the destruction of any books written on papyrus. The destruction would have taken place over hundreds of years and would not have been as dramatic as a fire, but the loss would have been just as thorough. This argument definitely has merit when considering what Egyptologists have found. Thousands of Pharaonic-era papyrus documents have been discovered by modern scholars, and most are dated to the New Kingdom, with the earliest dated to the First Dynasty, around 3000 BC. However, most of these pharaonic era documents were discovered in tombs, which were built just outside of the fertile valley at the edge of the desert, where the dry conditions helped to preserve the documents. The humidity of Alexandria may have played a role in the destruction of the collection of the Library of Alexandria, but that cannot explain it fully either. If the library was cared for as it was during its first 200 years of existence, then capable librarians, funded by the rulers of Egypt, would have been able to halt the effects of the natural elements through preservation techniques, such as transcribing new editions. Without some sort of act of destruction, it seems like the library's existence should have been perpetual as long as there was a political will to preserve it. There's no doubt that the early Ptolemaic rulers of Egypt were admirers of the arts who wished to make Alexandria the cultural center of the world, or that they patronized the library with generous funds from their coffers, which in turn made Alexandria the enlightened epicenter of the ancient world. The library of Alexandria's success was dependent on the fortunes of these benefactors. However, while the Library of Alexandria was built during an era of political stability in the region, by the end of the first century BC, outside forces began to covet the wealth of Egypt, particularly the Roman Empire. Because of this, the Ptolemies were forced to dedicate more time and resources to the arts of war rather than the arts they formerly pursued. At one point, Ptolemy VIII even expelled all scholars and artists he suspected of political opposition, and eventually, Egypt lost its independence when it became part of the Roman Empire in 30 BC. While Roman writers seem to indicate the Roman emperors patronized the Library of Alexandria at least until the reign of Claudius, Alexandria and the library clearly became an afterthought. 
As Roman political power grew in the Mediterranean region, Greek cultural ideas were grafted with Roman ones and assimilated. The Romans were certainly intrigued with Greek learning and art, but they loved their own city, and aside from military campaigns, they were not inclined to travel abroad. Thus, in order to quench their desire for all aspects of Greek culture, the Romans imported Greek scholars and books into Rome. This shift in power in the ancient world cannot be overstated when it comes to explaining the fortunes of Alexandria and its famous library. Rome had replaced Alexandria as the most important city in the world, and the library of Alexandria would naturally suffer for it. A telling passage from Suetonius relates this passing of the torch during the reign of the emperor Domitian, who ruled from 81 to 96 AD. At the beginning of his reign, he abandoned the study of literature, even though he went to a great deal of trouble and expense in restocking the burned-out libraries, hunting all over for lost volumes and sending people to Alexandria to transcribe and correct them. This is an interesting passage because it indicates that there were still important books in Alexandria during the reign of Domitian, but also that the Romans were more concerned with building their own libraries than preserving the library of Alexandria. One can also assume that some of the agents sent to Alexandria to transcribe books merely took the originals back to Rome, which would have further added to the destruction of the Library of Alexandria. The disappearance of the library is without question one of the ancient world's most intriguing unsolved mysteries, but that has also led some to speculate that it never truly existed in the first place. One of the reasons is that while traditional archaeology has helped people understand a lot of ancient history, that is not the case in Alexandria. A series of floods and earthquakes that occurred in the Middle Ages led to palaces in the northeastern part of the city being submerged underwater and inaccessible. Recent discoveries in underwater archaeology have revealed more, but excavations around the foundations of the museum at Alexandria will probably never be possible. Part of the remains of the Great Temple of Serapis, in the southwestern part of the city, were only recently excavated. And while many ancient and Byzantine sources mention the fate of the library, they are contradictory, inconsistent, and confused, so there is no definitive contemporary version. While the focus has been on how the library was destroyed, the accounts regarding the development and size of the library also tend to be contradictory. Many of the claims made should be treated with skepticism, given the tendency of ancient scribes to embellish stories or color them with political and religious bias, and during archaeological excavations, no trace was found that indicated that this library existed. The legends about the Library of Alexandria are impressive and provide many surprises, but there is one very important detail. The stated dimensions of the library make it much smaller than originally boasted. If the Library of Alexandria did exist, according to Professor of the History of Ancient Libraries, Thomas Hendrickson, actual information about it is very scarce, but even the legends about it managed to inspire the entire ancient world, so more information about the library is crucial. Cleopatra's Death Among the Ptolemaic kings, Ptolemy VIII would probably be the closest to one what thinks of as a stereotypical ancient despot. Unlike most of his predecessors, who had colorful nicknames, some of which are translated into English as savior, soter, or flutist, oletes, Ptolemy VIII was given the moniker of Fiscon, or Fat. Unlike the first three Ptolemies, he was no patron of the arts, and despite being known for his weight, he was also notoriously thin-skinned. Instead of building on the accomplishments of his illustrious predecessors, he spent most of his time going after his political enemies and those who had offended him. One of his most notable targets was the famed Library of Alexandria, home to many prominent free thinkers of the time. Once he learned that a fair amount of opposition had originated in the halls of the library, he closed the institution's doors for the remainder of his rule. An example of the tactics Ptolemy VIII used to suppress opposition was recorded by Strabo. But after this mass of people had also been blotted out, chiefly by Fiscon, in whose time Polybius went to Alexandria, 
for, being opposed by factions, he more often sent the masses against the soldiers and thus caused their destruction. Ptolemy XII came to power after Ptolemy XI, who only ruled for a few days in 80 BC, killed his wife and incurred the wrath of an Alexandrian mob, losing his life in the process. Besides being the father of Cleopatra VII, Ptolemy XII was known for his pursuit of the arts and humanities, earning the nickname the flutist in the process, but in terms of imperial policy, he was weak and ineffective, and he nearly destroyed the Egyptian economy when he devalued the currency. Ptolemy XII's accession to the throne was marked by plotting and bribery on a grand scale, and once he was in place, he grew so paranoid that, suspicious of his provincial governors, he insisted on concentrating almost all executive powers in Alexandria, where he had his seat. Such a system of government could not hope to cope with, or indeed understand, the problems faced by the Egyptian kingdom's most far-spread provinces, and inevitably, there were violent uprisings by those subjects at the borders of the kingdom who felt themselves abandoned to their fate. Cyprus and Cyrenaica were both lost, and other rebellions were crushed only with great difficulty and expense. At this time, Egypt had effectively become a client state of Rome and a valued trading asset, as they provided the majority of grain imports to the capital, and in 58 BC, despite unrest at home, Ptolemy was obliged to travel to Rome on an official visit. He chose to take Cleopatra, then just a child, with him as well, but what was meant to be a short trip ended up becoming a three-year exile. Taking advantage of his absence, another Cleopatra seized the throne. It is unclear which Cleopatra this was, as records from the period are sparse and not helped by the fact that the Ptolemies constantly used the same names over and over again. She may either have been Cleopatra V, making her Cleopatra the seventh's mother, or Cleopatra VI, which would mean she was a sister. Either way, this Cleopatra's reign was to be short-lived, because within a few months of her accession to the throne, she died suddenly, under mysterious circumstances. It is highly likely that she was murdered, most probably at the hand of Berenice IV, Cleopatra VII's older sister, who took the throne as soon as she died. Berenice ruled for just under three years in Alexandria, until Ptolemy XII finally returned at the head of a Roman army led by General Aulus Gabinius. Ptolemy had been forced to go hat in hand to Rome, having virtually no support outside of Alexandria and no chance of regaining his throne by raising armies of his own. Though this move allowed Ptolemy to recapture the throne of Egypt, he had effectively made his kingdom a vassal state of Rome, garrisoned by Roman armies, propped up by Roman spears, and dependent on Roman goodwill. Betrayed by at least one of his eldest daughters, if not two, or his wife, Ptolemy XII seems to have turned to Cleopatra VII, his companion during his three-year exile, as his sole repository of trust. Though she was only fourteen, he proclaimed her regent, a largely ceremonial position which nonetheless placed her in direct line to the throne in the event of his death. Ptolemy's reign limped on for another four years, amid further losses of crucial territory and an ever-growing dependence on Gabinius's troops, whose officers had established themselves, apparently permanently, in Egypt, and promptly formed their own political faction, the Gabiniani, in order to try and carve themselves their own piece of the rich Egyptian pie. Finally, in 51 BC, Ptolemy XII died, leaving 18-year-old Cleopatra at a crossroads, she could not assume sole rulership, for such an act would require her to get rid of her younger brother, Ptolemy XIII, with whom she was expected to share power. Cleopatra was also, in keeping with dynastic tradition, required to marry Ptolemy XIII, who was ten years old at the time. With the weight of tradition upon her, Cleopatra complied, but it would certainly not be a happy union. The two seem not to have gotten along as brother and sister, never mind as husband and wife, and their joint rule was marked by more uprisings. To add insult to injury, the Nile stubbornly refused to deliver adequate floods. Egypt's fertile grain fields were dependent on the periodic flooding of the Nile basin, which would coat the fields with a natural fertilizer, and a sparse flood meant even sparser harvests. 
which meant not only that the people would go hungry, but that Egypt would be unable to deliver sufficient grain to Rome, with all the perilous consequences that entailed. Just a few months after ascending to the throne, Cleopatra effectively divorced her younger brother, whose influence was limited by his age. She no longer appeared with him at official ceremonies and started being the sole signatory on official documents, a gross breach of tradition. In Ptolemaic tradition, female co-rulers were technically subordinate to their male counterparts, regardless of whether this was actually the case, so doing away with Ptolemy was a slap in the face to the many traditionalists at court. Having made enemies of the traditionalists, she promptly followed this political mistake in 50 BC by upsetting one of the most powerful political factions in Egypt, the Gabiniani. Having been in Egypt for approximately five years, the Gabiniani had essentially severed their ties to Rome. When some exponents of the Gabiniani murdered the sons of Marcus Bibulus, the governor of Syria, who had been sent in friendship to request their aid in a military campaign against the neighboring Parthians, Cleopatra saw a chance to intervene and cut the Gabiniani down to size. She had the assassins seized, put in chains, and delivered to Bibulus, but while this may have curried favor with the Roman governor, it did nothing to endear her to the Gabiniani, who promptly went from uneasy allies to sworn enemies. Cleopatra could hardly hope to rule long in the face of such massed political hostility, and in 48 BC, a plot spearheaded by Pothinus, a eunuch in the palace service, with the collusion of Cleopatra's many enemies, forced her from the throne and placed the more biddable, pliant Ptolemy XIII on it as sole ruler of Egypt. Cleopatra now found herself a fugitive. Cleopatra was exiled to Upper Egypt and then fled to the Levant in order to escape a potential assassination, and at some point during this time, she made contact with Julius Caesar in order to elicit his support for her claim to the Egyptian throne. At the time, Rome was tearing itself apart, and the repercussions of this conflict were being felt across the Mediterranean. Caesar, the former consul and governor of Gaul, had marched across the Rubicon, illegally bringing his armies onto Italian soil and threatening Rome itself, with the purpose of making himself dictator. Caesar was opposed by his former ally, Pompey the Great. Though he was a legendary general, by this time, Pompey was an old, spent man, while Caesar was still vigorous, and Caesar had chased Pompey's army from Rome, hounded it all the way to southern Italy. And then, when Pompey escaped across the Mediterranean to Greece, Caesar had loaded his army onto a fleet and shipped it across the sea, where he had annihilated Pompey's armies at Pharsalus in 48 BC. Pompey barely escaped with his life, and virtually alone and penniless, he had taken ship for Egypt, where he arrived as a supplicant, possibly hoping for military assistance from the Gabiniani or from Ptolemy XIII himself. Having heard a rumor that Pompey was attempting to raise men against him in Egypt, Caesar took ship for Alexandria, only to find upon his arrival that Pompey had been murdered on the orders of Egypt's young pharaoh, the boy King Ptolemy XIII. Possibly encouraged by Pothinus, Ptolemy had Pompey put to death almost immediately after his arrival in Egypt, the end result apparently being that he hoped to ingratiate himself with Caesar, whose victory at Pharsalus had, by default, made him the uncontested ruler of Rome and thus the most powerful man in the known world. Ptolemy XIII, however, had completely misunderstood Caesar. When the Roman general arrived in Egypt a bare two days later, hot on Pompey's heels, Ptolemy received Caesar with great pomp and presented him with Pompey's head. Pompey had been a close friend of Caesar's before their rivalry spiraled out of control and had even married Caesar's daughter, who had died in childbirth before the war. The move infuriated the future Roman dictator. The year was 48 BC, and Rome's strongest man was now in Egypt and positioned to decide who would rule. Cassius Dio noted, Cleopatra, it seems, had at first urged with Caesar her claim against her brother by means of agents, but as soon as she discovered his disposition, which was very susceptible to such an extent that he had his intrigues with ever so many other women, with all doubtless who chanced to come in his way, she sent word to him that she was being betrayed by her friends and asked that she be allowed to plead her case in person. 
She asked, therefore, for admission to his presence, and on obtaining permission adorned and beautified herself so as to appear before him in the most majestic and at the same time pity-inspiring guise. Afterward, he entered an assembly of theirs, and producing Ptolemy and Cleopatra, read their father's will, in which it was directed that they should live together according to the custom of the Egyptians and rule in common, and that the Roman people should exercise a guardianship over them. The peace did not last very long, and Caesar had to demonstrate his martial abilities to the supporters of Ptolemy XIII in short order. According to Caesar's own account, his men took the Pharos Island, where the lighthouse of Alexandria was located, as it was crucial for taking and holding Alexandria. Referring to himself in the third person, Caesar wrote, On the island there is a tower called Pharos, of great height, a work of wonderful construction, which took its name from the island. This island, lying over against Alexandria, makes a harbor, but it is connected with the town by a narrow roadway like a bridge, piers 900 feet in length, having been thrown out seawards by former kings. On this island, there are dwelling houses of Egyptians, and a settlement the size of a town, and any ships that went a little out of their course there through carelessness or rough weather, they were in the habit of plundering like pirates. Moreover, on account of the narrowness of the passage, there can be no entry for ships into the harbor without the consent of those who are in occupation of Pharaohs. Caesar, now fearing such difficulty, landed his troops when the enemy was occupied in fighting, and seized Pharaohs and placed a garrison on it. The result of these measures was that corn and reinforcements could be safely conveyed to him on shipboard. After Caesar had won the Egyptian civil war for Cleopatra, he demonstrated his diplomatic abilities by bringing the two factions back together. Since Ptolemy XIII had died in his attempted escape from Caesar's clutches, the Roman general ordered that Cleopatra marry her other brother in a very Ptolemaic-style wedding. Cassius Dio explained, In this way, Caesar overcame Egypt. He did not, however, make it subject to the Romans, but bestowed it upon Cleopatra, for whose sake he had waged the conflict. Yet, being afraid that the Egyptians might rebel again, because they were delivered over to a woman to rule, and that the Romans might be angry, both on this account and because he was living with the woman, he commanded her to marry her other brother, and gave the kingdom to both to them, at least nominally. For in reality, Cleopatra was to hold all the power alone, since her husband was still a boy, and in view of Caesar's favor there was nothing that she could not do. Hence her living with her brother and sharing the rule with him was a mere pretense which she accepted, whereas in truth she ruled alone and spent her time in Caesar's company. After assuring the situation in Alexandria was stable once more, Caesar returned to Rome, where he was proclaimed dictator for life. He did, however, leave Cleopatra with more than one gift. Cleopatra gave birth to Caesar's son, whom she named Ptolemy Caesar, on July 23, 47 BC. She then traveled to Rome with her son three years later and was in the Eternal City when Caesar was assassinated by the Senate on March 15, 44 BC, the Ides of March. The assassination sparked a new round in the civil wars, pitting the Senate against the second triumvirate of Octavian, Mark Antony, and Lepidus. Once the triumvirate won the war, Cleopatra sided with them and developed a close personal relationship with Mark Antony. As per the agreement between Antony, Octavian, and Lepidus, Antony was given control of Rome's eastern provinces, which included Egypt, although it was still nominally independent. In 37 BC, Antony and Cleopatra began their infamous affair, which saw the Roman general adopt more and more Hellenistic and Egyptian styles and nomenclature, much to his reputation's detriment back in Rome. As Antony and Cleopatra struggled with unrest in the East, back in Rome Octavian had dismissed Lepidus, the third member of the Second Triumvirate, and assumed sole power over his domains while also continuing a vigorous smear campaign against Antony. Octavian denounced him for abandoning his wife Octavia and his children, and he accused Antony of going native with his wanton Egyptian queen. 
Octavian's public relations offensive blamed Antony's recent failure and the consequent loss of Roman life on the wrath of the gods for Antony's sins. Antony and Cleopatra, however, seem to have been unconcerned with Octavian's threats or the growing popular resentment with Antony that Octavian was fomenting in Rome. It seems quite likely that Antony simply did not care anymore and just wanted to be left alone in his Alexandrian idol with the woman he loved. Like Caesar, Antony was fully charmed by the quixotic and exotic Egyptian lifestyle, and he immersed himself in it even more than his famous mentor. Despite repeated demands from Octavian that he return to Rome immediately to answer for his conduct, Antony remained happily in Alexandria and instead waged a new campaign against the Armenians in 34 BC, this time achieving success and annexing the territory to his and Cleopatra's domains. It was in the aftermath of this war that Cleopatra and Antony finally overstepped their mark. Cleopatra organized a lavish Roman-style triumph in Alexandria to mark Antony's successful conquest, during which Antony's children by Cleopatra, now numbering three, were all granted royal titles in the East, Cleopatra herself was named Queen of Queens and Ruler of the East, and crucially, Cleopatra's son Caesarion was named King of Kings, Ruler of Egypt and the East, Living God, and above all, Caesar's formal sole son and heir. By default, that title would have disowned Octavian in the eyes of the East. Additionally, Antony officially declared his alliance with Octavian over, proclaiming that from then on the East was free and independent of Rome. It was the biggest blunder of their lives. In 32 BC, Octavian declared war against Cleopatra, not Antony, a calculated move intended to ensure the Romans did not feel he was continuing the legacy of the fratricidal civil war. Perhaps Octavian overestimated his support, for Cleopatra and Antony were delighted to discover that both consuls and a full third of the Senate decamped from Rome and defected to their side wholesale. The royal couple met the defectors in Greece, and for a while felt so secure in their position, they even considered an invasion of Italy itself. Their victory was to prove short-lived, however. In 31 BC, Octavian's forces set sail for Greece, and the legions there immediately went over to his side, spurred by the veterans in their ranks who had once fought for his adoptive father Caesar. Both Cyrenaica and Greece fell to Octavian, essentially without a blow struck, and Cleopatra and Antony were forced to retreat back to Egypt, where they rallied the eastern navies and prepared to contest Octavian's passage across the Mediterranean. On September 2nd, 31 BC, Antony and Cleopatra found themselves in a tactically disadvantageous position, facing Octavian's navies off the coast of Actium in Greece. With the risk of being bottled up and surrounded at Actium by Octavian's naval forces a very real possibility, Cleopatra advised Antony to give battle, although it appears the Roman general thought victory was an unlikely possibility. Antony and Cleopatra appeared to the untrained eye to have the advantage. Their fleet numbered over 500 vessels, almost half of which were giant, five-decked quinquiremes, ramming warships that carried full-blown siege engines on board, while Octavian had only 250 far lighter craft. However, the sea was rough that morning, favoring Octavian's more maneuverable ships, which were less affected by the rolling swells, and to make matters worse, Antony's fleet had been racked by disease meaning that many of his mighty quinquiremes were undermanned. The giant craft were ponderous to begin with, but without the requisite number of rowers and fighting men, they could never hope to achieve proper ramming speed. Octavian's lighter, more agile craft, filled with veteran sailors, were able to dance around the ponderous quinquiremes, showering them with hails of fire arrows, ramming and boarding where they could, and sprinting away before the heavier craft had a chance to bring their rams to bear. As the day wore on, it became more and more apparent to Antony and Cleopatra on their twin flagships that the battle would be lost. More and more of their craft were being sunk, scattered or overwhelmed, and still more were burning down to the waterline, their skeleton crews being insufficient to man their battle stations and extinguish fires at the same time. 
As night approached, Antony and Cleopatra spotted a gap in the now thoroughly jumbled enemy line and ordered their ships to speed through it without delay, making for Alexandria with all speed and abandoning their entire navy to its fate. It was a crushing blow, as Octavian and his generals had virtually annihilated Egypt's seaborne power. As one of Rome's most famous battles and one of the most famous events in Cleopatra's life, the Battle of Actium has taken on a life of its own in popular memory. One of the longest-held myths about the battle is that Cleopatra, sensing defeat, began to sail away from the fight in the middle of the day, and the love-struck Antony followed her with his own ship, abandoning his men in the middle of the fight. While that popular myth would be in keeping with explaining Cleopatra's irresistible charm and magnetism, contemporary accounts of the battle do not suggest it was actually the case. Once the Battle of Actium was over, Antony and Cleopatra were forced to flee back to Egypt. Cassius Dio wrote, At the time he sent a part of the fleet in pursuit of Antony and Cleopatra. These ships, accordingly, followed after the fugitives, but when it became clear that they were not going to overtake them, they returned. With his remaining vessels, he captured the enemy's entrenchments, meeting with no opposition because of their small numbers, and then overtook and without a battle won over the rest of the army, which was retreating to Macedonia. Now it was just a matter of time before Octavian caught up with Antony and Cleopatra. Antony attempted to enlist the help of some of his former allies in North Africa who had rebuffed his advances before concentrating his energies on the defense of Alexandria. Cassius Dio explained, Now, among the other preparations they made for speedy warfare, they enrolled among the youths of military age, Cleopatra, her son Caesarion, and Antony and his son Antillus, who had been born to him by Fulvia and was then with him. Their purpose was to arouse the enthusiasm of the Egyptians, who would feel that they had at last a man for their king, and to cause the rest to continue the struggle with these boys as their leaders, in case anything untoward should happen to the parents. While preparations for the defense of Alexandria were being made by Antony, Cleopatra once more demonstrated how she had reached the pinnacle of Ptolemaic power by sending overtures to Octavian behind Antony's back. Cassius Dio wrote, Meanwhile, Cleopatra, on her part, unknown to Antony, sent to him a golden scepter and a golden crown together with the royal throne, signifying that through them she offered him the kingdom as well. For she hoped that even if he did hate Antony, he would yet take pity on her at least. Caesar accepted her gifts as a good omen, but made no answer to Antony. To Cleopatra, however, Although he publicly sent threatening messages, including the announcement that if she would give up her armed forces and renounce her sovereignty, he would consider what ought to be done in her case, he secretly sent word that if she would kill Antony, he would grant her pardon and leave her realm inviolate. The end was near for the lovers, but the classical sources disputed the details of their legendary deaths. Of all the fictionalized portrayals of Cleopatra's rise and fall, Perhaps the most memorable scenes involve her and Antony's deaths. Once again, Cassius Dio provided the most detailed account of the events. According to him, after Antony had lost a pivotal battle to Octavian near the Egyptian delta city of Pelusium, Antony attempted to flee, but he was tricked by Cleopatra into believing that she was dead, the purpose being that she would subsequently conclude a peace deal with Octavian. After his unexpected setback, Antony took refuge in his fleet and was preparing to give battle on the sea or at any rate to sail to Spain. But Cleopatra, upon perceiving this, caused the ships to desert, and she herself rushed suddenly into the mausoleum, pretending that she feared Caesar and desired by some means or other to forestall him by taking her own life, but really as an invitation to Antony to enter there also. He had a suspicion, to be sure, that he was being betrayed, Yet in his infatuation he could not believe it, but actually pitied her more, one might say, than himself. Cleopatra, doubtless, was fully aware of this, and hoped that if he should be informed that she was dead, he would not wish to survive her, but would die at once. He first asked one of the bystanders to slay him, but when the man drew his sword and slew himself, 
Antony wished to imitate his courage, and so gave himself a wound and fell upon his face, causing the bystanders to believe that he was dead. Now, when some of them saw her peering out at this point, they raised a shout so that even Antony heard. So he, learning that she survived, stood up, as if he had still the power to live. But as he had lost much blood, he despaired of his life and besought the bystanders to carry him to the monument and to hoist him up by the ropes that were hanging there to life the stone blocks. Cleopatra then tried to save her own life, and possibly her position as regent of Egypt, by negotiating with Octavian, but the future emperor wanted to bring her back alive to Rome, where he would presumably parade her through the streets during his triumph and then ritually strangle her. Once Cleopatra realized the ramifications of Octavian's plans for her, she reportedly made the decision to commit suicide. The manner of Cleopatra's death has been debated for millennia, shaped in popular memory by everyone from Shakespeare to Hollywood. Ancient historians wrote that she had a venomous snake, most likely a cobra, concealed in her private apartments, and that when she realized that escape was impossible, she provoked it into administering a fatal bite on her arm. Today, most people unfamiliar with those accounts believe that Cleopatra had an asp bite her on the breast, which was how Shakespeare depicted it in his famous play. Stories differ as to what snake was used. The term asp is most likely a generic name for any venomous snake, but Egypt is renowned for its deadly king cobra, and if it was kept deliberately or came to be there by accident. Some historians even argue that there was no snake at all, and that Cleopatra poisoned herself with hemlock, as Socrates had done. Still others claim Octavian had her killed, which seems contrary to the widely assumed belief that Octavian intended to parade her as a captive through the streets of Rome in a triumph. Although people are now familiar with the venomous snakebite version, Cassius Dio was adamant the method of death she had chosen for herself is unknown. But when she could accomplish nothing, she feigned a change of heart, pretending to set great hopes in him and also in Livia. She said she would sail of her own free will, and she made ready some treasured articles of adornment to use as gifts, in the hope that by these means she might inspire belief that it was not her purpose to die, and so might be less closely guarded and thus be able to destroy herself. She put on her most beautiful apparel, arranged her body in most seemingly fashion, took in her hands all the emblems of royalty, and so died. No one knows clearly in what way she perished, for the only marks on her body were slight pricks on the arm. Although that account of Cleopatra's death is probably the most detailed, Strabo, who was a contemporary of Cleopatra's, declared it had been an asp that had killed the queen. Having passed through the Hippodrome, one comes to Nicopolis, which has a settlement on the sea no smaller than a city. It is thirty stadia distant from Alexandria. Augustus Caesar honored this place because it was here that the conquered in battle those who came out against him with Antony. And when he had taken the city at the first onset, he forced Antony to put himself to death, and Cleopatra came into his power alive. But a little later she too put herself to death secretly, while in prison, by the bite of an asp, or, for two accounts are given, by applying a poisonous ointment. And the result was that the empire of the sons of Lagos, which had endured for many years, was dissolved. Though in the grand scheme of things it does not particularly matter how Cleopatra died, Egyptologists and snake experts from the University of Manchester say that this version of her death is impossible. They argue that a snake big enough to kill Cleopatra would be too big to hide in a basket of figs. A nearly eight-foot-long snake, which is how long an Egyptian cobra can grow, cannot be hidden this way, and even if it could, the bite of that snake could not instantly kill Cleopatra and her maids. A lot of snake bites are so-called dry bites that do not contain poison, and using one snake to kill two or three people consecutively was not possible. Snakes use venom for self-defense and hunting, so they store it and use it when needed. Plutarch also noted that information about Cleopatra's death is contradictory. Someone claimed to have seen a snake's mark under the window, and someone spoke of bite marks on the queen's hand. Others wrote that no stain appeared on the body, 
nor were any signs of poisoning found, and Cleopatra hid the poison in a hollow hairpin that was constantly in her hair. Regardless of how it happened, Cleopatra's death marked the end of Egyptian independence. Egypt became a province of Rome, but that did not necessarily mean the Ptolemaic dynasty was finished. Although Octavian was never known as a military genius, he was adept in many other respects, especially when it concerned the art of politics and the ability to see things in the long term. Octavian knew that even with Cleopatra dead, her children, especially Caesarian, might claim the throne of Egypt, and Octavian could not let that happen. Cassius Dio explained, Such were these two, and such was their end. Of their children, Antillus was slain immediately, though he was betrothed to the daughter of Caesar and had taken refuge in his father's shrine, which Cleopatra had built, and Caesarian, while fleeing to Ethiopia, was overtaken on the road and murdered. For that reason, historians also cannot discount the notion that Cleopatra was murdered. A couple of years ago, Egyptian archaeologists announced that they may have found the tomb of Cleopatra and Antony. According to scientists, about 30 miles from Alexandria, under the ruins of the Temple of Osiris, they discovered a nearly 400-foot tunnel filled with sand. After cleaning, scientists found what they claimed was the death mask of Antony, a statue of Cleopatra, and 20 coins minted in Egypt during her reign. The Great Fire of Rome In early 64 AD, Rome's Emperor Nero expanded his theatrical and musical career by beginning to give public performances, inadvertently demeaning himself in the eyes of his subjects and the Senate. Those in the know were more than a little concerned when the very theater in which he had given his first public performance was destroyed by a terrible earthquake. Rumors and criticisms flew around the city, and some of them no doubt reached Nero's ears. By the end of that year, Romans would be wondering whether the criticisms were severe enough to drive the emperor to burn down the heart of the Roman Empire. Others would wonder whether it was just a fire that got out of control and couldn't be stopped. Was Nero anxious to clear away buildings that stood between him and his dream of a palatial neighborhood all his own? Were angry mobsters behind the conflagration that wiped out so much of the city? The only thing known for sure is there's no clear answer. The Roman historian Tacitus, who witnessed the fire as a nine-year-old boy, was unable to determine how it started, but he described important details. A disaster followed, whether accidental or treacherously contrived by the emperor, is uncertain, as authors have given both accounts, worse, however, and more dreadful than any which have ever happened to this city by the violence of fire. It had its beginning in that part of the circus which adjoins the Palatine and Caelian Hills, where, amid the shops containing inflammable wares, the conflagration both broke out and instantly became so fierce and so rapid from the wind that it seized in its grasp the entire length of the circus. Suetonius was more biased and blamed Nero personally for the tragedy, but he was writing more than a hundred years later and was thus a secondary source. While Suetonius did refer to some written documents, he also had an ear for scandal, so his account comes across as melodramatic. But Nero showed no greater mercy towards the citizens, or even the walls of Rome herself. When in the course of conversation someone quoted the line, When I am dead, let fire consume the earth, he commented. No, it should rather be, while I yet live, and acted accordingly, since he had the city set on fire, pretending to be displeased by its ugly old buildings and narrow, winding streets, and had it done so openly that several ex-consuls dared not lay hands on his agents, though they caught them in situ equipped with blazing torches and tar. Various granaries which occupied desirable sites near the Golden House were partly demolished by siege engines first, as they were built in stone and then set ablaze. Cassius Dio blamed Nero and even put forth an ancient conspiracy theory. After this, Nero set his heart on accomplishing what had doubtless always been his desire, namely to make an end of the whole city and realm during his lifetime. At all events, 
He, like others before him, used to call Priam wonderfully fortunate in that he had seen his country and his throne destroyed together. Accordingly, he secretly sent out men who pretended to be drunk or engaged in other kinds of mischief, and caused them at first to set fire to one or two or even several buildings in different parts of the city, so that people were at their wits' end, not being able to find any beginning of the trouble, nor to put an end to it, though they constantly were aware of many strange sights and sounds. For there was not to be seen but many fires, as in a camp, and not to be heard from the talk of the people except such exclamations as, This or that is a fire. Where? How did it happen? Who kindled it? Help! Over the years, there have been a number of theories postulated about how the fire began. While Suetonius and Cassius Dio believed that Nero ordered it set, more objective individuals believed that it broke out by accident. They pointed to the fact that June 19th, the day the fire began, was both a hot and dry day, as well as a busy one. Most of the city's slaves, many of whom typically oversaw the care of households, including tending cooking fires, were busy at the circus to prepare the stadium for the beginning of Rome's summer games. That meant the homes in the city were left in the charge of women and those too young or too old to help with the back-breaking work. Did some child fail to keep an eye on a baking fire and let it get out of control? Were the old men in that home unable to put it out? Perhaps, but in the context of imperial power, no one would likely have admitted it. Indeed, there were a lot of fires burning that day, especially near the Circus Maximus. Just like modern-day food vendors, those selling food to hungry crowds attending the games spent much of the night before cooking. It seems just as likely as anything else that one of their fires got out of hand and started the conflagration, and given how crowded the area was, it would have been difficult for help to arrive in putting out the flames. However it started, the fire rapidly spread by moving along the rafters of the shops and subsequently igniting the roofs and the wares. Tacitus wrote, For here there were no houses fenced in by solid masonry, or temples surrounded by walls, or any other obstacle to interpose delay. The blaze in its fury ran first through the level portions of the city, then rising to the hills, while it again devastated every place below them, it outstripped all preventive measures. So rapid was the mischief and so completely at its mercy, the city, with those narrow, winding passages and irregular streets which characterized old Rome. Added to this were the wailings of terror-stricken women, the feebleness of age, the helpless inexperience of childhood, the crowds who sought to save themselves or others, dragging out the infirm or waiting for them and by their hurry in the one case, by their delay in the other, aggravating the confusion. Anyone who has ever tried to put out a big blaze knows that fires burn upwards, and that was certainly the case with this fire. Before long, the wooden stands of the Circus Maximus were ablaze, and as the wind blew up from the north, the fire spread throughout the stadium. While the sight of the Circus Maximus must have inspired awe in those who witnessed it, Few people were in any sort of position to appreciate the magnitude of what they were seeing since the primary concern was escaping. Many people lived in or near the shops housed by the circus and were trying to grab what few belongings they could carry away before the flames reached them. Tacitus described the commotion. Often, while they looked behind them, they were intercepted by flames on their side or in their face. Or if they reached a refuge close at hand, when this too was seized by the fire, they found that even places which they had imagined to be remote were involved in the same calamity. At last, doubting what they should avoid or whither betake themselves, they crowded the streets or flung themselves down in the fields, while some who had lost their all, even their very daily bread, and others out of love for their kinsfolk whom they had been unable to rescue perished, though escape was open to them. And no one dared to stop the mischief, because of incessant menaces from a number of persons who forbade the extinguishing of the flames, because again others openly hurled brands and kept shouting that there was one who gave them authority, either seeking to plunder more freely or obeying orders. Just outside the circus, 
Maximus lay more houses, but these small buildings were ancient versions of the types of tenements that are easily consumed in fires. Their windows were covered by fabric wraps or wooden shutters that fed the fire rather than hinder it. The fire rages swiftly through them, burning through roofs and rafters and growing even stronger. Naturally, the bigger the fire got, the faster and more powerfully it spread, and within a few hours it had jumped the ancient Servian wall and expanded into the suburbs around the city. By this time, words of alarm had been shouted across the countryside, but people began to run toward the city to help instead of away from it. At first, the men fighting the blaze drew buckets of water from wells in the hopes of putting out the spreading fire, but this quickly proved to be worse than useless because it just added to the confusion in the streets without really accomplishing anything. As people continued to fight the growing fire in vain, the word went out ordering people to remove anything flammable from their home's doors, windows, and yards. Some also suggested trying to break down the houses in the path of the fire with battering rams with the intention of creating a sort of fire break that would starve the fire of fuel and kill it. However, the battering rams were heavy and wieldy and could not be used in close quarters, so the fire raged on, as did the panic. Cassius Dio later wrote, Extraordinary excitement laid hold on all the citizens in all parts of the city, and they ran about, some in one direction and some in another, as if distracted. Here, men while assisting their neighbors would learn that their own premises were afire. There others, before twenty reached them that their own houses had caught fire, would be told that they were destroyed. Those who were inside their houses would run out into the narrow streets thinking that they could save them from the outside, while people in the streets would rush into the dwellings in the hope of accomplishing something inside. There was shouting and wailing without end of children, women, men, and the aged all together, so that no one could see or understand what was said by reason of the smoke and the shouting. And for this reason, some might be seen standing speechless, as if they were dumb. As it became clear that the flames would not be put out and that the entire city was in danger, people began to ask where the emperor was, and the fact that Nero was nowhere to be seen in a time of crisis sparked rumors about his culpability in the fire, especially given how fast this particular blaze was spreading. In fact, Nero was in Antium, his hometown, participating in a singing competition. And not surprisingly, when this became common knowledge, it did nothing to endear the emperor to his people. The fire was still spreading as the sun came up on June 20th, and what should have been a day of celebration quickly became one of desperation as Titus Flavius Sabinus, a former consul and brother of future emperor Vespasian, tried to bring some sort of order to the firefighters' work. He brought with him 3,000 soldiers, members of the city cohorts, to replace those who had fought all night, and his main challenge was to prevent the fire from burning any further up the Palatine and Kaleen Hills. One of Sabinus's first orders was to several of his best riders, whom he dispatched to tell Nero about the fire. The message reached Nero at about noon on the 20th, but the emperor, basking in the glow of winning the previous night's obviously fixed competition, decided to remain where he was and continue on to the next round. While it is easy in hindsight to condemn him for this, and many certainly did, fires were relatively common in ancient Rome, so he may not have appreciated the magnitude of what was going on. By the time the riders returned to the city, Sabinus was obviously losing his battle with the flames. He ordered new horsemen to ride back to Nero and tell him that the three southernmost of Rome's seven hills, Palatine, Caline, and Aventine, were now engulfed, and that the fire was threatening Esquiline to the northeast, where the emperor's own palace was located. This message had the desired effect, and Nero returned to the city in haste. Nero sent orders ahead telling Sabinus to focus all his efforts on protecting the emperor's palace, but as Tacitus later noted, these efforts were useless. Nero at this time was at Antium, and did not return to Rome until the fire approached his house, which he had built to connect the palace with the gardens of Messinus. It could not, however, be stopped from devouring the palace, the house, and everything around it. 
Nero landed downstream from the fire, which he had been watching burn since he reached the Tiber River on June 21st, and he immediately went to be briefed by Sabinus, who had nothing but bad news for him. Sabinus informed the emperor that the fire had continued to burn out of control and that Nero's palace, the Domus Transitoria, was lost. Topping Esquiline Hill, which was not yet burning, Nero was able to view the damage the fire was doing. All around him, the palaces of his predecessors were either in flames or ashes, and while his advisors tried to comfort him with stories of all the items that had been saved from these palaces, including many books and pieces of artwork, it was small consolation. Unable to save his own palace, Nero decided to turn his attention to the people, though whether this was out of a sense of charity or political expedience is unclear. Either way, Tacitus documented the skepticism and hostility that Nero was already facing. However, to relieve the people, driven out homeless as they were, he threw open to them the Campus Martius and the public buildings of Agrippa, and even his own gardens, and raised temporary structures to receive the destitute multitude. Supplies of food were brought up from Ostia and the neighboring towns, and the price of corn was reduced to three sesterces a peck. These acts, though popular, produced no effect, since a rumor had gone forth everywhere that, at the very time when the city was in flames, the emperor appeared on a private stage and sang of the destruction of Troy, comparing present misfortunes with the calamities of antiquity. Unfortunately for Nero, he was already so unpopular in Rome by this time that no amount of charity on his part would compel ordinary Romans to think more kindly of him. While most were able to survive the blaze thanks to the efforts of many in spreading warnings throughout the city, countless numbers had also lost everything they owned. On top of that shock, people were understandably upset that the fire continued to rage on, making the city's leaders look hapless. Indeed, the great fire of Rome would burn at full force for over five days, and the only way to stop it was by intentionally destroying buildings to create a firebreak. Then, even after it seemed that the fire was out, a strong wind reignited it, and the fire continued to burn across the city. Cassius Dio explained, Now this did not all take place on a single day, but it lasted for several days and nights alike. Many houses were destroyed for want of anyone to help save them, and many others were set on fire by the same men who came to lend assistance. For the soldiers, including the night watch, having an eye to plunder, instead of putting out fires, kindled new ones. While such scenes were occurring at various points, a wind caught up the flames and carried them indiscriminately against all the buildings that were left. Consequently, no one concerned himself any longer about goods or houses, but all the survivors, standing where they thought they were safe, gazed upon what appeared to be a number of scattered islands on fire or many cities all burning at the same time. There was no longer any grieving over personal losses, but they lamented the public calamity, recalling how once before most of the city had been thus laid waste by the Gauls. Tacitus described the incredible extent of the damage. At last, after five days, an end was put to the conflagration at the foot of the Esquiline Hill by the destruction of all buildings on a vast space so that the violence of the fire was met by clear ground and an open sky. But before people had laid aside their fears, the flames returned, with no less fury this second time, and especially in the spacious districts of the city. Consequently, though there was less loss of life, the temples of the gods, and the porticos which were devoted to enjoyment, fell in a yet more widespread ruin, and to this conflagration there attached the greater infamy because it broke out on the Emilian property of Tigellinus, and it seemed that Nero was aiming at the glory of founding a new city and calling it by his name. Rome, indeed, is divided into fourteen districts, four of which remained uninjured, three were leveled to the ground, while in the other seven were left only a few shattered, half-burnt relics of houses. The notion that Nero hoped to rebuild a new city over the ruins of Rome was just one of many rumors that spread about Rome's notorious emperor. Others would soon follow, and one would become so popular that subsequent generations came to accept it as fact. Suetonius wrote, 
The conflagration lasted seven nights and the intervening days, driving people to take refuge in hollow monuments and tombs. Not only a vast number of tenement blocks, but mansions built by generals of former times and still decorated with their victory trophies were damaged, as well as temples vowed and dedicated by the kings or later leaders during the Punic and Gallic Wars. In fact, every ancient building of note still extant. Nero watched the destruction from the Tower of Mycenaeus, and elated by what he called the beauty of the flames, he donned his tragedian's costume and sang a composition called The Fall of Troy from Beginning to End. That last remark has never been substantiated and is almost certainly untrue, but the rumor became pervasive, and it passed down over the centuries until people widely believed that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Before the smoke had even cleared, people began to emerge from their shelters and returned to their homes, or at least to where their homes had once been. Rummaging through the debris, they gathered together those items that were still usable, but there was not much left. According to Cassius Dio, the calamity which the city then experienced has no parallel before or since, except in the Gallic invasion. The whole Palatine Hill, the theater of Taurus, and nearly two-thirds of the remainder of the city were burned, and countless persons perished. There was no curse that the populace did not invoke upon Nero, though they did not mention his name, but simply cursed in general terms those who had set the city on fire. And they were disturbed above all by recalling the oracle which once in the time of Tiberius had been on everybody's lips. It ran thus, Thrice three hundred years having run their course of fulfillment, Rome by the strife of her people shall perish. And when Nero, by way of encouraging them, reported that these verses could not be found anywhere, they dropped them and proceeded to repeat another oracle, which they averred to be a genuine Sibylline prophecy, namely, Last of the sons of Aeneas, a mother slayer shall govern. And so it proved— whether this verse was actually spoken beforehand by some divine prophecy, or the populace was now for the first time inspired in view of the present situation to utter it. For Nero was indeed the last emperor of the Julian line, the line descended from Aeneas. There would never be any way for those living at the time to tally what they had lost, much less for modern historians. But Tacitus did record this much. It would not be easy to enter into a computation of the private mansions, the blocks of tenements, and of the temples which were lost. Those with the oldest ceremonial, as that dedicated by Servius Tullius to Luna, the great altar and shrine raised by the Arcadian Evander to the visibly appearing Hercules, the temple of Jupiter the Stayer, which was vowed by Romulus, Numa's royal palace, and the sanctuary of Vesta, with the tutelary deities of the Roman people, were burnt. So too were the riches acquired by our many victories, various beauties of Greek art, then again the ancient and genuine historical monuments of men of genius, and, notwithstanding the striking splendor of the restored city, old men will remember many things which could not be replaced. As damaging as the destruction to private property was, the public damage was on an almost unimaginable scale. The Roman Empire was still near its apex in the late 1st century AD, yet of the 14 neighborhoods in Rome itself, only four had escaped the fire. Thus, it goes without saying that the aftermath of the fire must have been a sight to behold. Much of Rome was a scorched and smoking ruin, and Nero had to respond in all kinds of ways to placate the people. He had already offered physical aid to those who had suffered by allowing them to set up camps on his own property and encouraging the use of public lands for shelter and survival. Nero was also faced with the unenviable task of trying to finance a rebuilding effort, despite the fact he had already drained much of the empire's money. Part of his economic policy included the transportation of rubble from the blaze to nearby Ostia, where it was poured into the marshes both to get rid of it and to drain them of water, creating what eventually would become fertile farmland. Nero also ordered the reconstruction of the areas affected by the fire, this time having modern, evenly spaced and comfortable residences erected under his own supervision. He presumably employed many of those whose livelihoods were destroyed by the flames as well. 
Tacitus described these efforts. Of Rome, meanwhile, so much as was left unoccupied by his mansion was not built up, as it had been after its burning by the Gauls, without any regularity or in any fashion, but with rows of streets according to measurement, with broad thoroughfares, with a restriction on the height of houses, with open spaces, and the further addition of colonnades, as a protection to the frontage of the blocks of tenements. These colonnades Nero promised to erect at his own expense and to hand over the open spaces when cleared of the debris to the ground landlords. He also offered rewards proportioned to each person's position and property and prescribed a period within which they were to obtain them on the completion of so many houses or blocks of building. He fixed on the marshes of Ostia for the reception of the rubbish and arranged that the ships which had brought up corn by the Tiber should sail down the river with cargoes of this rubbish. Naturally, skeptical Romans didn't believe his intentions were sincere, a sentiment captured by Tacitus. That same year, Rome suffered from a terrible fire, and part of the circus near the Aventine Hill was burnt, as well as the Aventine Quarter itself. This calamity the emperor turned to his own glory by paying the values of the houses and blocks of tenements. A hundred million of sesterces was expended in this munificence, a boon all the more acceptable to the populace, as Tiberius was rather sparing in building at his private expense. He raised only two structures even at the public cost, the Temple of Augustus and the stage of Pompey's Theater, and when these were completed, he did not dedicate them, either out of contempt for popularity or from his extreme age. Four commissioners, all husbands of the emperor's granddaughters, Cnaeus Domitius, Cassius Longinus, Marcus Vinicius, Rubelius Blandus, were appointed to assess the damage in each case, and Publius Petronius was added to their number on the nomination of the consuls. Various honors were devised and decreed to the emperor such as each man's ingenuity suggested. It is a question which of these he rejected or accepted as the end of his life was so near. While Romans were unsure of Nero's intentions with the public reconstruction, there was no doubt what motivated the construction of a new palace for the emperor. Much of the land that had been cleared by the fire was converted into his sprawling Domus Aurea, Golden House, a massive palatial complex which extended between 100 and 300 acres and also included a nearly 100-foot-tall statue of Nero himself, known as the Colossus. The Domus Aurea may very well have been a building project that cost more than the remaining reconstruction efforts by itself, and to finance it, Nero was forced to devalue the Roman currency, something that had never occurred in the history of the Roman Empire. The silver denarius and the gold aureus were both reduced in weight, and the purity of the precious metals they contained was also dropped by a significant amount. The disdain in ancient historians' descriptions of the Domus Aurea is apparent. Tacitus wrote, Nero meanwhile availed himself of his country's desolation and erected a mansion in which the jewels and gold, long familiar objects, quite vulgarized by our extravagance, were not so marvelous as the fields and lakes, with woods on one side to resemble a wilderness, and on the other, open spaces and extensive views. The directors and contrivers of the work were Severus and Seller, who had the genius and the audacity to attempt by art even what nature had refused, and to fool away an emperor's resources. They had actually undertaken to sink a navigable canal from the Lake Avernus to the mouths of the Tiber, along a barren shore, or through the face of hills, where one meets with no moisture which could supply water, except the Pomptine marshes. The rest of the country is broken rock and perfectly dry. Even if it could be cut through, the labor would be intolerable, and there would be no adequate result. Nero, however, with his love of the impossible, endeavored to dig through the nearest hills to Avernus, and there still remain the traces of his disappointed hope. Meanwhile, Suetonius was even less forgiving. Nero built a palace stretching from the Palatine to the Esquiline, which was at first called the Domus Transitoria, but after it had burnt in the fire it was restored, and was called the Domus Aurea. The following facts will serve to give some idea of its size and luxury. 
In its vestibulum, there was a colossal statue of Nero, 120 feet high, and so spacious was it that it had a portico a mile long. There was an artificial lake to represent the sea, and on its shores were buildings laid out as cities, and there were stretches of countryside, with fields and vineyards, pastures and woodlands, and among them were herds of domestic animals and all sorts of beasts. In other parts, it was overlaid with gold and jewels and mother of pearl. There were dining halls whose ivory ceilings were set with pipes to sprinkle the guests with flowers and perfume. The main dining hall was circular, and it revolved constantly day and night like the universe. There were also seawater baths and baths of sulfur water. When Nero moved in, he only deigned to remark at last, I can begin to live like a human being. Furthermore, no matter what steps he took, rumors continued to swirl that Nero had ordered the fire started, or that he was at least been unconcerned about the damage and danger. All of this led to major civil unrest across Rome, as Tacitus later noted. Sacred rites were profaned. There was profligacy in the highest ranks, the sea was crowded with exiles, and its rocks polluted with bloody deeds. In the capital, there were yet worse horrors. Nobility, wealth, the refusal or the acceptance of office were grounds for accusation, and virtue ensured destruction. The rewards of the informers were no less odious than their crimes. For while some seized on consulships and priestly offices as their share of the spoil, others on procuratorships and posts of more confidential authority, they robbed and ruined in every direction amid universal hatred and terror. Slaves were bribed to turn against their masters and freedmen to betray their patrons, and those who had not an enemy were destroyed by friends. One thing that was on many people's minds following the fire was the question of how the gods became so angry as to allow such a disaster, and how the gods could in turn be placated so that such a terrible thing would never befall the city again. Tacitus discussed some of the actions taken by Romans to appease their gods, noting, such indeed were the precautions of human wisdom. The next thing was to seek means of propitiating the gods, and recourse was had to the Sibylline books, by the direction of which prayers were offered to Vulcanus, Ceres, and Proserpina. Juno, too, was entreated by the matrons, first in the capital, then on the nearest part of the coast, whence water was procured to sprinkle the fane and image of the goddess. And there were sacred banquets and nightly vigils celebrated by married women. Since Nero was dealing with rumors that he was personally responsible for starting the fire, so it was probably inevitable that he sought to exonerate himself in the eyes of his people by blaming someone else. Conveniently, there was a perfect scapegoat on hand, Christians. The secretive sect, which still boasted only small numbers but was fast growing in popularity, was viewed with suspicion and even hatred by many across the Roman Empire, much the same way Jews were. The main reason for this disdain was simple. The other pagan polytheistic traditions which flourished side by side throughout the empire might advocate the superiority of their own particular gods, but unlike the Christians, they would not deny the existence of others. Christians believed that theirs was the only true God and were not afraid to say it. That made them quite unpopular, as did the fact that the Christian religion had very clearly sprung up out of Judaism and hailed from the same region as the Jews. Nero capitalized on the unpopularity of Christians by accusing them of being responsible for the blaze, though it does not appear as though any motive was ever ascribed to them. Several were seized and tortured, after which they confessed. It's actually unclear whether these people confessed to being Christians or to the arson itself, but most sources agreed that these people confessed as a result of torture. In any event, dozens of Christians were killed in response to the Great Fire, making them some of Christianity's first martyrs. The first institutionalized persecution of the Christians in the history of the Roman Empire had begun, and it would certainly not be the last. For most of history, Nero was believed to be responsible for killing hundreds of Christians in the cruelest ways possible, and even today, he is considered perhaps the worst persecutor of Christians among the Roman emperors. That said, the accusations against him have been questioned in recent years.
It's an indisputable fact that Nero had Christians killed, but scholars are unsure just how many Christian martyrs suffered under his reign. St. Paul and St. Peter wrote letters that sent greetings to certain Christians in Rome, and some scholars have asserted that since these letters contain only a few names, they are evidence that there were only a handful of Christians in Rome during the time of Nero. However, there are two problems with this theory. First, since Christianity was quickly expanding at the time, there would have been no way for Paul, Peter, or anyone else to keep up with the names of every Christian living in Rome. In fact, even if they had a list of names, they would not necessarily have sent greetings at each specific individual. Instead, they would likely have named those whom they knew most personally. Likewise, during a time of persecution when people's lives were threatened, they were not likely to make a long list of names in their letters lest the documents fall into the wrong hands. No matter how many Christians Nero actually put to death, the cruel ways in which he went about executing them were reason enough to make him notorious. Tacitus described the persecution, and in doing so, he became one of the earliest historians to make a historical reference to Jesus. But all human efforts, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the propitiations of the gods, did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration was the result of an order. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted, not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of all sorts was added to their deaths. Covered with the skins of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle and was exhibiting a show in the circus while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good but to glut one man's cruelty that they were being destroyed. As that account suggests, though most Romans were not Christians, the empire was known for a certain limited level of religious tolerance, even in the provinces they conquered. Thus, the idea that Nero was also burning otherwise loyal Roman citizen who just happened to be followers of a Jewish carpenter disturbed many in the city, even if they were distrustful of the religion itself. In a sense, it's ironic that Nero's attempt to scapegoat Christians and snuff out their religion in Rome only ensured that he would forever be tied to the history of Christianity. In fact, his legacy remains so intertwined with the persecution of Christians that he is perhaps more notorious for that than anything else. Nero committed suicide on June 9th, 68 AD, almost four years after the Great Fire, spelling the end of the Julio-Claudian line that originated with Augustus, and with that line extinguished, there was no accepted heir to the throne. What followed was the chaotic year of the four emperors, a vicious conflict in which Galba first took power, followed by Otho, closely followed by Vitellius, and then finally by Vespasian, who succeeded at last in restoring order. Though he was already popular, Vespasian wanted to impress upon the Roman people his power, worth, and beneficence as the first ruler of a new imperial dynasty. And to accomplish this, Vespasian and his sons wanted to discredit and distance themselves from the unpopular Nero. Vespasian did this in a number of ways, including rebuilding a temple of Jupiter and constructing a temple of peace, the latter of which was erected in order to celebrate his victory over the Jews in 71 AD.
This was an important triumph, not only because it added to his reputation as a successful general, but also because the spoils from this war filled the imperial coffers. As a result, when Vespasian spent money building monuments in Rome, it was not at the expense of the Roman people. However, Vespasian's greatest gift to the Roman people was an amphitheater that would become known as the Colosseum. Traditionally, amphitheaters were constructed on the edges of Roman cities, but the Colosseum was constructed where it presently stands within the heart of the city. Naturally, there was a reason why it was built where it was. Vespasian's choice to build an amphitheater at the location of the artificial lake of Nero's Domus Aurea was a carefully planned one. The artificial lake was on part of the land confiscated by Nero for his own private use after the Great Fire, so by choosing this spot, Vespasian was essentially returning the land back to the Roman people. Thus, the Colosseum would not only become an entertainment facility for the city of Rome, but also a political statement by the Flavian dynasty that distanced the new line from the wrongs Nero had committed. It is evident that the Roman people recognized Vespasian's intentions, as the Roman poet Marshall wrote, where the starry colossus sees the constellations at close range and lofty scaffolding rises in the middle of the road, once gleamed the odious halls of a cruel monarch, and in all Rome there stood a single house, where rises before our eyes the august pile of the amphitheater, was once Nero's lake, where we admire the warm baths of Titus, a speedy gift, a haughty tract of land had robbed the poor of their dwellings, where the Claudian colonnade unfolds its widespread shade was the outermost part of the palace's end. Rome has been restored to herself, and under your rule, Caesar, the pleasances that belonged to a master now belong to the people. Ironically, despite Vespasian's attempts to erase the memory of Nero by constructing an amphitheater for the people, the name of the Colosseum itself still has links to the notorious emperor and the great fire. In antiquity, Vespasian's amphitheater was more commonly referred to as the amphitheater, or the hunting theater. But by the Middle Ages, the amphitheater was referred to as the Colosseum. This was due at least in part to the sheer size of the structure, but another reason for this name was because of the Colossus, the colossal statue of Nero that stood nearby and had been originally placed in the vestibule of his Domus Aurea. It is believed that the colossal statue continued to stand near the amphitheater long after the Domus Aurea itself was removed, albeit with the face made to look less like Nero. And the base for the statue was located near the Colosseum until at least the 1930s, when Benito Mussolini had the area cleaned up in order to make a road. The exact date of the statue's removal remains uncertain, but either way, it's certainly ironic that the modern name of Vespasian's amphitheater actually refers in part to a statue of Nero, the man that Vespasian wanted the Roman people to forget when he ordered the construction of Rome's most famous monument, Rome and China. As the Roman Republic began expanding to the east in the wake of the Punic Wars, they came into conflict with various Asian kingdoms, most notably the Parthians, and when the Roman-Parthian Wars erupted, Armenia became entangled in the conflicts. In the year 60 BC, an internal power struggle in Rome ended with the formation of an alliance known as the First Triumvirate between Pompey the Great, Julius Caesar, and Marcus Crassus. The three leaders divided the Republic into spheres of influence, and Crassus, one of the richest men in history, was given the mandate to march east against Parthia. In the spring of 54 BC, a Roman army of 50,000 soldiers led by Crassus arrived in Assyria with the aim of defeating the Parthians, conquering Mesopotamia, the countries on the shores of the Persian Gulf, and ultimately reaching India. In this war, Crassus hoped to gain an advantage with the help of Armenia, whose cavalry had proven effective against the Parthians in previous battles. The Armenian king, Artavasdes II, promised to provide Crassus with 16,000 cavalry and 24,000 infantry, substantial military aid that could have ensured the Roman victory. However, 
The Armenian ruler also proposed that the campaign against the Parthians be organized through the southern territory of Armenia, where the mountainous terrain would hinder the mobility of the Parthian cavalry. This plan would have also conveniently allowed Artavasdes to protect Armenia from a possible Parthian invasion with the help of the Roman army. Crassus rejected this sensible proposal and instead chose the shorter but riskier route for the campaign through the bordering areas of Armenia. Cassius Dio explained that the Parthian forces advanced as a way to prevent the Armenians from sending reinforcements to the Romans, and as a result, Artavasdes could no longer send reinforcements to Crassus and informed the Romans of this. Crassus perceived this as a betrayal and threatened to punish the Armenians after defeating the Parthians, so in response, Artavasdes offered an alliance to the Parthian ruler Orodes II, who accepted it. The Armenian-Parthian Treaty was signed at the end of 54 BC in Artaxata, and the alliance was strengthened by the marriage of Artavasdes' sister and Parthian crown prince Pacorus. In the spring of 53 BC, Crassus began his campaign into Parthia, crossing the Euphrates and sticking to his tactics, but the Parthian army avoided direct confrontation in an all-out battle and continuously retreated while cutting off the Romans from their rear and supplies with small but effective attacks. The Roman soldiers were demoralized by the dry, steppe climate, unusual heat, and disease. The only correct course of action was an immediate retreat to their starting positions. Before they could make it, however, on May 6, 53 BC, a battle occurred near the city of Kare. In the fighting, the Parthian general, Suren, delivered a sudden and decisive blow to the Roman army. More than 20,000 Romans were killed, while over 10,000 were taken as prisoners. Crassus and his son were killed in battle, and it is said that the Parthians symbolically mocked Crassus's notorious greed after his death by pouring melted gold down his throat. According to Plutarch, Suren sent Crassus's head to the Parthian king Orodes II in Armenia, who was accompanied by other Parthian nobles at the time. After the feast in celebration of the marriage of the Armenian princess and the Parthian prince, the actors presented excerpts from the works of Greek authors to the audience. During the staging of Euripides's tragedy, The Baki, the actor Jason of Tralles appeared on stage with the severed head of Crassus and recited, we bring a deer from the top of the mountain, wounded by our glorious blows, and the audience cheered the spectacle. Nicholas Adonce, a famous Armenian historian, wrote, The invasion of Crassus was a tragedy, and that scene was its unique and logical conclusion. Following Crassus's defeat, Rome's position in the east was significantly weakened. The losses were so extensive that Rome was unable to retaliate against the Parthians. Furthermore, the Republic was undergoing an internal political crisis that relegated all urgent foreign policy matters to the background. Taking advantage of the opportunity, the Parthian forces, led by Crown Prince Pacorus, launched an attack that pushed the Romans out of Assyria, during which the Parthians received assistance from Armenian military units as well. Together, the Allied armies liberated Syria, Phoenicia, and Judea from Roman rule. After conquering Cilicia, the Parthians invaded the Roman provinces in Asia Minor, and Crassus's death had a profound effect on Roman history, paving the way for the two remaining triumvirs, Caesar and Pompey, to eventually engage in Rome's most notorious civil war years later. The results would directly bring about the end of the Roman Republic and usher in the imperial era. What is often overlooked is that ancient sources claimed a contingent of Romans managed to escape and return to their homeland while 10,000 other Romans were captured. Plutarch wrote that they were taken to Seleucia on the Tigris, where they were forced to participate in a triumphal parade, after which they were transferred to a city nearly 2,000 miles away. After this, the fate of the Roman prisoners is shrouded in mystery. According to the chronicles from the period of the Chinese Han Dynasty, in 36 BC, an army launched a campaign against the Xiongnu and threatened the commercial security of the Silk Road. 
During the attack on their capital, the Chinese forces noticed the presence of a contingent of several hundred soldiers who were defending one of the city gates arranged in a fish scale formation. The Chronicle also mentioned that a double wooden defensive palisade was erected outside the city. According to Professor Homer Hastened Flug Dubs, this description from Chinese chronicles seemed to refer to Roman soldiers, as he believed the fish scales referred to the testudo formation, while the double palisades represented their typical defensive tactics. Roman military tactics have been praised throughout the centuries, and those used by Julius Caesar, who described them in detail in his own writings, are still studied in military institutions throughout the world. One feature of Roman tactics known from these writings is the use of the testudo, a practice totally unique to the Romans, though partly based on the concept of the Greek phalanx. Units raised shields above their heads to protect themselves from enemy arrows or projectiles, and the tactic depended on each member protecting his comrades on either side, and thus relied on the discipline of the legionary and comprehensive training in how to maintain the tortoise formation. The Chinese source, known as History of the First Han Dynasty, mentioned a conflict between the Huns and the Chinese in Zhirzhi, identified as present-day Zhambal in Uzbekistan, in 36 BC. The Chinese general Chen Tong's description of the battle is the basis on which Homer Dubs built his theory. This source stated that the soldiers clashed with a unit numbering just over a hundred men, using a strange formation, which he described as a fish scale. A wooden palisade placed outside the ramparts was also a Roman practice at the time. Dubs dismissed the possibility that they were Hunnic soldiers, arguing that the nomadic armies of the time were barbaric, that cohesive and complicated military maneuvers and construction work were only possible after constant training, and that the double palisade was a Roman practice. In addition, the Huns were very similar to the Parthians in tactics. The troops were composed of archers and heavily equipped cavalry, while the heavy infantry consisted of mercenaries. The chronicles also report that the members of this detachment survived the capture of the city, and that because of the courage they demonstrated in battle, the Chinese decided to use them to defend their borders. For this reason, they were transferred to a settlement they named Lysian. This seems noteworthy because the Chinese called the Roman Empire Lycian. For years, residents of Lycian believed they were special. Many of the villagers have Western features, including green eyes and blonde hair, and experts claim that they are the descendants of the lost Roman legionaries who somehow made their way from the Parthian Empire to China. DNA tests have shown that a majority of the residents of the village of Lycian have Caucasian ancestry, which further strengthens the theory that this village may have been originally inhabited by Romans over 2,000 years ago. The Mystery of Genghis Khan's Tomb In a world fascinated by men like Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar, Genghis Khan is one of history's greatest and most famous conquerors. No man, before or since, has ever started with so little and gone on to achieve so much. From a noble family, but raised in poverty, that drove him to the brink of starvation, Genghis Khan rose to control the second largest empire the world has ever known, the largest being, arguably, the British Empire of the 18th and 19th centuries, and easily the largest empire conquered by a single man. And while many empires disintegrate upon the death of an emperor, like Alexander the Great's, Genghis Khan's empire endured and was actually enlarged by his successors, who went on to establish dynasties that in some cases lasted for centuries. Though history is usually written by the victors, the lack of a particularly strong writing tradition from the Mongols ensured that history was largely written by those who Genghis Khan vanquished. Because of this, Genghis Khan's portrayal in the West and the Middle East has been extraordinarily, and in many ways unfairly, negative for centuries, at least until recent revisions of the historical record. Certainly, Genghis Khan was not a peaceful man, 
nor a particularly merciful one, and he famously boasted to the Quaremzids that he was the flail of God come to punish you for your sins. However, the image of him as a bloodthirsty barbarian is largely the result of hostile propaganda. He was far more complex than the mere brute that his negative portrayals indicate, and though there is a slew of graves and depopulated regions to testify to the fact that he was not a gentleman, it would be simplistic and wrong to describe him merely as a madman bent on destruction for destruction's sake. In truth, he was an extremely intelligent and extraordinarily ambitious man, with a gift for warfare, empire-building, and administration, and he was a political visionary who dreamed of a united Asia under Mongol control. He was neither the vile mass murderer he is seen as in much of the Middle East, nor the shining, flawless hero he is often remembered, as in Mongolia and Western China. Nor should this fractured tribal background confirm one of the longest-lasting impressions that people have held about Genghis Khan and his Mongols, that of wild horse archers galloping out of the dawn to rape, pillage, murder, and enslave. The Mongol army was a highly sophisticated, minutely organized, and incredibly adaptive and innovative institution, as witnessed by the fact that it was successful in conquering enemies who employed completely different weaponry and different styles of fighting, from Chinese armored infantry to Middle Eastern camel cavalry, all the way to Western medieval knights and men-at-arms. Likewise, the infrastructure and administrative core which governed Genghis Khan's empire, though largely borrowed from the Chinese, was inventive, practical, and extraordinarily modern and efficient. This was no fly-by-night enterprise, but a sophisticated, complex, and extremely well-oiled machine. In the autumn of 1221, the Mongol army raided into what is now modern Georgia again, and though King George IV tried to contest their passage with an army of 60,000 men, he fell for Genghis Khan's old tactic of feigning retreat and then savaging his pursuers. George IV's army was completely destroyed, and he himself suffered a serious wound in the process. Much of Georgia was ravaged by the Mongols after George IV was defeated, after which part of the Mongolian forces marched across the Caucasus in the depths of winter, and though the harsh terrain claimed scores of lives and most of their siege train, it was successful. The Mongols then advanced into modern Russia, where they were met by a hastily assembled force, composed of various contingents from the principalities of Kiev and Rus, supported by what was left of the Cuman armies, anxious for revenge. The Russians were lured by Sabatai and Zeb, Mongol generals, into a nine-day pursuit that was the result of a feigned retreat, and once they were thoroughly disordered, the Mongols turned around and destroyed them. Their leader, Mstislav the Bold of Kiev, held out with the remnants of his army within his fortified camp for several days, but was eventually forced to surrender in return for safe conduct. In the end, however, Zeb and Sabatai ignored their promises and gave him an honorable, bloodless death by crushing him and his most prominent nobles under their feasting platform at a victory banquet. Twenty-five years later, a papal legate traveling through the countryside took note of the devastation wreaked by the Mongols. They attacked Rus, where they made great havoc, destroying cities and fortresses, and slaughtering men, and they laid siege to Kiev, the capital of Rus. After they had besieged the city for a long time, they took it and put the inhabitants to death. When we were journeying through the land, we came across countless skulls and bones of dead men lying about on the ground. Kiev had been a large and heavily populated town, but now, it has been reduced to almost nothing, for there are at the present time scarce two hundred houses there, and the inhabitants are kept in complete slavery. 
With Kiev and Rus now open to them, the Mongols plundered much of the surrounding regions before turning back east in 1223. They also, however, suffered a notable defeat at the hands of the Volga Bulgars, who sometime in 1223 managed to surprise either a Mongol detachment or the Mongol vanguard, numbering some 15,000 warriors, and used their own tactics against them by luring them into a pursuit with a false retreat before attacking them. Thousands were killed, and around 4,000 taken prisoner, in what was the first major defeat for a Mongol force in the field. The Volga Bulgars, according to one ancient chronicler, displayed remarkable business acumen by ransoming the 4,000 Mongol prisoners for 4,000 head of cattle, which ultimately helped Sabatai and Zeb. That defeat also did not tarnish what was, in all respects, a truly stunning achievement. Their three-year cavalry raid crossed over 9,000 miles and shattered the combined armies of half a dozen countries, bringing Azerbaijan, Georgia, Armenia and Kievan Rus into the Mongol orbit and providing vast amounts of plunder. Genghis Khan had every reason to be pleased with his general's performance. Genghis's army, which had battled its way through stiff resistance all the way back to the Mongol heartland, was battle-weary, and the troops under generals Zev and Sabatai, who eventually rejoined him on the steppe, were even more tired. But there could be no respite, because the Tangut emperor of Shijia, despite being a vassal to Genghis, was now in open revolt and had allied with the Zin in a bid to regain independence. Reinforced by levies of young warriors, anxious to share in their older relatives' glory, in 1226 Genghis marched on the Zin and the Shi Jia once again. 1226 was also the year that Joshi Khan, still estranged from his father, died under mysterious but convenient circumstances, leading some scholars to assume he was poisoned on Genghis's orders since he had refused to respond to an official summons and was thus virtually in rebellion himself. If Genghis grieved, he did not show it. Genghis now launched his army into Shi Jia, smashing the cities of Gangzhou, Shuzhou, Heisui, and Jiliangfu before crushing a Tangut army sent to oppose him near Helanshan. He then besieged Lingzhu on the Yellow River, and annihilated a Tangut relief force sent to rescue the city. The following year, his men took the new Tangut capital, Ninghia, and then ravaged vast stretches of the enemy-held countryside. He forced the surrender of several provinces within the Tangut heartland, and eventually his seemingly unstoppable progress persuaded the Tangut emperor to sue for peace, hoping Genghis would show leniency. Naturally, he did not. The entire royal family was put to death, and their dynasty was wiped out. In late 1227, following the destruction of the Tangut dynasty, Genghis Khan died. His mysterious death is hounded by controversy, but one ancient account claimed a Tangut princess, whom Genghis had either been given in marriage or was intent on assaulting, pulled out a knife she had concealed and stabbed him in the groin or leg, leading to his death from blood loss or gangrene. The princess was then said to have thrown herself into the Yellow River afterwards to preserve her virtue. This extremely demeaning death is most likely a fiction, the result of negative propaganda from hostile chroniclers after Genghis's death. Other more likely accounts suggest that Genghis was killed in a final battle against the Tanguts, or suffered a fall from a horse, either during a military action or during a hunt, and that it aggravated his old wounds and eventually killed him. Some believe he suffered from some debilitating disease, such as pneumonia or tuberculosis, which eventually finished the elderly Khan off. It is worth noting that at this point Genghis was in his mid to late sixties and had been fighting virtually non-stop for the better part of fifty years, so it is highly likely that decades of campaigning would have taken their toll, 
making even a trivial injury or illness potentially life-threatening. Following his death, Genghis's sons enacted the provisions laid out by his will, which he had planned meticulously, in the years following the campaign against the Khwarezmid Empire. The Mongol army, numbering over 130,000 men, was split up among his family, with the bulk, around 100,000 men, going to Tolui as the youngest, while the remaining 30,000 men went to his other male children, who all had sizable forces of their own already. Genghis's empire was also split up, though it remained a Mongol empire, with intimately connected family and cultural ties, in accordance with his wishes. Ogadai, his favorite son, received the title of Great Khan, and the Empire of the Great Khan, comprising most of Eastern Asia and China. Tolui, the youngest, received the Mongolian heartland. Genghis's grandsons, Batu and Orda, Joshi's sons, received the western Eurasian territories, including eastern Rus, and Chagatai was given Central Asia and Khwarezm. All of them would build upon Genghis's legacy, using the Yasa Code of Governance and the administrative and military infrastructure he had created to expand his territories further than they had ever stretched. In 1279, about fifty years after Genghis's death, the empire he had started and built from scratch stretched from Poland to Korea. What's most interesting about Genghis Khan, given his outsized importance, is that in addition to the uncertainty surrounding his death, nobody knows where he is buried. It has long been claimed that after Genghis Khan's death, his body was brought east to the Mongolian heartland, where, pursuant to his wishes, he was buried near his birthplace, in a secret, unmarked location, per Mongolian custom. His funeral guard reportedly killed anyone they met on the way to his burial site, so no one would know where Genghis's bones lay, and then stampeded their horses repeatedly over the spot to give no indication of where he was buried. Some versions of the story even say a river was diverted over the site. The famous Venetian explorer Marco Polo spent about seventeen years in Asia, and in his seminal work, The Travels of Marco Polo, he claimed that around 20,000 people who knew the location of the tomb were killed to keep the place a secret. Although Polo's claims have been repeated in various accounts, he wrote decades after Genghis Khan's death. In addition, the credibility of many of his claims is highly questionable. Genghis Khan's grave is believed to be located on top of the Kenti Mountains, Burkan Kaldun. At this holy place, about 160 kilometers from Ula Anbatar, the ruler went to pray before embarking on a campaign to unite the Mongols and other steppe peoples. Then he swore that he would return there when he died. It is why many believe that Genghis Khan was buried there. An exploration of the top of the mountain is not possible, as the mountain is protected by UNESCO, but drones above the mountain reveal the existence of a structure covered by lush vegetation, which further fuel the story of the grave. According to another theory, Khan's grave is guarded by the Uri Anka tribe, who were exempted from taxes and military service by the Mongols. Of course, that theory contradicts the story that all the soldiers who attended the funeral were executed. Some historians state that the grave is in his birthplace, Henti, through which three rivers flow, Onon, Kerlen, and Tuul. Others believe that Genghis Khan was buried in the old cemetery of the Xiongnu kings in the central Mongolian province of Arkhangai. Even though the resting place of Genghis Khan has not been found, his mausoleum, which has been declared a tourist attraction, serves as a monument to the great ruler, and it is not surprising that it is one of the five most famous mausoleums in the world. A legend is also associated with Genghis Khan's funeral. The story goes that the servants could not remove the body of the great Khan from the carriage on which it was transported. So about 1,000 soldiers in the escort, five of his wives, and 500 concubines came in a cart 
and carried it together with the body to the eternal abode, near a lonely tree where the ruler often came to rest during his life. That legend was retold later in several versions. In the most famous book about hidden treasures, Schatzsucher, published in 1963 in Germany, Hans Roden tried to determine the most reliable assumption and, based on it, find out where the tomb is located. The author writes that Genghis Khan's body was buried in a silver casket with 79 royal crowns, the number of kings he dethroned. Next to the coffin lay the most expensive weapons, a jade tiger, a lion, a horse, and a manuscript of the Bible, the work of an English monk. After the burial, the horses of his guard trampled the earth until all traces of the tomb disappeared. Then eight white marble canopies were erected. Every year on the anniversary of Genghis Khan's death, according to tradition, his descendants gather and pray in a hidden place. According to another story, there is a similar tomb in Ordos, the region between the Great Wall and the Yellow River, over which there is a large white canopy. However, in addition to this one, seven more white marble canopies were found scattered across Mongolia, identical in shape and size. Of course, only one could cover the body of Genghis Khan, while the others theoretically exist only to deceive. There are different assumptions about which canopy is the right one. Some say the right one is on the Altai Plateau, while others claim it is the canopy on Mount Burkan Kaldun. According to author Hans Roden, an unknown French explorer visited one of the canopies in 1896 and saw the famous silver casket, and around 1960 a Russian scientist claimed to have discovered the tomb of Genghis Khan in the Gobi Desert near the city of Karakoto. The same place was visited in 1924 by the English researcher Sir Oral Stein, who discovered only one interesting papyrus. J. Schmidt, a Mongolian scholar and Tibetologist from the 19th century, taking as a basis the fact that the Mongols could not embalm corpses, believed the body of Genghis Khan was not taken from the Tangut kingdom to Mongolia, and only some items and relics of the Mongol commander were buried in Mongolia. He further believed that Ogade, who succeeded him, sacrificed forty beautiful girls and many thoroughbred horses to the spirit of Genghis Khan. Apart from the last will of Genghis Khan himself, purely practical difficulties also appear on the way for the search of the missing tomb. Mongolia is huge and underdeveloped. In terms of territory, it is more than seven times the size of Great Britain, but at the same time, the length of its roads is only 2% of those of Great Britain. The population density there is so low that only Greenland can compete with Mongolia. Whether the search for the grave will continue will depend solely on the Mongols. Some earlier attempts by American and other foreign researchers during the 1990s were stopped due to great dissatisfaction and protests from Mongolian politicians and the public. According to the Mongolian tradition, the desecration of ancient graves kills the soul that protects the deceased. Some even believe that the discovery of the tomb will lead to the end of the world. This belief was inspired by the legend of the 14th century Mongolian king Tamerlane, whose tomb was opened by Russian archaeologists in 1941. Soon after, Germany attacked the Soviet Union during the midst of the Second World War, which, according to some statistics, claimed between 50 and 60 million lives. Of course, many assume that Genghis Khan's grave is filled with treasures brought from all over his empire, and that is certainly one of the reasons for the foreigner's interest in his secret burial. In 2022, workers engaged in road construction near the Onon River in Kentii province discovered a tomb containing the remains of several human bones lying on a large rudimentary stone structure. Sixty-eight skeletons were found together almost directly on top of a rather crude stone structure. 
and though the contents of the tomb were scattered and badly deteriorated, probably because the site was under the riverbed for hundreds of years until the course of the Onon River changed in the 18th century, the bones of a tall man and sixteen female skeletons were identified among hundreds of gold and silver artifacts and thousands of coins. It is assumed that the women were the wives and concubines who were killed to accompany the warlord in the afterlife, and the amount of treasure and the number of remains of animals and people immediately led archaeologists to assume that it was the burial place of a powerful Mongol warlord. After carrying out an extensive set of tests and analyses, they were able to confirm that the skeleton belonged to a man aged between 60 and 75, who died between 1215 and 1235. The age, date, location, and opulence of the site would all fit with Genghis Khan himself. The Devil's Bible the book called Codex Gigas is, according to many accounts, the largest manuscript in the world, yet its origins and history are mysterious, including the ordinary and the magical, heaven and hell. Due to its enormous size, 90 centimeters long and 90 centimeters wide when opened, the manuscript was named Codex Gigas, which means giant book in Latin. It is considered the largest medieval manuscript, weighing an incredible 75 kilograms. It takes two people to lift this book, and the leather it was made from must have come from at least 160 animals. However, it is not the size that makes it exceptional. Because of the drawing of the devil across one page, the book was nicknamed the Devil's Bible and inspired legends about the true nature of its creation. Like most medieval manuscripts that originated in Europe, Codex Gigas is written in Latin, and the script corresponds to a later version of the Carolingian minuscule. Many historians agree that it was created sometime in the early 13th century in the Benedictine monastery of Podlazice in Bohemia, today's Czech Republic. The story goes that it was made by a monk whose name was Hermanus Heremitus, and this has been confirmed by modern investigations. Just as his work attracts attention, and its origin is unknown, so does the life of this Benedictine monk. The story also says that he was sentenced to death by being walled up alive, and that he wrote it in just one night with the help of the devil. Despite the strict rules of the monastery, he researched occult and demonic teachings, and when that was discovered, they sentenced him to death by stoning. On his final night, the monk made a pact with Beelzebub and offered him his immortal soul in exchange for a chance to complete his masterpiece. Although he planned to give the book to the monastery in exchange for his life, his agreement with the occult came to a head. Modern investigations, however, suggest that he worked on it for almost three decades probably out of repentance for some realistic or imagined sin. The Codex Gigas contains all the books of the Vulgate, a Latin translation of the Bible written at the end of the 4th century and the beginning of the 5th, and five other texts, and intriguingly, the Old and New Testaments are presented in a different order from what we are used to. The other texts, which are scattered, are both religious and secular, including a version of the Antiquities of the Jews by Flavius Josephus, the Encyclopedia of Etymology by Isidore de Seville, and medical works attributed to Hippocrates. The extensive manuscript also contains illuminations done in red, blue, yellow, green, and gold. The initial letters are richly decorated, and it is not uncommon for pages where the first letter covers the background of the entire parchment. One test conducted on this book concluded that for just the calligraphy, which does not include decoration and illustrations, five years of continuous writing would be necessary. The first page of the Codex contains the Greek and Hebrew alphabets, as well as the Glagolitic and Cyrillic alphabets. 
There is also the text of Abbot Bavor and the prologue to the Pentateuch as the beginning of the Bible. The text of Abbot Bavor is of great importance to the manuscript and represents its brief introduction and states the contents of the Codex. The text was transcribed and translated from Latin and shows the respect with which the monks treated the book. Abbot Bavor counted it among the seven wonders of the world. In 1347, Czech King Charles IV, also known as the ruler of the Holy Roman Empire, had the Imaus Monastery built in Prague, where eighty Croatian glagolitic Benedictines were invited. Because of this, it can be assumed that the glagolitic alphabet found in the Codex was most likely created under the influence of Croatian glagoliticians. The book contains numerous minor texts and notes, with various recipes and spells. There are even notes on exorcism practices, cures for mysterious illnesses, and methods for protecting one's soul. This book even contains two magic spells for catching thieves, including a detailed description of their application. However, in addition to the picturesque depiction of the heavenly city and the pearly gates, there is also an illustration of the devil on page 577 of the book, and it was this page that earned it the nickname Devil's Bible, since it was the only one that contained the devil on its pages. Painted with red horns and two tongues and an ermine cloak, this creature stares into space and is shown between two towers. It is worth noting that the ermine was worn only by members of the royal family, so this detail defines the devil as the prince of darkness. Right next to the illustration of the devil is an image of paradise, represented by numerous rows of buildings, which are also located between two towers. What makes the kingdom of heaven alarming is that there is no sign of life there. The author, without explanation, had painted a paradise completely devoid of life. The texts of the confession and the invocation of the manuscript are the only ones written on a colored background. The text of the confession begins with a monk's address to God, Jesus Christ, the apostles, prophets, and saints. After that, violations of religious duty, evil thoughts, anger, hatred, violations of celibacy, various types of fornication, including with animals, and all mortal sins are listed. The confession ends with a prayer for mercy and forgiveness. The content of the confession points to the conclusion that it refers to a monk who has sinned gravely with words and deeds. After the confession, there is a large picture of the heavenly Jerusalem that is a metaphorical representation of paradise. In a symbolic sense, the confession and the image of the heavenly city represent the confession of sins, and the request for forgiveness and mercy is that the sinful monk can reach paradise. One of the most intriguing parts of the Codex is the invocation text, which consists of three invocations and two magical formulas. The book's purported demonic origins have fueled various stories about the Devil's Bible, all of which revolve around the book, bringing misfortune and sorrow to those who possess it. It's one of those books believed to own the owner, rather than the other way around. The Codex Gigas first left the monastery when its owners fell into financial trouble and was sold to a nearby monastery near Prague, where, after a few years, it was blamed for the collapse of that monastery. At the end of the 13th century, the area of Bohemia was hit by a severe plague. Tens of thousands of people died, and Codex was blamed for all the evil caused by the plague. In 1477, a Benedictine monastery in Bohemia, known as the source of a medieval manuscript, experienced financial difficulties. Therefore, the monks had no choice but to sell their most valuable asset, the Codex Gigas. At that time, the manuscript belonged to the Benedictine monastery, as already mentioned. Soon after, the monastery in Bohemia succumbed to the ravages of the Hussite Revolution. 
Shortly after, the book fell into the hands of the Holy Roman Emperor Rudolf, who became obsessed with it. In the 16th century, Nostradamus, the legendary French writer and astrologer, made a horoscope for Rudolf, in which he predicted the death of Rudolf's father, Maximilian II, and his ascension to the throne of the Holy Roman Empire. The prophecy was the catalyst for Rudolf's obsession with the occult. Being an avid collector, he owned an art collection better known as the Rudolfinische Kunst und Wunderkammer, Rudolphine Chamber of Arts and Curiosities, which contained many paintings, decorations, and objects of great value. As he was fascinated by the occult, Rudolf tried to get hold of any book related to it. For this reason, in 1594, he borrowed the Codex Gigas itself, and thus it also became part of Rudolf's collection. Rudolf's obsession with the occult only intensified after researching the Codex. He employed many translators who spent a lot of time finding and uncovering the secrets of the Codex and its image of the devil, which is said to have resulted in Rudolf losing his mind toward the end of his reign. He became paranoid and was unable to stay in power. Since he had no male heir, he was replaced by his brother, Matthias. During the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, the book ended up as the war booty of the Swedish army. On Friday, May the 7th, 1697, a massive fire broke out in the royal palace in Stockholm, and the royal library was badly damaged. The codex was saved from the flames by being thrown out the window, though part of it was damaged, and some pages flew off and are still missing today. After that, the codex was stored in the new residence of the Swedish monarchs, the royal palace in Stockholm, until 1819, and when the codex was returned, the binding was replaced. Finally, in 1878, the codex was moved to a new library building in Hummelgarden Park. On September the 24th, 2007, after 359 years, the Codex Gigas was returned to Prague on loan from Sweden until January 2008 and was exhibited in the Czech National Library. All the mentioned events, the economic difficulties of the monasteries where the Codex was located, the Great Plague, wars, robberies, fires, Rudolf's loss of reason, the perfection of the script and the image of the devil created a legend that gave the Codex a bad reputation throughout its history. For all those events, people blamed the book, specifically the devil, who, according to legend, created it. The image of the devil started the suspicion of supernatural involvement, and other events only strengthened it. On a more secular level, the Codex Gigas is one of the most mysterious manuscripts ever written and has attracted attention since the Middle Ages. With its size and legend, the manuscript created a significant impression on the people who saw it and owned it, and whether the influence was positive or negative, it affected many people's lives and helped build up the legend that surrounded the manuscript. Each part of this text had an important role, and most of them have been in use since antiquity. Such texts have been translated for centuries, and a lot was already known about them. But within the Codex, some texts do not appear in any other manuscript, and some parts have not yet been transcribed or translated, so it offers the possibility of further research and study. In the end, Experts in medieval manuscripts determined, by analyzing the manuscript, that the book was written by one person. Regardless of who that person was, several centuries later, the Devil's Bible arouses the same curiosity as it did in medieval times. Chapter 3 Did Marco Polo actually visit China? Born in Venice, Marco Polo was in a fortuitous position to participate in the Mediterranean trade, but he was still a young man when he went on the journey that would make him famous and greatly inspire the age of exploration. 
Though he was destined to become famous, Marco Polo was simply following in the footsteps of his own family, and it's believed that he was already a teenager before he met his father and uncle who had been travelling to the Far East, and, according to Marco Polo, had met Kublai Khan, the famous grandson of Genghis Khan. A few years later, they set off for Asia again, this time with Marco Polo, and they would not return to Venice for twenty-four years. When they came back, they had allegedly travelled about fifteen thousand miles, and brought back plenty of riches and treasure. Marco Polo was hardly the only European merchant or trader who travelled to the Far East, but it was his written account of his travels that would generate extreme interest in Asia. Having described such a rich land full of desired resources, Marco Polo's travels became a source for European cartographers of the era, and they became the impetus for men like Christopher Columbus, who added his own annotations to Marco Polo's account and used it as a reference for his own legendary expedition in search of the Far East. Centuries later, historians have scoured over the account and what was written in an effort to validate its authenticity, leading to sharp debates today. After their time in Asia, Marco, Niccolo, and Maffeo returned to Venice permanently, changed by their journey. Having been gone for over two decades, they could barely speak their native language, after years without practice. They wore Mongol-style clothing, including brightly colored kaftans, layered over loose-fitting trousers. They may have even worn their hair in the Mongol style, with parts of the head shaved and long braids. They were not recognized when they arrived home, and their family in Venice had no way of knowing if they were alive or dead, and likely assumed them dead after so many years. Niccolo and Maffeo's brother had made provisions for them in his will before his death, and when they returned, they were immediately made executors of his estate. This measure provided the returning members of the family with the legal standing that they needed in the city. Maffeo's wife was alive, as was Niccolo's second son, Maffeo Polo. Still facing doubt, the three threw a grand banquet. During the course of the banquet, according to legend, they tore apart multiple sets of rich clothing before finally appearing in their Mongol caftans. They cut into the caftans, revealing rich stores of gems and gold sewn into the fabric. Only after this display were they welcomed back into Venetian society. Marco brought knowledge of a number of significant technological advances back to Italy with him, including paper money, coal, and eyeglasses. The eyeglass lenses also provided the innovation necessary for the telescope, and the introduction of gunpowder revolutionized warfare. He kept the paisa, given by Kublai Khan for the rest of his life, and was served by a Mongol servant named Peter in his home in Venice. While Venice had been a thriving republic, when Marco left, twenty-four years earlier, he returned to a less successful city. Under interdict by the Pope for some time, the city could not even celebrate religious festivals, and wars and famine also threatened the city. The people of Venice blamed members of the ruling families, particularly the Dandoro family, for their difficulties. Making matters worse, the Christian kingdom of Acre, where the Polos had begun their journey, had fallen to the Sultan of Egypt, so a lack of Christian trading outposts in the Middle East reduced Venetian access to trade in the region. In response, the Venetians increased trade throughout Western Europe. Some time after Marco's return to the city, tensions between Venice and longtime trading rival Genoa escalated. Genoa controlled both the spice and grain trade, bringing in goods from distant regions, including India. Venice allied with Pisa against Genoa and initiated a draft. All men between seventeen and sixty could be drafted, and Marco volunteered to serve. Clearly not a prime age for fighting by now, Marco may simply have found Venice boring after a life of travel and adventure. During the naval battle with the city of Genoa, Marco Polo was captured and taken prisoner, 
but, like other wealthy prisoners, he was quite well treated, and his prison was a luxurious one. His family in Venice worried about his well-being, and Niccolò and Maffeo attempted to ransom him to secure his freedom. With concern about Marco's well-being and the family's future, Niccolò remarried. While Marco was in prison, the family bought a new palazzo in a comfortable Venetian neighborhood. The gems and goods brought from the East likely financed this purchase. In prison, Marco met a writer of adventure stories and romances named Rusty Kello of Pisa, who had likely been captured by the Genoese in 1284 and had been imprisoned for a number of years. While Marco spoke a number of languages, none, including his native Venetian, was appropriate for a literary venture, but Rusty Kello was fluent in French, a popular literary language of the time. While in prison, Marco, with Rusty Kello's assistance, began work on the book about his travels. This autobiography included many stories of Marco's travels throughout the Mongol kingdom, as well as those of his fathers and uncles. He also included second-hand accounts of a number of regions, and some stories which were, without a doubt, purely fictional. Marco dictated his autobiography to Rusty Kello, and the two should be considered co-writers, but as the book progresses, it moves further from conventions of travel and adventure stories. This suggests that Marco may have taken a greater hand in its writing, and Marco may have relied upon some of his own travel notes, as well as his memory, when dictating his adventures to Rusty Kello. While Rusticello could write French, he did so poorly. Verb tenses varied, and he moved from first to third person narration frequently. The poor grammar and language of the text subsequently caused substantial difficulties for translators. The original manuscript produced by Rusticello in prison does not survive, and early surviving copies vary widely with alterations to the text in many instances. Modern scholars divide these manuscripts into two groups, A and B. Manuscripts in the B group are believed to be truer to the original and less altered by translators. Marco may have added to the manuscript later in life, continuing to alter the text until the time of his death. Marco was released from prison in 1299 when the two warring cities signed a peace treaty and returned to Venice, rejoining his father and uncle and serving on the Great Council. Now in his forties, Marco wed after his return in a marriage arranged by the family. There is no record of what the forty-five-year-old, who had taken such keen interest in the foreign women he had seen, thought of his own marriage, but Donata's dowry was generous, and the match was a good one for the Polo family. Marco and Donata had three daughters in the coming years. Niccolo Polo died around 1300, leaving his son and brother to continue the family business in Venice, but neither travelled to Asia again. They did, however, travel around Europe, and Marco carried copies of his story with him when he travelled in Europe for business, giving them to nobles he encountered. Contemporary accounts suggest he frequently spoke of his adventures. While the war with Genoa was over, conflict with the papacy continued. In 1309, a papal bull excommunicated the entire city of Venice, sparking a rebellion in the city that caused turmoil. However, Marco and his family were largely uninvolved. Maffeo Polo died in 1310, leaving no children, and thus his estate passed to his nephews. Marco's brother Maffeo died soon after, leaving Marco the heir to the Polo family fortune. Later in life he became obsessed with wealth, and he continued to work as a merchant, amassing a significant fortune. While he made loans to family, court records show that he sued when he was not paid. Two of his three daughters had married by 1318, and he integrated their husbands into the business, even favouring them over others in the Polo family. In his later years, Marco was no longer an adventurer, but he maintained relationships with other world travellers. 
Pietro d'Abano visited Marco, and the two conversed about their travels and astronomy. D'Abano's writing shared stories from Marco the Venetian, and helped to spread Marco's reputation. While Marco was relatively well known by the end of his life, his work was typically considered to be fiction. A Dominican recounted a story in which friends suggested he recant parts of the book which were lies. Marco responded that he had only written half of what he saw and experienced. Marco Polo died in Venice in 1324, leaving significant wealth to his heirs and naming his wife and daughters co-executors of his estate. He also released a number of people from their debts to him and freed a Mongol slave that had been with him since his return, leaving him a generous bequest. He provided for his wife and a dowry for his unmarried daughter. The remainder of his estate was to be divided between his two married daughters. Many of the items listed were typical possessions of a Venetian merchant, but there were several that were unique to Marco Polo. The golden tablet of Kublai Khan was still in his possession, as was a Buddhist rosary. Finally, he still owned a Mongol headdress, or bokta. It is likely that this was a gift from the Mongol princess he had accompanied on her journey. His will does not mention a significant quantity of gemstones, but these may have remained with the estate. Marco was buried in the tomb he had built for his father, Niccolo. None of his family took up his travels after his death. His daughter, Fantina, battled in court throughout her life to preserve her own wealth, but the family took little interest in the account of his travels. Marco's tomb disappeared during the course of the 18th century, along with the remainder of the Church of San Lorenzo in Venice. While the monument is lost, it is likely that the bones of Marco Polo and his family were integrated into the foundations during the rebuilding of the Church of San Lorenzo. Less than fifty years after Marco Polo's death, the Mongol dynasty ended. Kublai 